Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr. President, committees that lodge proposals are shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that that question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill 2020, further consideration in committee of the whole. The committee is considering the Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill of 2020. The question is, um, Senator Keneally. Thank you, uh, Madam, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I do rise to move the revised amendment on sheet 1117 and to ask related questions to the minister. Uh, in particular, I just want to flag to the chamber before I ask questions of the minister uh, that this revised amendment would have the effect of splitting this bill. Effectively, it would allow this chamber to deal with aviation workers without delay, but yet provide the time for the government to address the big gaping hole that sits in this legislation, and that is that the government, despite providing legislation that purports to deal with the security risks posed by transport workers, not all transport workers, of course, but by those who would seek to use their position to facilitate the importation of drugs, firearms and other illegal activities through our ports and airports. <clears throat> the government have proposed legislation that, that proposes to deal with security risks, that seeks to enhance the security risks and the security clearances, I should say, uh, for workers at ports and airports. But they have left a giant gaping hole, and that giant gaping hole is that the bill does nothing to enhance or strengthen the security clearance process for foreign workers on flag of convenience vessels at our maritime ports. This is an issue that has been raised previously by the then Department of Immigration and Border Protection. It is an issue that has been ventilated through Senate inquiries. It is an issue that has been raised the multiple times the government has presented a bill purporting to deal with uh, transport security and organized or serious crime. They've done it in 2016. They did it again in 2019. Prior to 2019, they've got a bill here again now today. I, three times this bill, the government's efforts have failed to deal with, with uh, foreign crew who arrive on flag of convenience vessels. Now, we accept on this side of the chamber, the opposition accepts that there is a need to deal with the risks posed by organized criminal gangs who have infiltrated airlines and airports. We have seen the revelations in the media about the infiltration. We have take with credibility the evidence provided by the Australian Com Criminal Intelligence Commission that there are 
organized criminal gangs that are infiltrating Qantas that have extraordinarily, uh, by the ACIC boss uh, Mike, Michael uh, Thielen's uh, evidence on 60 Minutes, have or, these criminal gangs have, or, have, impl have infiltrated government agencies. And of course, the community rightly expects this chamber to act upon those reports. And so what I make clear to the government and what I make clear to the community is that the Labor Party is seeking to facilitate passage through this parliament of enhanced security checks for aviation workers. We think the bill proposed by the government is not strong enough. We think the bill proposed by the government has some weaknesses, to be sure. It's a bill that's got the tra title transport has the title serious crime in its title, but has no definition in the bill of serious crime. We think there are issues with this bill that it doesn't have a legislative avenue of appeal. Nonetheless, we are willing to facilitate through the parliament this week the passage of this bill as it relates to aviation workers. Our invitation to the government and what this amendment, this revised amendment represents, is an invitation to the government, one I made to the Prime Minister last week, one that I make here today on the floor of the Senate to the government, is that let's take the time and get it right when it comes to our maritime ports. What do we know about our maritime ports? We know that they are, in fact, responsible not responsible themselves. We know that the maritime ports are where the great risk lies when it comes to the facilitation of drugs into Australia. We know that the Department of Immigration and Border uh, Security, as it was formerly called, now Australian Border Force, shared those views with the Senate in 2017. We know that foreign workers on flag of convenience vessels can get a security clearance for an Australian maritime port within 24 to 48 hours, but it can take up to three months for an Australian worker to get that same clearance. Why are we putting such stringent requirements on Australian workers but failing to put them on foreign workers? And as I outlined in my speech to the Senate uh, when we last addressed this matter, some weeks ago now, some months ago now, when the government last prioritised this bill for debate, we have had multiple incidences of maritime uh, crew from foreign vessels, foreign workers who have been, uh, who have been um, responsible or have facilitated the movement of drugs through our maritime ports. So this is what this, uh, meant this uh, represents, this amendment, and I invite members of the chamber to, um, to uh, have a very close look at it. Uh, in particular, uh, what this bill does is it does seek to, uh, or what this amendment does is that it does seek to delay the commencement of the bill as it uh, applies to maritime workers until we have got to a satisfactory uh, proposal from the government or indeed passage of a private member's bill that I have put into the Senate uh, to deal with foreign crew from flag of convenience vessels. Now the government may not like the private member's bill that, that, that Labor has moved to deal with foreign uh, crew on flag of convenience vessels. I invite the government to come up with their own solution. This is not a political, I have to win, you have to lose. I think the win that we need here is a win that is in the national interest, is a win that is in the, um, uh, the, the name of stronger border uh, security protection measures, uh, and it is a win in terms of enhancing security arrangements at our maritime ports. Uh, so I invite the government uh, to uh, consider this uh, amendment. I invite other parties in this parliament or in this chamber to consider this amendment. Um, now, the, the government will argue back that the vast majority of maritime crew visa holders do not require unescorted access in maritime security zones. Um, they say um, they're on, um, 
that any seafarer is only required to hold an MSIC if they require unsupervised access to maritime security zone. Um, and they would say that would impose a significant financial burden on the administration of the scheme for no discernible ben benefits. But I've got to say, if you listen to the Department of Immigration in 2017, if you listen to uh, the evidence from Wharfies and, and the maritime unions uh, in the Senate inquiries, you will know that foreign crew do not just have unescorted access to ports. Any uh, they do have unescorted access. Any Wharfie will tell you that that is the case. And the, you know, the Morrison government has taken their eye off the ball, we contend, when it comes to our ports. We know that foreign crew are, are allowed to wander around uh, secure areas. And so my first question to the uh, minister is, does the government agree with the Department of Immigration and Border Protection's 2017 finding that, quote, there are features of flag of convenience registration, regulation, and practice that organized crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit? Reduce transparency or secrecy surrounding complex financial and ownership arrangements are factors that make flag of convenience ships more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organized crime and terrorist groups. This means flag of convenience ships may be used in a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling, and facilitating prohibited imports or exports. Minister, does the government agree with the Department of Immigration and Border Protection's finding? Uh, thank you, Senator Keneally. And I'll just advise the Senate that the revised amendment 1117 has been circulated. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, in the first instance, what I propose to do is just put on record the government's uh, response to uh, the amendment that has been moved by Senator Keneally on sheet 1117. And I do acknowledge, Senator Kelly, that there has been an amendment uh, to that particular amendment. Uh, in the first instance, the government will not be supporting the amendments to the bill uh, in sheet 1117, uh, which I understand would make the commencement of the bill contingent on the passage and commencement of Senator Keneally's private members' bill, the Migration Amendment New Maritime Crew Visas Bill. Uh, as the government does not support the opposition's bill, making the commencement of this bill contingent on the opposition's bill would mean that the important measures in this bill would never commence. The government opposes the opposition's bill because it would be an unnecessary replication of processes already in place for maritime crew visas and lead to additional red tape. Before a person is granted a maritime crew visa, they are required under the current migration legislation to have their criminal history assessed and undergo a security assessment, requiring a holder of a maritime crew visa to also satisfy the elements of a maritime security identification card background check concerning criminal history and security would replicate requirements that are already considered in the visa application process. Requiring visa holders to comply with the elements of, and I'll refer to it now as the MSIC scheme, uh, would pose a significant financial burden on the maritime crew visa scheme for no discernible benefit. Maritime crew visa holders who do not hold an MSIC are required to be escorted and monitored by an MSIC holder at all times whilst in a restricted zone of a seaport. Any maritime crew visa holder who requires unescorted access to a secure zone at a seaport would be required, like all individuals, to obtain an MSIC and undergo a full background check. Can I also address the calls by the opposition to split the aviation and maritime sections of the bill. Uh, and I would say to those calls, serious crime is a major threat to the Australian way of life and causes enormous human suffering. Only addressing serious crime in the aviation sector does not address the wider problem. Of the 227 aviation security identification cards and the 
maritime security identification card holders of concern to the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, 73 per cent, 73 per cent are in the maritime sector. By splitting the bill, the vast majority of the card holders the ACIC has serious concerns over will continue to have unsupervised access to maritime secure areas. Kilograms of illicit goods enter Australia through airports, but tonnes, and I emphasise that, tonnes enter in shipping containers through seaports. We must close all entry points to trusted insiders and serious criminals, not just those in the aviation sector. Otherwise, organised criminals will continue to exploit Australia's ports. It will also waste time and money by creating completely unnecessary red tape. It will increase processing times and costs for cardholders. All the time Labor stalls implementing this legislation, more illicit goods are entering Australia and more people are being harmed. Separating the ASIC and MSIC schemes will also mean that those who require both an aviation security uh, identification card and a maritime security identification card will in future have to apply for two separate background checks, increasing both costs and delays to card holders. The other issue that Senator Keneally raised uh, when she was addressing the amendment put by the opposition on sheet 1117 as amended was in relation to foreign maritime workers. Um, anyone seeking to have unescorted access of secure areas of our airports and seaports needs an aviation security identification card or a maritime security identification card, regardless regardless of their nationality. In making the comments that Senator Keneally did, Labor are deliberately seeking to muddy the waters. There is no Australian government requirement for all Australian seafarers to hold a maritime security identification card. What this card does is ensure the holder has been background checked and allows the holder to be unescorted inside the maritime security zone. Foreign ships and foreign seafarers must comply with the security measures of Australian ports and port facilities. Foreign seafarers who are employed on non-military ships on international voyages to Australia will hold a maritime crew visa, otherwise known as an MCV, like all travellers to Australia, applicants for an MCV are subject to a range of character and security checking processes, and an MCV will not be issued to a person who fails the character test or who is identified as a security risk. If an MCV holder requires unmonitored access to a maritime security zone, they would be required, like all individuals, to obtain a maritime security identification card and undergo the required background check. MCV holders are not exempt from MSIC requirements. And I'm just seeking some further advice, Senator Keneally, in relation to the question that you posed in relation to why are foreign seafarers excluded from this bill? And as I've already stated, there is no Australian government requirement for all Australian seafarers to hold a maritime security identification card. Maritime industry participants have the discretion to establish maritime security zones to safeguard their operations. At all security regulated ports, and on security regulated ships, any person who does not hold a valid 
MSIC must be continuously monitored by a current MSIC holder at all times while in maritime security zones. The government has security arrangements in place to monitor all vessels and personnel entering Australia and a clear protective security regime for ports and ships underpinned by legislation. The security requirements apply to all vessels which enter Australian waters and ports irrespective of flag state. Foreign flag vessels entering Australia must demonstrate compliance with international security standards. Foreign flag vessels and foreign seafarers must also comply with the security measures of Australian ports and port facilities. Security requirements for maritime transport in Australia are separate from shipping registration and coastal trading licences. And that is the information I have on me uh, to date. Uh, Senator Hanson. Much. Let me start by saying when it comes to national security and serious crime legislation, One Nation will always take a tough stance. So from the outset, One Nation will support this transport security amendment that deals with serious crime, particularly inside secure areas of our ports and airports. And can I commend the former Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, and his senior adviser, Mark Dominic, for giving me a thorough understanding of this bill. What the member for Dixon has achieved as Home Affairs Minister will never quite be understood or realised by many Australians. But I, for one, thank him, and it's worth passing on my gratitude to his wife, Kerry Lee, and young family for the work they also have allowed Mr Dutton to perform in his previous role as Home Affairs Minister. Now to the heart of this bill. Australia has a very serious issue with the importation of illicit drugs and illicit firearms. And if you want to know why, it's because Australians pay a higher price for drugs than most other countries across the globe. So it's fair to say the risk of getting caught is worth the financial reward in far too many cases. To give you an example, here in Australia, a gram of cocaine sells for at least $300, whereas in the Netherlands it's less than $60 a gram, and worse still in South Africa, they're paying $32. And when drug dealers are buying it for $3.50 a gram in Colombia and selling it for $300 or more here in Australia, they are making enormous profits that are unfortunately help by illegal favours from people in trusted and secure positions within our ports and airports. I have seen the volume of drugs coming into this country firsthand thanks to the AFP. I have been in the belly of one of the Australian Federal Police drug vaults which was carrying over $5 billion worth of illicit drugs that day, seized by officers that would otherwise have been up the noses and in the arms of someone's children here in Australia. You don't forget the pungent stench of chemicals when you walk into a police drug vault, and nor do you forget the side of plastic wrapped bricks of cocaine stacked in aisles similar to an Aldi store. There was honestly more white powder and ice in that vault than the slopes of Threadbow. I can only paint the picture, but this is what's being broken down and peddled on the streets by scumbags who don't give a damn about the carnage they're creating throughout society. Suicide, relationship and family breakdowns, mental illness, addiction, antisocial behaviour, sex crimes, unemployment, the list goes on and on. Drugs are a scourge on society, whichever way you look at it, them. Anyone who advocates for the decriminalisation of illicit drugs needs to spend a night on the front line with police, ambulance and nursing staff who are having to deal with the psychotic symptoms they bring out in users. Now, most Australians would have seen an ASIC card around the necks of pilots, crew members and airport workers when they've taken a domestic or international flight. They're a red dot photo ID card that provides access to all of the secure areas of an airport. And an MSIC card provides the same level of security clearance for our ports. The only difference is they're blue. What's happening is dis despite the assessment by ASIO and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission who look at someone's criminal history, these cards are still being issued to people who police 
know have an extremely close affiliation with known or previously convicted drug dealers, terrorists and other serious criminals. As the law stands today, any Australian could have an El Chapo or Osama bin Laden type character renting the spare room in their home and still make an application for an MSIC or ASIC card, and there's nothing authorities can do to prevent the security access card being granted. It's a cosy loophole that criminals have exploited for far too long, and I'm pleased to say that it ends today. If you want to shack up with criminals, don't expect to maintain clearance to security ports and airports across Australia. It's as simple as that. And for Labor to deny passing this bill today tells me that Anthony Albanese and the Australian Labor Party have a preference to support organised crime gangs than get serious about cutting the supply of illicit drugs and illegal guns on our streets. And I recognise the unions have concerns with this bill. I've listened to you. But we cannot continue protecting this very small cohort of union members. The vast majority of union members want this cleaned up as much as anyone in the public, so it's time to get rid of the 1 per cent or less who give unions a bad name. You, the unions talk a big game about the importance of safety on job sites. Well, this is a safety mechanism we parliamentarians are implementing to better safeguard our nation's children their members' children and broader society from the scourge of drugs and illegal firearms. And again, I reiterate One Nation's strong support for this bill. Can I, on a side note, congratulate the Federal Police in their more recent sting that shocked the criminal world as much as the tech world with their ANOM app? This was a stroke of genius that originated here in Australia and penetrated the heart of some of the worst criminal activity here at home and across the globe. Operation Ironside saw 224 people charged, 3,700 kilos of drugs taken off Australia's streets, $45 million in cash seized, 20 murder plots foiled and 72 firearms and weapons seized. We have the advantage of being an island nation which gives this parliament and authorities the upper hand to prevent illegal drugs and firearms flooding our streets, unlike many other countries across the globe. Today's transport security amendment that deals with serious crimes bill will go a step further in shutting down criminal activity within Australia. I commend the bill. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator, oh, Senator Senator Keneally. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, first of all, thank the minister for her answer. Uh, I say to Senator Hansen, uh, just to correct the record, Labor has not said they are opposing this bill. What we have said is we're actually here to facilitate the passage of the aviation portion and that we are, in fact, seeking to strengthen the bill by providing appropriate security clearances for foreign crew on flag of convenience vessels, which I don't know if Senator Hansen heard me earlier, but um, those crew can get a clearance in less than 24 hours, whereby an Australian worker sometimes can take up to three months to get their clearance. And we think there's a disparity there, a gaping hole that needs to be closed. And that's what our amendments are seeking to do. So I would hope that, uh, that senators in the chamber would um, have a listen to the debate. It is an important one, and I thank the minister for her answers. Uh, she didn't particularly directly answer my question about the Department of Immigration and Border Protection's finding in 2017 that, in fact, f foreign crew on and f flag of, ves of convenience vessels do pose a serious risk in terms of organized crime syndicates and terrorists. Um, that there are features of flag of convenience registration, regulation and practice that organized crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection in 2017. Now, since 2017, I can see no change that the government has made to the security clearances for foreign crew. So I come back to my original question thanking the minister for all her previous answers. But my question was, does the government agree with the Department of Immigration and Border Protection's 2017 finding that there are features of flag and convenience registration, regulation and practice that organized crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit?
Minister. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Keneally. And the instructions that I have are as follows. All individuals accessing a secure area or zone of a regulated port must have a valid MSIC, as it is known, or must be escorted or continuously monitored by an MSIC holder, whether they are foreign or Australian workers. Foreign ships entering Australia must demonstrate compliance with international security standards. Foreign ships and foreign seafarers must also comply with the security measures of Australian ports and port facilities. An MSIC ensures the holder has been background checked and allows the holder to be unescorted inside a maritime security zone. The schemes are designed, designed to ensure persons, both Australians and foreigners, who require unescorted access to the secure areas of certain security controlled airports and security regulated ports are subject to an appropriate background check. The introduction of the bill will strengthen the ASIC and MSIC schemes to ensure that we prevent individuals who pose a high criminal risk, both Australians and foreigners, from holding a card which is consistent with the findings of a range of parliamentary reviews. Oh, sorry, Senator Keneally. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the minister. Uh, I might raise a particular case and seek to see if the minister, in the context of that answer, can explain it. The sage Sagittarius and its master, Captain Salas. In 2012, he became a person of interest in the New South Wales coroner's investigation into three highly suspicious deaths aboard the sage Sagittarius. Captain Salas admitted to the coroner that he was involved in gun trafficking and trading in alcohol. Despite that evidence in front of the New South Wales coroner, the Liberal government allowed Captain Salas back into Australian waters in December 2015 as master of the Kipros Sea. And this ship travelled between a number of Australian ports, primarily Gladstone and Weipa, in early 2016. Can the minister explain, in the context of the answers she's just given about the stringent <coughs> controls and checking that's applied to foreign crew, why was Captain Salas allowed back into Australian waters and Australian ports after the evidence that he'd provided to the New South Wales coroner? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Keneally. I can advise as follows. The MG Sage Sagittarius is a Panama-flagged bulk carrier owned and operated by NYK, NYK Line. Uh, Venuncio Salas Jr. was the captain of the vessel. There were three suspicious deaths on board the vessel. There are also allegations that Captain Salas was involved in the illegal sale and transport of firearms. At the time, there were no known character or security concerns in regard to Captain Salas, as the relevant authorities were not aware of the character or security concerns regarding Captain Salas, an MSIP application would not have picked these up. Now that the concerns regarding Captain Salas's behaviour have come to light, these will be taken into account on any future applications. The government cannot speculate about any application that may have been lodged or preempt any future decisions. However, the government can confirm that the testimony of Captain Salas during the coronial inquest, specifically any admissions to selling firearms to his crew, as well as penal certificates from any country Captain Salas has resided in for longer than 12 months, over the age of 16 years in the last 10 years, 
other adverse information and any character references supplied can be considered. There is no disputing that Captain Salas was a genuine seafarer. He had a long history of travelling in and out of Australia as the captain or crew member of non-military vessels. Whilst we can't comment on individual cases, we can confirm that people with similar character concerns to Captain Sullis may be prevented from being granted a visa due to these concerns. Senator Sheldon. I just want to, um, first of all, uh, lend my support to the comments from Senator Christine Keneally. We also want to just go to what the government should be really considering with regards to this bill. Now, the government pretends to be tough on borders and tough on crime, when in re reality there is a, left a huge gaping hole in our national ports. Foreign seafarers are excluded entirely from security measures in this bill. Australians working at ports are forced to wait up to three months just to renew their maritime security identification card. But foreign vessels and their crew that use flag of convenience registration to flagrantly avoid Australian tax and regulations, well, they can waltz in Australia in as little as 24 hours' notice. That's correct. Three months for checks for an Australian port worker, 24 hours for a foreign crew member on a ship registered in Liberia, Panama or Russia. Now, how can the AFP or our intelligence agencies do a comprehensive background check on the entire crews of foreign vessels in 24 hours. Well, as the Department of Immigration and Border Protection told the Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport in 2017, the department, I quote, there are features of FOC registration, regulation and practice that organised crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit. Reduced transparency or secrecy surrounding complex financial and ownership arrangements are factors that can make FOC ships, flag of convenience ships, more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organised crime or terrorist groups. This means that the FOC ships may be used in a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling and facilitating prohibited imports or exports." End the quote. Now, that is the government's own bureaucrats saying four years ago that foreign vessels are prime targets for organised crime and terrorist groups. Foreign vessels are the express lane for trafficking people and people smugglers. And the Morrison government is keeping that express lane wide open. The Morrison government is also keeping that lane wide open for terrorists. Now, the world was horrified by the explosion in Beirut, Lebanon, on the 4th of August last year. The blast caused 207 deaths, so over 7,500 injuries, and $15 billion US dollars in property damage. It was one of the most powerful non-nuclear blasts in human history and was felt and heard hundreds of kilometres away. Lebanon's interior minister said the blast was a store of 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate blowing up. The ammonium nitrate had been seized from a Russian ship, the MV Rosas. In Australia in 2020, 2020 alone, 18 voyages of foreign flagships carried that same material, ammonium nitrate, on domestic routes. They were mostly long voyages between Western Australia and our East Coast ports. Those ships carried up to 6,500 tonnes of ammonium nitrate per voyage, more than double the volume which led to the tragedy of Beirut. And the foreign crews on those flags of convenience vessels carrying what is effectively 6,500 tonne bombs into our ports in Australia and Australia are waved and they're waved into our borders on as little as 24 hours' notice. At the same time, an Australian port worker could be forced to wait three months for their MSIC to be renewed. 
We have been fortunate in Australia that the Morrison government's negligence on national security matters has not already resulted in disaster and tragedy. In 2014, a truck hauling just 50 tonnes of ammonium nitrate rolled on a highway 30 kilometres south of Charleville, Queensland. Thankfully, no one was killed. But a secondary explosion injured eight and, I quote, disintegrated the truck and destroyed two firefighting vehicles while causing catastrophic damage to the Mitchell Highway. That was just 50 tonnes. And we've seen the grave consequences for 2,750 tonnes in Beirut. But we're talking about up to 6,500 6, tonnes, which is what the flag convenience vessels are carrying in our ports on just 24 hours' notice. The consequences are unimaginable. The Morrison government has been warned for this danger for years. The Maritime Union of Australia, the MUA, has been particularly vocal about the threat this gaping hole in our national security possesses, and what it poses. After Beirut in August last year, the MUA National Secretary Paddy Crumlin said, and I quote, the porous and substantial level of background checks on foreign workers for the maritime crew visa, which is issued electronically without background, appropriate background checks, is completely inadequate and inappropriate to such high consequence cargoes. Mr Crumlin went on to say, last year, 85,000 tonnes of ammonium nitrate moved through the port of Newcastle alone, 30 times the amount that devastated Beirut, posing a significant potential threat to safety. The Australian government must urgently tighten shipping regulations, went on to say, to ensure dangerous goods are carried on vessels that are registered in Australia and crewed by Australian seafarers who have undergone appropriate training and security checks. That is correct. It's correct. 85,000 tonnes of ammonium nitrate through the port of Newcastle in 2019 alone. Now, the Morrison government is fully aware of this. So, whilst the Prime Minister was playing politics last week with national security at his press conference, in reality, it's the Prime Minister who is playing fast and loose with our national security. Ammonium nitrate previously been used in terrorist attacks, the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 that demolished the Alfred P. Murray federal building with just 2,200 kilograms of ammonium nitrate. There is a reason to have, we have serious background checks and security qualifications for workers in the aviation and maritime industries. The Department of Immigration and Border Protection said the flag of convenience vessels are attractive for terrorists and organised crime. The opposition has put forward amendments which would ensure that foreign crews are subject to similar checking background checking as Australian workers. So why is the Morrison government persisting with a bill which discriminates against Australian workers whilst it doesn't elevate everybody to the appropriate security um, challenges? This leaves ports open to organised criminals operating through flags of convenience vessels, and which leaves Australian borders wide open to terrorist attacks, which could be of similar or even larger scale to the devastating accident in Beirut. And as we speak, we've been, it's been reported by the Geelong Advertiser this morning that two crew members from the Chinese-registered uh, ship in Panama, the glorious Plumera, have snuck through security and are currently at large. These two crew members would have received their visas with a little as 24 hours' notice. So the government doesn't know anything about their background. The most likely explanation that these are just two ill-treated crew members as exploitation is rampant through flag and convenience vessels. But the fact is that if the crew members can waltz into Australia without security checks, so can terrorists and so can organised criminals. The fact is that the Morrison government is tough on the Bilawiyo family, tough on two young girls locked up in Christmas Island, while being soft on flag and convenience vessels, soft on organised crime and soft on terrorists waltzing into Australia without background checks. My question is this. Why is it that the bill forces Australian workers to wait to minister, wait up to three months to renew their MSIC cards, while foreign crews remain able to waltz into our borders without background checks on just 24 hours' notice? Thanks, Senator Sheldon. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Chair, there does 
appear to have been a conflation of two issues uh, in the comments that are being made by those opposite. In the first instance, I will deal with uh, the comment that it takes 24 to 48 hours to process an MCV application, but up to uh, three months for an MSIC uh, application. Um, what I can say to you in that regard, Senator Sheldon, is as follows. Uh, while an MCV can be granted in 48 hours, it is important to note that the MSIC and MCV schemes operate for two different purposes and undertake different checks. Hence my comments in relation to there appears to be a um, slight um, comments made that don't quite understand what the two uh, schemes are actually doing, the conflation of the issues. The M6 scheme operates for the purpose for access to security zones, whilst the MCV operates for the purpose of immigration entry and stay rights, where a foreign seafarer requires unsupervised access to a maritime security zone, they must have an MCV and an MSIC. Any evidence of people accessing a maritime security zone without holding an MSIC or being supervised by an MSIC holder should obviously be reported to the department uh, for investigation. What I can also say in relation to the processing times, though, is this. During the 2020 calendar year, Auscheck processed 85 per cent of ASIC and MSIC applications received within 15 business days. Can I also address some of the comments made uh, basically in relation to foreign seafarers being excluded from the bill. There is no Australian government requirement for all Australian seafarers to hold an MSIC. Maritime industry participants have the discretion to establish maritime security zones to safeguard their operations. At all security regulated ports and on security regulated ships, any person who does not hold a valid MSIC must be continuously monitored by a current MSIC holder at all times while in maritime security zones. The government has security arrangements in place to monitor all vessels and personnel entering Australia and a clear protective security regime for ports and ships underpinned by legislation. The security requirements apply to all vessels which enter Australian waters and ports irrespective of flag state. Foreign flagged vessels entering Australia must demonstrate compliance with international security standards. Foreign flagged vessels and foreign seafarers must also comply with the security measures of Australian ports and port facilities. Security requirements for maritime transport in Australia are separate from shipping registration and coastal trading licences. And, uh, you also raised in your comments, uh, Senator Sheldon, um, that the new rules mean that we're treating Australian workers more harshly—I'm I'm probably paraphrasing you here—than uh, foreign workers on flags of convenience vessels. And why should Australian workers be under more scrutiny uh, than foreign workers? Uh, what I can say to you um, or that I'm instructed is as follows. All individuals accessing a secure zone or secure area or zone of a regulated port must have a valid MSIC or must be escorted or continuously monitored by an MSIC holder, whether they are foreign or Australian workers. Foreign ships entering Australia must demonstrate compliance with international security standards. Foreign ships and foreign seafarers must also comply with the security measures of Australian ports and port facilities. An MSIC ensures the holder has been background checked and allows the holder to be unescorted inside a maritime security zone. 
The schemes are designed to ensure persons, both Australians and foreigners, who require unescorted access to the secure areas of certain security-controlled airports and security-regulated ports are subject to an appropriate background check. And as I've already stated in previous comments, the introduction of the bill will strengthen the ASIC and MSIC schemes to ensure that we prevent individuals who pose a high criminal risk, both Australian and foreigners, to go to the point that you had raised in your comments, from holding a card which is consistent with the findings of a range of parliamentary reviews. Senator Kennelly. Thank you. I want to go back to uh, Captain uh, Salas, and I thank the minister for her answer, which I may be paraphrasing her, but seemed to be that the government was unaware of the issues around Captain Salas when he returned in December 2015. Um, let me uh, ask the minister this, and I quote from uh, News Corp papers on, uh, I'll just get the date up here, 16 of April, or the 11th of April 2016, a Senate inquiry into foreign shipping um, uh, in response to a question from Queensland National Senator Barry O'Sullivan. The Border Protection confirmed it had, quote, holdings on Captain Salas since December 24, 1994, 17 years and eight months before the spate of fatalities occurred on the ship Sagittarius, now known as the Death Ship. I also um, note that, the, that Captain Salas had been wanted by the coroner for questions uh, as a result of the 2012 murders. Is the minister really telling this parliament that the department had no information that would have said that Captain Salas should not be given permission to come back into Australian ports. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Keneally. And I'll just seek further instructions from you in relation to the comments that you've put to me. I don't have them in front of me, unfortunately, to verify um, exactly what was being said. But again, all I can say to you is this in terms of the instructions that I've been given. At the time, there were no known character or security concerns uh, in regard to Captain Salas, as relevant authorities were not aware of the character or security concerns regarding Captain Salas, and MSIC application would not have picked uh, these up. But as I also said to you uh, in my comments, now that the concerns regarding Captain Salas's behaviour have come to light, these will be taken into account on any future visa applications. Um, obviously, the government can't speculate, as I've already said, about any application that may have been lodged or preempt any future decisions. But again, just reaffirming, the government can confirm that the testimony of Captain Salas during the coronial inquest, specifically any admissions to selling firearms to his crew, as well as any penal certificates. Uh, from any country Captain Salas has resided in for longer than 12 months over the age of 16 years in the last 10 years, other adverse information and any character references supplied uh, can now be considered. And again, just for the Hansard record, uh, there is no disputing that Captain Salas was a genuine seafarer. He had a long history of travelling in and out of Australia as the captain or crew member of non-military vessels. Um, while we can't comment on individual cases, we can confirm that people with similar character concerns to Captain Salas may be prevented from being granted a visa due to these concerns. And that's only the information I have at this point in time. Senator Keneally. Uh, thank you. And I'm happy for us to get the... Uh uh, transcript of that, uh, that evidence provided by Border Force officials that they had holdings on Captain Salas going back to 1994, that they had boarded his ships several times. Uh, I quote LNP Senator Barry O'Sullivan, who said in the same Senate hearings, this is not going to end here for me. You have left me very concerned about the security arrangements in your agencies. If someone like Captain Salas does not qualify for a red flag, Senator Sullivan, O'Sullivan went on to say, you might not want to know, but I suspect ordinary Australians would want to know when the Salases of the world are in our ports, 
G U N S. I do not give a rat's ass where they are coming from or where they're going. We need to know when these sort of people are in our company. That's, uh, and I apologize for the language, but that is the language used by former Senator O'Sullivan in relation to Captain Salas. And what I say to people who might be watching at home, this is not just about Captain Salas. He is but one example of the point that Senator Sheldon and I and others on this side of the chamber are trying to make, that when the government says there is some kind of thorough check of foreign crew, that there is some kind of process that flags the character issues or the other issues, I can't take that on face value. I have the Department of Immigration and Border Protection in 2017 telling this Senate that flag of convenience vessels and foreign crew, the regulation around them have holes and gaps in them that allow for importation of drugs or terrorist activities. We have an example, just one, in Captain Salas, wanted by the New South Wales coroner for questioning for some time. Someone that, according to the Department of, of, of Immigration and Border Protection, they have had holdings on, was their word, since 1994, that they have boarded his ships multiple times. They indicated that they had concerns in this hearing about him, and yet he gets to come back and go to Gladstone and Weeper. These are the issues that we're flagging, that the maritime crew visa checking process is not thorough enough. And if we can't take the word of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection in 2017, whose word are we going to take? We need to take the advice of our national security agencies closely. We need to take hold of it, and that is what this amendment seeks to do. Our view is this bill is a good step, but it is not strong enough. And hence, our invitation to the government to either accept our amendment or come up with one of their own or a process of their own to deal with foreign workers to strengthen the requirements. Because I've now heard the minister say several times that but foreign crew, when they get off the ship, they cannot access areas without someone who is being supervised, without someone with an MSIC. But the evidence we have heard throughout multiple inquiries now is that it's simply not the case. Talk to any warfi, you will know that that is not how things work in practice. So let's see if we can tackle this from another side. Minister, how many people would typically be in a crew on a foreign vessel, and how are those crews supervised when they get off the vessel, and how many people would be doing the supervision? Well, yeah. Minister. I apologize, Senator Keneally. I was just listening to your comments in relation to uh, what I had put on the record, and I just do want to make it clear. Uh, if there is any evidence at all of people who are accessing areas that they should not be accessing, I would hope that allegations are just not being made here in the Senate, that those reports are being provided to the relevant officials uh, so that they can be properly investigated. Um, and I'm quite sure you would have asked whoever's given you that information to pass it on to the relevant investigators so that they can actually undertake any investigations. Yes. Senator. Uh, however, my question was, how many people would typically be on a foreign crew and accessing the ports on a, on a ship? How, many, how are those crews supervised when they get off their vessel? And how many people would supervise crew when they're in a secure area? Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And Senator Keneally, I am advised that it will actually depend on the circumstances uh, of the particular vessel at a particular point in time. Senator Keneally. Is there any mandated ratio? 1 to 5, 1 to 20, 1 to 50? Does the minister have any information she can provide along those lines? Minister. I'm advised there is no mandated ratio. Senator Keneally. Do they have to be physically supervised or could that supervision occur via a security camera?
Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Keneally. I'm advised that the regulations require the person to be constantly supervised. Senator Could this Keneally. constant supervision happen via a security camera? Minister. Uh, I'm advised that that would depend on the circumstances. Senator Keneally. It could happen via a security camera. Could the security camera uh, operator be located outside of Australia? Minister. Uh, I'm instructed the answer is no. Senator. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. I just want to put on the record, given that we are back here talking about this bill again, I don't know how many times since I've been in the Senate since uh, we have been discussing this bill, and basically nothing has changed. The, the Greens remain opposed to this bill. It is a flawed bill. It has been developed with a flawed process. We have had the people who have raised concerns about this bill raising concerns for the last four years, and the government haven't listened to them. There is a possibility. I mean, obviously, organised crime, issues of, of crime in our ports and our airports is a really, really serious issue. It's something that we need to get right. This bill, as uh, uh, my Labor colleagues have been pointing out, is incredibly forward when it comes to our maritime ports in that it's an it's overly onerous overly restrictive process for Australian seafarers, which does not apply to foreign seafarers, who are much more likely, because of the conditions that they work in, to actually be potentially um, subject to and, and be part of, of organised crime networks. And what the minister has been saying today is to, uh, to say that things are fine because um, any of these seafarers are supervised. Things are fine because there are maritime security zones which can be established. Clearly, isn't what happens in reality. Clearly, we have got massive gaps in our maritime security that are not being addressed by this bill. And yet, at the same time, there are being re overly onerous restrictions. It can be months before a seafarer manages to get their MSIC card reviewed. And for what purpose? It is not solving the issue of that, those massive gaps in our, um, in our port security processes. With regards to the differences between aviation and sort of our airports and our seaports, the Greens are happy to support the Labor's um, proposal today to split the bill. Um, there are different circumstances, but we actually think that as far as aviation workers go, this bill is also flawed. There is also issues which have been raised by the Transport Workers Union, the, the totally opaque process as to whether somebody gets issued with an ASIC, the lack of review, the lack of accountability as to if somebody is denied an ASIC, why that's the case. They have not been addressed. And these issues have been on the table, as I said, for four years now. And yet this government just reckons not nah, they are just going to push through. They're just going to ride roughshod over the, the interests of workers in the name. It basically, you just raise the issue of, of security, and that's meant to make us all say, oh, OK, this is how it has to happen. But no, you can have a difference between having a problem and then what solution you apply to that problem. If we've got a problem, with our maritime security, if we've got a problem with our aviation security, if we've got a problem of organised crime and, and, and drugs coming into the country, well then yes, we need to deal with it, but we do not need to deal with it in the way that has been outlined in this bill, which has just got many um, impacts on workers which are totally unwarranted. Senator Keneally. Oh, Senator Senator Stirl. Stirl. I'm sorry, sorry, Senator Rice. I thought there was a question. My apologies. Um, Minister, with the greatest of respect, uh, I know you're repping for the portfolio at the moment, but I think it's integral that we have a little bit of a history lesson for your good self to find out exactly what happened around the Sage Sagittarius and Captain Salas, because I was the chair of the committee through the whole inquiry. I had the pleasure of sitting next to Senator O'Sullivan when that evidence came out from border security. And you don't have to apologise to me, Senator Keneally, about the language, because um, 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 I've worked closely with Barry O'Sullivan and I dearly miss Senator O'Sullivan. But on that, 
What we do know, the Sage Sagittarius is a Japanese-owned vessel. What we do know, and forgive me, I can't give you the dates. It's, it's, it's a bit going on up here in this in this uh, uh, um, brain cells at the moment. But um, mysteriously coming into, I think it may be Newcastle. I think. Uh, uh, Minister Cash, where one of the um, sailors on board uh, on the ship fell overboard, missing, came into port. Um, then on the way out, uh, no, no, one had gone overboard on the way in. Then just hours from outside of Newcastle or wherever it was, one fell down into the hull and was killed. So we got one sailor missing, one killed. So when it got to port, the Japanese owners. This is all on the record. Actually, put an undercover detective from Japan onto the Sage Sagittarius before it sailed from our waters, and this undercover detective mysteriously fell into the um, conveyor belt when the ship berthed in Japan to unload. So we've got two deaths, as Senator Rice would remember, and those of us that were involved in this, and we have one missing overboard. Captain Salas and Minister, with the greatest of respect, I'm not blaming you, but your colleague Minister Dutton knows exactly every little issue around this sordid detail of our maritime history. Minister Dutton and his officers and advisers at the time know every single miserable sordid detail of the death ship. So they may very well I'm not pointing to the officers in I'm not pointing to the crew in the box with you. I'm going back to Minister Dutton because I'm saying there's so many mistruths, there's so many things that have not been owned up. You are the poor devil that's carrying the can to get the legislation through. It's a shame Minister Dutton doesn't reside in this house because I'd love to see him turn the same colour as the walls in here when the truths are put to him to see if he could wriggle out of it. I stand by every word I say in this chamber. Also, what we have to understand—this is a very important part, Minister, where I feel so sorry because your colleague has let you down a, a dead-end street here—Captain Salas was of interest. Captain Salas, as Senator Keneally clearly stated, as did Senator Sheldon, clearly owned up to gun running and alcohol running. Not an issue about that. Captain Salas sailed off into the sunset, and I know when the New South Wales coroner's report was on, when they were actually in the courtroom, Minister Cash, and you've been in courtrooms more than me, me as the defendant, you, oh no, me as the witness probably, and you as the prosecutor. Um, on saying that, I always stuck up for truckies. I don't care what happened. So anyway, where was I? Yeah. So they couldn't uh, lay charges on Captain Salas because. Nobody knew where Captain Salas was, except one person. Australian Federal Police didn't know where Captain Salas was. The New South Wales Police didn't know where Captain Salas was. Border Protection and Immigration didn't know where uh, Captain Salas was. I don't know if they even asked the age. I've got no idea. I'm telling you who I know who didn't know. But there was one very, very sharp, intelligent person, a man by the name of Owen Jarks. Owen Jarks was a reporter for one of the News Corp rags on the, uh, the Sunshine Coast. And Owen rang me here in this building to tell me he was in the New South Wales courtroom listening to proceedings. They went to Smoko on the proviso that they probably wouldn't come back because they couldn't find they couldn't find Captain Salas. Owen Jarks went up to the prosecutor in New South Wales and said, guess what, Cobber? I know where he is. Tomorrow he's coming into Gladstone. I can't remember the name of the ship. Senator Keneally named it earlier. Captain Jacques was coming into— can you believe this stuff? You can't write a Hollywood series that goes this bad as he's sailing in. Not his first trip. He'd been on the number of ones. But, but Owen Jacques had the register. It wasn't Spooksville. It wasn't stolen from Russell Street, or Russell up there at headquarters with the, with the ASIO. He had it off the internet. Here comes Captain uh, Salas. Ho -ho. All of a sudden, the place went into a, into a whiz, and they went and got Captain Salas. And there you go. So, Minister, while the advisers can only work on what they're being told, I think someone needs to take a back step really, really quickly and get back to the chameleon. And I'm not going to apologise for this unless you pull me up, being Minister Dutton. Okay, who has managed to wriggle out of all responsibility here. They knew exactly every single thing that went on. So I think there needs to be some real soul searching going on. If you're going to be providing, not to the decent 
advisers in the box, you poor devils, you only got what you got from Dutton's office previously, setting everyone up here. Be very, very careful what you say. Be very careful how you answer these questions there in Hansard. And there are a lot of people that are going to follow this up. On saying that, I hope that's paint, painted a far better picture for you, Minister. Because I can tell you now, when you have the information 24, minute, 24 hours, or if you're lucky, 48 hours offshore, when a captain sends an email to whoever it is to say, these are the people I've got on board, it's actually the shipper that's supposed to be doing it, but he's got to get it from somewhere, I can tell you now, categorically guarantee, that all the faces on the passports will match the face of the character that's holding the passport. Given, not a problem. The name will be the same. It'll probably have something else that says that's who he is or she is. But let me ask this question to you, Minister. And I've got a couple here. So when that email comes through to the powers to be to say that we're doing our background checks, just walk me through what happens when our whoever it is gets that list to say. They can come in. Help me out there, Minister. Minister. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Senator Stirl, for noting that uh, I was not part of the inquiry, etc. This was done some time ago. Um, I can't add anything further to what you've put on the table. All I can say is the instructions that I have in front of me are, uh, at the time, there were no known character or security concerns in regard to Captain Salas. And as relevant authorities were not aware of the character or security concerns regarding Captain Salas, an MSIC application would not have picked those up. So I can't at this point in time add anything further to answers that I've previously given. Senator Stirl. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Minister Cash, but I'll come back to so now. The powers to be who are going to let these people come in on this ship, whatever it may be, has a list in front of them of names. What do they do with that list? Minister. Again, Senator Steele, there does seem to have been a conflation of two issues here. I understand that the people that you're referring to would actually go through the maritime crew visa as opposed to the MSIC, which operate as two separate schemes, depending on the reason that you are coming into the country. Senator Steele. Th thank you, uh, Acting Chair. Uh, Minister, there is no confliction here. We're talking about tightening up our border controls. We're talking about whatever we can do, which Labor fully supports. How can we stop the influx of illegal drugs coming into our nation? There is no argument. Senator Keneally, what's left for you to do, Senator Keneally, Keneally would it be like a scene from Life of Brian where you have to paint it a hundred times on the, on the Parliament House walls? Very clear what you've made there. What we are saying with no confliction of, of getting our things mixed Mixed up here, Minister, is that it is not Australians that are bringing these drugs into our shores. So once again, I go back and I ask you: If this government and I accuse this government of all being smoke and mirrors, I accuse you of being half. Oh, I nearly said half ass. That was lucky. Half um, uh, um, interested in trying to pursue the sheriffs at the gate to stop drugs coming in. Minister, I go back to this. When you have a list, the powers to be, that says these are the seafarers and this is the captain and these are the, uh, um, the uh, cooks and everything else on this ship, what and who does what with that list? Minister. Uh, thank you, and Senator Stirl. I can provide you with the following information. Like all travellers to Australia, applicants for an MCV are subject to a range of character and security checking processes, and an MCV will not be issued to a person who fails the character test or who is identified as a security risk. I can also provide you with the following information. All crew departing a vessel are required to disembark at an appointed port where there is an Australian border force presence. The ABF will conduct an assessment against all vessels. Any risks identified will be treated appropriately. This includes physical checks and other compliance activities. Vessels may request permission to arrive at a non-appointed port without ABF presence. 
This will only be approved by the ABF if the risk can be managed or the ABF can attend in person. All appointed first ports of entry have facilities to conduct immigration clearance. Vessels are required to enter Australia at an appointed first port of entry where ABF and Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment Biosecurity checks can be completed. In circumstances where the ABF or Biosecurity grant permission to attend a non-appointed port, both agencies will ensure appropriate arrangements or facilities are available to undertake required checks. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Now, that was long drawn out. I pre appreciate what you've just read into the Senate, but I also remember what was put to the Senate in the inquiry, which contradicts a lot of those statements where that doesn't happen. But I'll come back to my original question, because sorry, my shorthand's not that good. But you did say when this magical list of who's on my ship comes into whoever it may be, uh, ABF, I believe. So ABF have got that list, okay? So you said ABF go through a range of what was the word you used? I'm sorry, I couldn't get it down. Assessment. Uh, uh, an assessment. What does that assessment assessment involve, Minister? Minister. Uh, at this point in time, Senator Stirl, the department are getting me further information, but in terms of the ABF's assessment, it is conducted against all vessels. And as I've stated, any risks identified are treated appropriately, and this includes the physical checks but also other compliance activities. Vessels, as I've said, may request permission to arrive at non-appointed port without ABF presence, but this will only be approved by the ABF if the risks associated with that, which is what you seem to be going to, can be managed or the ABF can attend in person. Senator Stirl. Thanks, Chair. So, Minister, where I am trying to go to is this, that a list goes, and please feel free to pull me up if I'm wrong, a list goes to the ABF, the ABF run it through whatever they do, and am I right to believe if no red flags come up, business as usual? Minister. I'm instructed that, on the basis of what you said, that no red flags come up. The answer is yes. That would be correct. Senator Stirl. Thank you. And, Minister, I'm led to believe that this is the process for every entry of every foreign vessel into our nation. Is this correct? Minister. I'm instructed that that would be correct. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. So, on saying that, I go back to this, Minister, when you say um, through your notes there that uh, nobody had any interest in Captain Salas, even though Captain Salas had lost one person overboard, two mysteriously killed on his vessel, one being an undercover Japanese detective engaged by the owners, one to him confessing of gun running, and I forget the timeline, I think it was around 2.15 or something like that, and yet Captain Salas had continued to sail into Gladstone and Weeper and no one could find him. I don't know if I've missed something, but should there not have been one of these magical emails saying, here I am, here's the crew, and in I come? Minister? Senator Stirl. Chair, thank you. Minister, I, I find that bitterly disappointing. I find that the height of hypocrisy when we're discussing a bill that goes to, and I'm using my fingers in inverted commas, clamping down on crims and drugs coming into our nation. I ask a very, very simple question of the minister and the department officials or the ministerial officials sitting there, that you're pushing a bill down the throat of this Senate on falsehoods when a minister can stand at the table, read her notes—I'm not blaming the minister, she's just parroting them—to tell me nothing gets past us, we would know nothing was on Captain Salas. I have just laid out what I know, what the Rural Regional Affairs and Reference Committee in the Senate knows, and all of us that have sat there and said of the Sheldon, thank goodness you've joined us in the last couple of years too. I ask a very simple question on national security, and I stand here gobsmacked that I'm now to be shut down, pushed off 
hopefully I'll go away. Maybe the Tucker Bell melt might ring and I forgot to pick up my pie and it'll be all over by the time I get back. I'm giving you the opportunity, Minister, to please either correct the record, put someone in a headlock in the advisor's box, send them upstairs. I cannot let go of the fact I asked a very, very simple question. You outlined, or I outlined, and you very clearly answered my concerns. Every list that comes off that vessel, whether it be 48 hours or whether it be 24 hours, nothing gets past us. The ABF have their assessments and their range or whatever it was that you said, and yet Captain Salas for two years or two voyages or whatever it was, whatever it was after mysteriously someone falling overboard, two murdered on the vessel, a confessed to gun running, two years later. Owen Jacques, a reporter with News Corp, brings to my attention that it's not his first trip, but he's coming into uh, Gladstone. As Senator Keneally clearly outlined, Gladstone Weeper, there's a couple of things. I ask a simple question, and Minister, you can't answer. Now, Minister, you are far more intelligent than the persona that you've just portrayed to me then, and you know that I always give credit where credit is due. I've said very clearly. The chameleon in this place is in another portfolio at the moment. That whole office knows darn well every secret, every dirty, filthy, sordid detail of this shocking bit of our maritime history. And yet, Minister, no one can give me an honest answer. So I would say to the people of Australia, I say to the crossbench, I don't have to say it to the Greens and Labor because we've got it. Please point me, get me by the nose, take me in a direction that tells me I've got this wrong. You, being the LNP Morrison government, we forget the other half, the dopey nat half, that this is a massive plus to stop criminality and the influx of illicit drugs coming through our ports. And Minister, I'm not even talking aviation. There may be the odd stupid idiot who tries to smuggle something through in, a, in a, uh, an envelope or their bags. You and I both know, Minister, as does everyone in this, this building knows, these drugs are coming on foreign flagged vessels that are crewed by foreign captains with exploited foreign seafarers. There is a terrible exploitation of the temporary voyage permit in this nation. When Mr Howe was the Prime Minister and this nonsense first started, where if you couldn't find an Australian flagged vessel, we'll go find, go and find a, a, a foreign vessel because we've got to move the freight. And like us, us dopey ones, oh, that sounds fair. We don't want to stop productivity in this nation when we should have realised that was the thin edge of the exploitation. We had 95 Australian flagged vessels when Mr Howard was the Prime Minister. You know what we have now? 13. And I ask a very simple question. Should every single Australian believe that the Morrison LNP government says nothing gets past us. We know who's coming on these shores. We get a list. How wrong could you be? Because we get a list. We get it. Not only that, it's an email list, and it's come to us from 48 hours earlier. And guess what? There was no red flags. No red flags. You couldn't even find a confessed gunrunner who's been working in our shores, on our shores, in and out for two years. Who the hell do I lay the blame at? Whose feet? Should I stand here and belittle the poor devils that are trying to make this crap ball work at ABF or, or the Australian Federal Police? No, I think they do a magnificent job. But this government comes in here to pull the wool over the Australian people, and you dare go out there and you attack Labor that we're soft on, 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 on um, uh, drug import because we want to do this properly. We're supposed you bag us because we're saying if you're fair dinkum, go all the way. How can you convince the Australian public that when you stand up there and you say you're strong on drugs and you're strong on crime, and then this side of the parliament, Labor and the Greens, and some of the crossbenchers say, good, flow that toughness on to the foreign seafarers, the foreign captains, the exploited ones, the ones that might not have a red flag in 48 hours. How can I sit here, of all the work that I've done on this committee, over the 16 years, the six or seven, no, oh no, how many now, Senator Sheldon? Eight inquiries into maritime. And you think that I'm going to be fooled? And you think the Australian people are going to be fooled because you people give us a nod and a wink? So I ask one more time, Minister. I will give the opportunity now that hopefully there's been a flurry of paperwork around. Can you please explain to the Senate 
and to the good people of Australia and tell us how the hell could you look us in the eye and tell us there was no red flags on Captain Salas two years after one of his crew went overboard, two years after two deaths on the same voyage on the Sage Sagittarius, and he's coming to our shores and you don't know. Minister. Well, well, thank you, Senator Stuhl, uh, for those uh, comments. And unfortunately, all I can say is I actually have answered those questions. I don't have anything additional that I can present to you uh, that would actually build on my previous comments. But what I would say uh, is that I think this government has shown time and time again uh, that we are committed to keeping Australia and Australians safe. And in terms of the particular bill that we have before us today, um, this is all about preventing, and you've referred to it, serious criminal influence and activity from occurring at our security-controlled airports, seaports and offshore facilities. And I think just, just last week now, uh, what we've seen in particular with Operation Ironside that gained global media uh, was that organised criminals are taking advantage um, where they can and the Morrison government is doing everything that we can to stop them. Uh, serious crime, you've acknowledged, is a major threat uh, to our way of life. And in fact, the figure uh, that I have been given is it costs Australia more than $47 billion a year. And again, as you've um, articulated, it does cause enormous human suffering. And our airports and our seaports are a vector for the importation of illicit substances and weapons, as you uh, have referred to in your contribution to the Senate. Um, and that is why the government has introduced this particular piece of legislation to ensure that Australia's transport security sector um, is no longer a safe haven for serious criminal activity. Uh, we've had a number of years now to consider this legislation. And what we are today calling on Labor to do is to show that you will join with us to show the Australian people that you are also serious about stopping organised crime by supporting the timely passage uh, of this bill through the Australian Senate. I mean, as uh, Pauline Hanson, Senator Pauline Hanson, uh, on behalf of One Nation, has stated, we need to stop organised criminals getting access to our wharves and to our airports. The bill is a very simple bill, um, and it very much goes to the commitment that the Morrison government has to keeping Australia and Australians safe. Senator Stewart. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, Minister. Now, I've just got a couple more, but I will succeed to Senator Keneally. But let me ask you this then, Minister. So when uh, um, um, I went and spoke to the crossbench and the Greens with the, the endorsement of the leadership that we wanted to defer the uh, passage of the legislation and go back to the inquiry, back to the committee, we had a lot more questions to ask, which we did ask. A lot more answers unanswered too, wasn't there, Senator Sheldon, which gave me no warmth, I can tell you. But I'll go back to this one. At the time, and I can't give you the exact date because, Minister, I don't have the copy here. If we start looking for it, I'll find it on Google. Okay, but there was a um, large shipment of illicit drugs. I think it may have been heroin or cocaine, I can't remember. It just sort of fell off a ship off the Queensland coast around the same time as this was going through. I'm sure your officials would be well aware of that. Um, what happened with the crew that were on that ship? Could you tell us how this bill has addressed that or will address that? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Stirl. I have no information before me in relation to the issue that you raise, the example that you raise. Senator Stirl. Okay, I'll, I'll go and get the. Hello, Ben, if you're listening, mate, can you drag it off the email so I can get off, the, the, off this, what do you call this? Drag it off one of these and I'll give a copy to the government. Um, okay, I'll come back to this one then. Minister, it is also a well known fact, and we have established this in the inquiry through, through many witnesses here, that the massive import of drugs flooding our nation coming through on shipping, it's not actually transactions on the waterfront, it's going out in containers and delivered to wherever it may be. Please tell me how this bill goes to address 
that concern of mine and how will making it harder for uh, port employees to get M6, will that stop illicit drugs being shipped through uh, containers that are not screened through our ports? You haven't got the screening facility. You have a hit and run now and again. You have a couple of dogs walk around, have a bit of a sniff, and you make it sometimes six months, before, six months senators, sometimes uh, some of our waterside workers, our wharfies, have waited for their M6. Minister. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Senator Still, for those comments. Uh, I'm instructed that currently the scope of background checks in the Acts is limited to only preventing unlawful interference with aviation and maritime infrastructure. Uh, to go to the issue that you have raised, uh, the bill will provide for the strengthening of the ASIC and M6 schemes by ensuring that those with serious criminal convictions or links to organised crime do not exploit the schemes to access the secure areas of our airports, seaports and offshore facilities. Senator Stirr. Thanks, Chair. And Senator Keneally, I'll make this my last one. But Senator, uh, Minister Cash, I'll come back to this. Drugs are flooding onto this nation through ships or via shipping. What I've just said clearly and has come through and I've passed on to you and everyone else listening, that the majority of this rubbish is sitting in containers. And it may be in foreign languages and it may have a way bill that's lied to, and it may be smuggled in tomato cans or it may be smuggled in car parts, I don't know. So we're making it harder or tougher and tougher for Australian waterside workers, wharfies, stevedores, or anyone else that goes on the port to get their M sick. We're not lifting one finger to make it any more rigid or harder or um, um, uh, more beneficial for us to know who's bringing these, these ships in, the captains and the crews. And there's nothing going to happen on the port, but the containers will still be going out, not scanned, and it could go to another, the other part, not could, it goes to another part of the drug syndications. How does this bill tap that? How does this bill? go to appeasing the Australian people who are saying, you know what, the Morrison government's not all, what, what, you know, all announcement and, and no follow-up and all that sort of stuff they're actually doing. Do we really, or how does this bill appease the majority of decent, hard-working men and women in this nation who hate illicit drugs? How can you con them to think that we're going to make it harder for an Aussie to get an M6? We're not going to do anything to make it harder for no who's coming on our nation. Oh, and while they're here, they can exploit the temporary voyage permit and they can cut between Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, you know. Oh, they can do three runs. And if they do more than three runs, we'll make sure then they pay Aussie wages, but we won't police it. And by the way, they've taken off after three. We're absolutely crucifying our rail industry because of this exploitation of temporary voyage permits and maritime crew visas. But Please tell Mr and Mrs Citizen how this bill makes them feel a lot safer that these illicit drugs coming out of wherever they're coming from and going to warehouses and, and uh, other points being unloaded by crooks. How is this bill going to stop that? Minister. Senator Steele, I've answered um, much of that question in relation to questions that have been put to me uh, by other senators. But what I would say to you in toto is this. I've already placed on the record we need to stop organised criminals getting access to our wharves and to our airports, and it is critical to ensure that criminals do not have security credentials to access secure areas of our ports, allowing drugs into our streets and compromising Australia's supply chains. Senator Keneally. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the questions I was asking earlier about security cameras. Uh, the minister seems to have indicated, although she hasn't made this declarative statement, that. Uh, foreign crew can be supervised by a security camera, not by an actual person, when they are uh, accessing unsupervised areas or where areas where they should be supervised, they can be supervised by a security camera. The minister has said that it's her understanding the security camera operator must be located in Australia. Can she confirm that is correct? And does the security camera operator need to have an MSIC? Minister. Uh, thank you. In relation to the operation of the schemes themselves, both the S6 scheme and the M6 scheme, uh, you'd be aware, but just for the Hansard record, they are nationally consistent identification cards that show the holder has met the minimum security requirements to remain unmonitored within an aviation or maritime security zone. All individuals who require an ASIC or M6 
must have a valid background check to enter an aviation or maritime security zone. An individual must have an operational need for entering the area, and they must display their valid ATSIC, ASIC or MSIC. People who have an operational need to enter a security area but who do not have, do not have in this circumstance, an ASIC or MSIC must be escorted and continuously monitored by an ATSIC holder in the secure areas of an airport or by an MSIC holder in the security zones of a port or offshore oil and gas facility. Just in terms of some additional statistics that I can actually provide the Senate, as at the 17th of May 2021, there were 120,900 issued ASICs and 101,817 issued M6 in circulation. And in the 2019-20 financial year, Auscheck processed 80,155 ASICs and 40,947 MSIC applications. So in terms of, uh, as I've stated, Senator Lee, those who have an operational need to enter a security area but do not have an ASIC or MSIC, they must be escorted and continuously monitored by an ASIC holder in the security area of an airport or in relation to the MSIC or by an MSIC holder in the security zones of a port or offshore oil and gas facility. Senator Keneally. Thank you. Earlier I asked the minister about that supervision that she's just referred to uh, and if she could describe uh, in terms of the operation of the ASIC or the M6 scheme, how Cooper's crew are supervised and how many uh, is it a one-on-one -on -one supervision? Is it a one to five or one to twenty? She said there was no ratio. And then I asked if that supervision could occur over via security camera. Is the minister now saying that the crew to access that foreign crew who do not have an MSIC or ASIC when they are accessing security zones have to both be physically supervised and monitored, or can they just be monitored? Can that supervision and monitoring occur via a security camera? Minister. Uh, Senator Keneally, it will very much depend on the circumstances. Uh, the example that the departmental official has just given me is if they were in a locked room uh, with another person, uh, then what you may find is that security cameras as long as the person is being monitored by an ATSIC holder in the secure area, or an MSIC, depending on whether or not we're talking an airport um, or a maritime facility, could be adequate. But it will very much depend on the particular circumstances. But just to clarify again for the Hansard record, people who have an operational need to enter a security area but do not have an ASIC or MSIC must be escorted and continuously monitored by the ASIC holder in the secure areas of an airport or by an MSIC holder in the security zones of a port or offshore oil and gas facility. Senator Keneally. I appreciate the minister's answers, but I don't think I'm quite getting the answer that I'm looking for. Is there ever a circumstance where a, uh, a foreign crew could be in a secure area operated on, uh, monitored and supervised only by a security camera. Minister. Uh, if the person is free to move around, the answer will be no. Senator Keneally. I'm sorry, what did you just say? If the person is free to move around, they're not, the, in, a secure room. They're not in a secure room. If they're not in a secure room, No, I'm asking if they're in a secure facility, in a secure space, are they being physically supervised or is there ever a circumstance where they're only being supervised by a security camera?
Minister. Okay, Senator Keneally, again, just to restate my previous answer, I've been instructed by the department at all times the person must be escorted or continuously monitored. I think we've established that by an ASIC holder in the secure areas of an airport or by an MSIC holder in the security zones of a port or offshore oil and gas facility. Depending on the circumstances, to put it very simply, if the person is able to move around, physical. If they are in a locked room by themselves, and that is defined as the secure area, it may be that as long as the person that is continuously monitoring them is an ASIC holder or an MSIC holder, they may not have to be physically present in the room with them. Senator Keneally. Is it the minister's advice then to this parliament that every single member of a foreign crew, that is people who are not required to have an MSIC at our maritime ports, are never left unattended in secure areas of maritime ports? Minister. Uh, I am advised that that is correct. And if you have evidence uh, that would support that there has been such a case, could you please provide it so it can be provided to the relevant authorities? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Minister. I think we've had some, some evidence provided in various Senate inquiries. Uh, so let's talk about when uh, foreign crew are walking through a maritime port. I'm seeking to understand, is it like an airport? Are the crew required to hand over their passports to immigration <coughs> officials for inspection? Minister. Uh, I'm instructed, yes. Senator Keneally. We might come back to that. Are there x ray machines to check out what the crew are taking in and out of the port? Minister. Uh, I'm advised that it will depend on the port and the deployment of ABF resources, depending on risk, etc. Senator Keneally. So is it your evidence that crew are always required to hand over their passports to immigration officials for inspection? Minister. Um, I'm instructed by the department that the answer is that they should. If there is evidence that this is not occurring, please advise. I'm also instructed by the department that there is no legislative requirement for passengers or crew arriving in Australia, whether by sea or air, to be subject to security screening, for example, going through a metal detector. All identified risks, which goes to my previous answer, are scrutinised and treated appropriately to prevent the importation of prohibited goods. The ABF deploys specialist capabilities, including detector dogs, to areas of greatest risk and identified needs, as informed, it goes to my previous answer, uh, through intelligence. Senator Keneally. Uh, Minister, I think you gave evidence earlier, similar to this point I'm about to make, that 72 per cent of amphetamines seized in 2018-19 came through our maritime ports. I was going to ask you if there are drug detector dogs uh, at maritime ports. You have said it areas of most significant need or prioritized into where there is need. Let's, let me ask you this. If I were to ask you about foreign pilots on major commercial airlines landing, for example, at Sydney Airport, could you tell me what proportion of those pilots would have walked through a medical detector before entering an Australian airport? Minister. Uh, this is something that the department would need to provide if you're looking for the statistic. Senator Keneally. Could you tell me how, what proportion of Australian pilots would have had their luggage x-rayed or examined when they enter or exit an airport? Surely you must have some idea. Minister. Uh, thank you. And the department has said if you would like the information, they will seek to obtain it for you. But as I previously stated, there is no legislative requirement for passengers and crew arriving in Australia, whether by sea or air, to be subject to security screening. And the example we gave, which you picked up on, uh, is going through a metal detector. All identified risks are scrutinised 
and treated appropriately to prevent the importation of prohibited goods. And as you picked up on my previous answer, the ABF deploys specialist capabilities, including detector dogs, to areas of greatest risk and identified needs, as informed through intelligence. Senator Keneally. Minister, I suspect the answer we'll get from the department is that it would, about airline, air, aircraft pilots, that it would be close to 100 per cent. Are you able to tell me what proportion of foreign crew at our maritime ports go hand over their passports for inspection or go through metal detectors or are assessed by drug detector dogs? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Keneally. And I am advised uh, that they should all have their passports checked. But in relation to the security screening uh, that you are referring to, again, I reaffirm for the record, there is no legislative requirement for passengers and crew arriving in Australia. In this case, you are talking by sea, whether by sea or air, to be subject to security screening and, for example, uh, going through a metal detector. All identified risks are scrutinised and treated appropriately to prevent the importation of prohibited goods. And again, as we referred to and you picked up on in relation to the detector dogs, the ABF deploys specialist capabilities, including detector dogs, to areas of greatest risk and identified need as informed through the intelligence that they are gathering. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Minister. I think this goes to the heart of the matter. You've said now twice that there's no legislative requirement. Uh, I think if we get the answers, we'll find out that the practice at airports in terms of foreign crew coming off airplanes is that they go through metal detectors. They hand over their passports. They are assessed quite frequently by drug detector dogs. But when it comes to our maritime ports, the practice is different. And this is the point that was made by the Department of Immigration and Border Protection in 2017 that said the features of flag of convenience registration, regulation and practice that organized crime syndicates or terrorists seek to exploit. And the Department of Immigration went on to say that flag of convenience ships may be used in a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling and facilitating prohibited imports or exports. We heard from Senator Stirl the sad, long saga of Captain Salas and the, mere fa and the fact that, according to the minister, we should have known he was coming and we know heaps about him. All the character tests of the world didn't stop him from coming back to Australian ports. And here we have a circumstance where the government cannot explain the practice that is in place in terms of maritime ports versus airports. But the Australian people have eyes. They see foreign crew at our airports being checked. We're not seeing the similar... The, the government has yet in any forum, any time this has been through a Senate inquiry, been able to demonstrate that it has the rigorous policies, processes and practices in place. The minister has made reference, and I repeat, 72 per cent of amphetamines seized in 1819 came to our maritime ports. Some 20,000 foreign flagged ship visits to Australian ports every year, crewed by some 200,000 crew. The, Senator Stirl made the point about how few Australian vessels there are these days that we've seen 83 per cent of cannabis seized in 1819 was seized at Mer at via sea cargo. 24 per cent of MDMA seized in 2018-19 was seized via sea cargo. 11 per cent of heroin seized in 1819 was seized, be seized via sea cargo. Minister, what is, you made the point before about the difference between kilograms and tons. It was a rather dramatic point that, you know, kilograms come through airports, tons come through our maritime ports. Well, that is kind of the point we're making here. But let me ask you this. 
Given the evidence you've just provided, what's to stop a crew member getting off a ship with a couple of kilograms of crystal meth in their backpack and walking straight into Australian ports? What's stopping that? Minister. Uh, well, again, Senator Keneally, the majority of what we are looking for or what ABF are looking for are actually found in the containers, not necessarily on the particular person themselves. And I go back to my previous evidence. There is no legislative requirement for passengers and crew arriving in Australia, whether by sea, sea or air, to be subject to security screening. And as we've discussed uh, in relation to, a, for example, a metal detector, all identified risks, and this is what the benefit of intelligence is, are scrutinised and treated appropriately to prevent the importation of prohibited goods. So depending on the level of intelligence uh, that has actually been gained by the ABF uh, themselves, they will then seek to deploy specialist capabilities, including, and we've referred to them, detector dogs, to areas of greatest risk and identified need as informed through intelligence. And this is why the gathering of intelligence is such an important part of the Australian Border Forces um, functions. Senator Keneally. So if I'm understanding the government correctly, they can't actually answer the questions that we're putting about why, why someone like Captain Salas, who is just one of many, examples has been able to access Australian ports. They can't tell us and maritime ports. They can't tell us about how many uh, foreign crew are, are actually uh, have their passports checked, actually um, are uh, assessed by um, metal detectors, actually are uh, subject to do drug detector dogs. They can't, um, they can't uh, really explain why it takes just 24 to 40 hours to get 48 hours to get a maritime crew visa but some three months to get uh, a MSIC for an Australian worker. Yeah, look, let me be clear again. Labor is all about supporting tougher border security controls. We maintain our concern, and I am disappointed uh, that the government is, is uh, indicating it's not willing um, to, take, uh, to take the opportunity to provide either their own solution to foreign crew problems, first identified by the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, or indeed uh, to, um, to accept our amendment. Um, I'd like to... Um, and, and so our position remains that while this bill seeks to do some, make some improvements, it doesn't go far enough. It is not tough enough. It does not take the appropriate security measures that are necessary at our maritime ports. And while the revelations from the head of the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission boss, Mike Phelan, uh, about the facilitation of importation of drugs into the country on 60 Minutes um, are quite concerning. It does go to show the fact that the Australian Conduct Criminal Intelligence Commission has made significant strides when it comes to airports, and we congratulate them and the AFP. But what we are concerned about is that there has yet to be any action on the evidence provided by the Department of Immigration and border protection in terms of the risk posed by flag of convenience vessels. So I have to, have to express my extreme disappointment that the government are leaving this uh, gaping hole uh, in our border security and flag that uh, we in the Australian Labor Party continue to take this seriously and we will continue to look at uh, other ways to address the gaping hole that the government seems intent on leaving in their legislation. I know that Senator Sheldon has some additional questions. I'm going to ask him, uh, rather than ask another question myself, and if we have some time um, before we move out of this amendment, I may come back to some additional questions. But Senator, Senator Sheldon. Acting Deputy President. Well, I want to just draw to the Minister's attention an article from the March the 12th, 2021 by Laura Chung. Sydney Morning Herald, where the heading of the, of the particular story is that rough seas and dim light inside the fishing boat 
raid to nab 200 kilos of cocaine. Now, in, in what's appeared to have been an um, early morning uh, raid, um, it describes how on Thursday morning as authorities trailed a small boat, fishing boat in Port Botany. Authorities spent two days training for the operation to seize hundreds of kilograms of cocaine, searched two boats, including a 330-metre ship, and arrested a 27-year-old Australian man. Of course, the police have alleged that that was a part of the importation, uh, where a small boat was launched from Port Botany, south of Sydney, to meet its 330-metre mothership, the MSS Joanna, which originated in Antwerp, Belgium. Drugs believed to have been stored on the large ship were transferred to the smaller fishing ship. So, can the minister explain? I have some other questions on this, but the minister, explain what the steps are for the assessment for a maritime crew visa. Done. Minister. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. And I can advise as follows, and I'm sure you, you do know the answer, uh, but I will advise uh, as follows. Uh, the Maritime Crew Visa, otherwise known as the MCV, allows a non-citizen to enter and temporarily remain in Australia as a member of a crew or a non-military ship to undertake work that meets the normal operational requirements of that ship. Maritime crew visas are, again, you probably are aware, multiple entry visas, which are valid for three years. A non-military ship means a ship that is engaged in commercial trade or the carriage of passengers for reward, or that is owned and operated by a foreign government for the purposes of scientific research, or that has been accorded public vessel status by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. A non-military ship does not include a vessel which has been imported under the Customs Act 1901 and is not registered in the Australian International Shipping Register. A licence issued under the Coastal Trading Revitalising Australian Shipping Act 2012 exempts international ships engaged in domestic trade from importation. The Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications is the authority responsible for a determining if the vessel has been imported and b for licences issued under the Coastal Trading Act. Since 2012, foreign flag ships have the ability to remain in Australian waters on 12-month temporary licences granted by the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications, and currently crew maintain their lawful visa status on their maritime crew visa for the duration of the ship's licence temporary stay in Australian waters. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. So, from what, Minister, from what you've just explained to me, that there is no real uh, check because you haven't given us what the check is specifically of those MCV holders, and, and it does raise you know, deep concerns in light of this cocaine importation that there is not an appropriate check of these particular crew members. So, I want to then just step you through, Minister, um, what's the MSIC and ASIC tests and what agencies carry out those tests? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, in terms of, in the first instance, I'll take you through what is the difference uh, in background check for what we were previously talking about, uh, which is the Maritime Crew Visa, uh, or the MCV as it is known, and the MSIC. So in terms of the MSIC, and the background check that is undertaken. An identity check, a security assessment by the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, 
otherwise known as ASIO, a criminal history check by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, and an immigration check by the Department of Home Affairs. In terms of the MCV, the public interest criteria assessment is undertaken as follows. Uh, PIC being public interest criteria, I'll refer to it uh, as PIC. PIC 4001 character, this includes a criminality assessment. PIC 4002, which is the national security assessment. PIC 4003, which is the weapons of mass destruction. PIC 4004, debts to the Commonwealth. PIC 4013. Minister, it now being 2 p.m., the committee will report progress. Committee reports progress. Questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. In approving an almost $2 billion settlement for victims of the coalition government's unlawful robo-debt scheme, Justice Murphy characterised it as, and I quote, a shameful chapter in the administration of the Commonwealth social security system and a massive failure of public administration. Why was this shameful chapter, designed by Mr Morrison as social services minister, implemented by him as treasurer and supported by him as prime minister? Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator for the question. Look, the Federal Court has approved the settlement of the income compliance class action. Services Australia will be implementing a scheme to distribute the settlement funds of $112 million, less court approved costs for Gordon Legal. Uh, the background of the history, uh, which uh, Senator Gallagher raises, is very well known. But for me, as the Minister now, what is important is how we move forward. Uh, and put this uh, put this behind us. The court has decided the settlement. It, the court the court the court has decided the settlement is fair and reasonable, and it is in the interest of class action members. The court noted that the contra uh, contradictor, who was appointed to represent group members' interests, described the proposed settlement as a very favourable outcome. And both the Commonwealth and Gordon Legal have acknowledged that the settlement of the class action is not an admission of liability by the Commonwealth and does not reflect any acceptance by the Commonwealth of the allegations that the Commonwealth Order. or any of its officers had any knowledge of unlawful associated, uh, unlawfulness associated with the income compliance program. Uh, His Honour also similarly found that there is little in the materials placed before the courts that could have substantiated such an allegation. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. Order. I do have a supplementary. Justice Murphy also said, and I quote, one thing that stands out is the financial hardship, anxiety and distress, including suicidal ideation and, in some cases, suicide, that people or their loved ones say was suffered as a result of the robo-debt system. Does the Morrison government accept that almost half a million people were hounded and suffered at the hands of a scheme designed, implemented and supported by Mr Morrison from day one? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And any death, uh, any death is regrettable. But I think those opposite, by trying to suggest an elevated death rate, an elevated death rate for those who previously received income data matching lessons, is not consistent with the facts. Incorrectly, incorrectly interpreting death statistics Order. as being suicides can, in fact, cause further distress. And I would ask most sincerely all parliamentary colleagues and the media to reflect on their commentary, including their own duty of responsibility to not risk causing harm to Senator vulnerable Australians. Wong, order. Senator Wong on a, a, order, order. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. A point of order direct relevance. I think everyone in this place and some of us personally understand this is an issue that must be spoken about carefully. If you listened to what Senator Gallagher asked, she quoted Justice Murphy and she asked if this government accepted that almost half a million people were hounded and suffered at the hands of a scheme designed, implemented and supported by the Prime Minister from day one. Exactly. I'd ask the Minister to not go down the path she is going but to be directly relevant to that question. 
I've asked, I'm glad you to remind the minister of the question. I, I believe, given the quotation that was used, the minister is entitled to talk about that topic and remain directly relevant. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And what I will do is reiterate what the Prime Minister said on the 11th of June 2020. The Prime Minister did apologise in Parliament for any hurt and harm caused in the way the government has dealt with this issue. Clearly, this has been an extraordinarily difficult process for all involved, and we do apologise for the way aspects of this program were administered. Order, Senator Departmental Reynolds. Time for the answer has expired. <laughs> Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Justice Murphy also said that the harm and flaws in Mr Morrison's illegal robo-debt scheme, and I quote, should have been obvious, should have been plain, and that ministers and senior public servants should have known. How did the Morrison government keep this massive failure of public administration, which is estimated to cost taxpayers an overall $4 billion, going for so long? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, can I just say that this, the facts and circumstances of this matter are well known. They have been well uh, prosecuted and traversed uh, in Order. this place and also in the courts. Order on uh, that my That matter left. has come to a conclusion in that the federal court Order. has approved Senators the settlement what? in income compliance Senator class Arneel. action. And the court has said that this settlement on behalf of the Commonwealth is fair and reasonable and Senator is in the interest Watt. of class action members. Order on my left. If I call senators to order, I am going to ask them to pause interjecting. Before I go to the next question, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of the President of the Legislative Council of South Australia, the Honourable John Dawkins. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the parliament and in particular to the Senate. And with the concurrence of honourable senators, I invite the president to take a seat on the floor of the Senate. <laughs> Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister outline Australia's approach to working with partners to address current regional and global challenges to security and stability? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson for his uh, question. Mr. President, uh, we know that Australia's future prosperity and security depend on an Indo Pacific region that is stable, is open, and free, but supported by cooperation between sovereign nations. We're working with allies and partners to maintain and expand a resilient region in which sovereign states make decisions which are free from coercion, interference or aggression. Our inclusive and practical diplomatic approach is to work ever more closely with all countries that share this vision, reinforcing traditional alliances with the United States and the United Kingdom, for example, while expanding cooperation with regional groups such as ASEAN and the Pacific Islands Forum Newer arrangements, such as the Quad, and innovative partnerships, such as the Australia-France-India Trilateral Partnership and the Australia-Indonesia Timor-Leste Trilateral. We have five clear objectives in enhancing our national interests, supporting open societies, open economies and a rules-based order, building our sovereign capability, capacity and resilience, cooperating on global challenges, including equitable COVID-19 vaccine distribution and climate change, for example, enabling renewed business-led growth, including strongly advocating for reform of the World Trade Organization, and fifthly, demonstrating that liberal democracies work. Australians can be assured that the Morrison government will continue to promote their interests at home and abroad, whether it is in strengthening our defence, in protecting human rights or opening opportunities for trade and business, as we've seen overnight in the meeting between Prime Ministers Johnson and Morrison. Our free trade agreement with the UK is aimed at creating jobs and expanding opportunities in a clear demonstration of what two liberal democracies and open economies can achieve. The two Prime Ministers will have more to say on this later today, our time. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the Minister update the Senate on the outcomes secured during her and the Prime Minister's recent international visits? Senator Payne. 
Thank you, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator Patterson. What the, the Prime Minister's visits to Singapore and the G7 Plus meetings have, have shown is to produce important outcomes and to show the benefits of collaboration with key partners. Australia will provide at least 20 million COVID-19 vaccine doses to boost access in developing countries, and we have signed partnerships on low emissions technology investment with Singapore, with Japan and with Germany. The Prime Minister's discussions and my own with G7 plus foreign and development ministers last month and also in Geneva and Washington have reinforced the aligned approaches of like-minded nations on issues such as open markets, on political freedoms, on human rights and the global recovery from COVID-19. In addition, the Prime Minister and I and Minister Seselja have also been able to visit our close friend and neighbour New Zealand to underscore our shared commitment to working together on our region's health, security and economic interests. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the outcomes of Australia's 2 plus 2 meetings with Japan and Germany last week? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Our joint foreign affairs and defence 2 plus 2 dialogues are vital to align our diplomatic and security priorities with key partners. Uh, virtual at this point in time rather than in person, but the outcomes with our Japanese and German counterparts last week really do demonstrate the value of that shared effort. With Japan, we agreed to strengthen cooperation on economic security, to deepen defence cooperation, to enhance engagement with the United States and other partners, and to support Southeast Asia and the Pacific in response to COVID-19. We also voiced our strong, shared opposition to coercive and destabilising behaviour in our region. Our meeting with Germany demonstrated the increasing focus of Liberal democracies on the Indo-Pacific. I signed an enhanced strategic partnership on pr practical cooperation with Germany uh, during the second of our uh, 2 plus 2s with Germany, the first being held in 2016. Australia has been active in creating these opportunities, and it's something that uh, both the Minister for Defence, Mr Order. Dutton, and I will Senator continue Payne. to pursue. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. On at least 11 occasions in budget estimates, this minister refused to say whether or not the Morrison government is responsible for vaccinating aged care workers. Can the minister confirm today whether the Morrison government is responsible for vaccinating aged care workers, yes or no? Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Watt, for the question. Um, clearly, Mr President, the Australian government is responsible for the, the vaccination rollout to Australians all across the country. So in that context, we are responsible for uh, management of the vaccination rollout for everybody. Uh, Mr President, we have, we have taken particular responsibility as a government, uh, and we indicated this publicly, that we would, that we would uh, organise the vaccination uh, specifically of residents uh, and workers in residential aged care. Uh, we, we made that announcement very early in the vaccine rollout, Order. Mr President. Uh, unfortunately, Mr President, we received a couple of pieces of advice that meant we, that we had to reassess our vaccine rollout process. Firstly, Mr. President, and I've indicated this to, President, uh, to, to the Senate in Senate estimates, as Senator Watt very well Order. knows, Mr. President, received advice that we should not vaccinate residents and the workforce at the same time. It wouldn't be safe to do so, Mr. President. So we Order. followed that advice. We followed that advice, Mr. President, and we continued. We continued Order. with our process of Senator vaccinating Watt. the. Uh, the residents in aged care, Mr. President, and I'm very pleased to say that 100% of aged care facilities have received a first dose visit across this country, and 94.2% of those facilities have now received a second dose visit. So we are uh, very close to having vaccinated our aged care residents, Mr. President. And then we received some advice that indicated that we should uh, uh, change the way that we utilise the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, Mr. President. So that meant that we had to again. Uh, Repivot the the rollout for vaccines to the workforce, Mr. President. And so we went back to national cabinet. We went back to national cabinet, Mr. President. We got agreement from the states and the territories that they would work with us to to vaccinate the workforce. So we are working with them. We are offering five different mechanisms to vaccinate the Order. workforce across Senator the country. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. On the 7th of January this year. 
the Prime Minister said, and I quote, I think, you know, there are more important people who need to get vaccinated, frankly, than me and the Health Minister, and the Premiers, for that matter. They're the aged care workers. Almost four months after Mr Morrison received his first dose, how many aged care workers are still waiting for their first dose? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, Order. Order. I've got lots of followers, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, it is important that the aged care workforce get vaccinated, and that's why we worked with National Cabinet to put in place where, cooperatively with the states, we would vaccinate the workforce. Order. So, Mr. President, we, we did take our responsibility um, seriously, uh, and we've worked with the states. And a number of the states have had uh, periods of time where they've accelerated the access of vaccine for the aged care workforce, Mr. President. So we have taken it responsibility, and we continue to do so. We continue to work order. cooperatively Senator, with the states. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt, on relevance, uh, Mr. President, I'm conscious there's only 21 seconds to go, and I'm keen to get an answer to my question, which is how many aged care workers are still waiting for their first dose? I've reminded senators asking questions before. I've allowed you to remind the minister of, if you could listen when I rule Senator Watt, um, I've reminded senators that where a question is highly specific in nature without a preamble, the test of direct relevance is strictly applied, and I have done so. The minister, I've allowed you to remind the minister of the concluding part of your question. Uh, which did include that specific element, but you did include a quotation before that, and the minister is entitled to be directly relevant if he's addressing that quotation. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, so we continue to work with the states and territories, uh, aged care providers, uh, the medical workforce around this country, to vaccinate all of those who need uh, vaccination. And, and quite clearly, Mr. President, uh, aged care workers have had priority, Mr. President, and as of uh, the latest date that I have, 46,273 have received their first dose and 40,256 have received the, the second dose. Has expired. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Order. The, the Morrison government promised aged care workers would be fully vaccinated by Easter. When will Mr Morrison finally deliver on this promise and ensure all aged care workers are fully vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's, it's really quite dishonest that the Labor Party continue to repeat, to repeat statements that don't take into account the changing circumstances that have occurred since those statements were made. It's, quite, it's, it's really Order. quite dishonest, Senator Mr. President. What? Mr. President, we recognise the importance of vaccinating the workforce in aged care. That's why we've offered them so many different pathways to accessing a vaccine, Order. whether that be through their GP. Whether that be through a state Pfizer clinic, that, whether that through, be through a Commonwealth uh, GP respiratory clinic, whether that be through an inreach program that's supported by the aged care provider, uh, we have put in place a number of different mechanisms to, to support the aged care workforce in receiving their vaccine. It is important that they do so, Mr. President, and we will continue to work through all of those avenues to make sure that every aged care worker in this country has access to a vaccine should they want one. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration. Minister, I refer to the Marukapan family, which your government has detained for years, spending millions of dollars to deliberately harm two innocent children and their parents. Why did it take one of the children suffering from a potentially life-threatening illness for your government to show even the merest glimpse of compassion? And Minister, why has this family, family not simply been allowed to return to their home in Biloela? The Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator McKim for the question because, Senator McKim, what it again shows the people of Australia is that under the Greens you will continue to allow people, smugglers, to exploit people by putting them on boats and drowning, drowned 1,200 drowned, and taking that perilous journey to Australia. Senator McKim, the question that you have put to me is a very real reminder for everybody in this chamber that as a country, as a government, 
we are still today, in 2021, dealing with the legacy of border protection failure here, here. when both yourself and Labor were last in government. Mr President, the Morrison government has made it very, very clear. Only misery, human misery, can result from allowing people smugglers to conduct their ugly trade. Twelve hundred people. Senator Cash, uh, Senator McKim, on a point of order. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. The point of order uh, is relevant. Didn't ask about borders. Didn't ask about border protection. Didn't ask about the Greens policy. Didn't ask about Labor policy. Just asked about one family and why they are not allowed to Thank you. Uh, been Senator allowed McKim. to return home. That was the Sorry, extent of I, the question. I, on the point of order. Um, I, I take the point made by Senator McKim that while it was a very broad question and questions that contain multiple whys do allow a lot of discretion in answering it, I will take your point that that does not include covering alternative policies um, or policies of other parties um, in general commentary. So, Senator Cash, to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. And the Morrison government has made it very clear there can be no incentive, Senator McKim, for people to circumvent our orderly and generous migration system. In relation to the decision that has been made by the Minister for Immigration, he has decided that the Sri Lankan family on Christmas Island will be released from held detention and they will be reunited in the Perth community. They will reside in suburban Perth through a community detention placement close to schools and support services whilst the youngest child receives medical treatment from nearby Perth Children's Hospital. But let me be very, very clear, Mr President. This decision strikes a balance between the government's strong border protection policies and appropriate compassion in circumstances Order, involving Cash. children Senator in detention. Time for the qu questions answers expired. Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Minister, why does the minister not simply lift the bar and allow this family to make a valid visa application and set them on a pathway to permanent residency and ultimately to citizenship? Or haven't they suffered enough for you? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I will reiterate what the relevant minister has reiterated, what previous ministers have reiterated, and what the Prime Minister has reiterated. We have made it clear that under our government, if you arrive here illegally, you will not be permanently resettled here. And we need to be very clear, Mr President. Today's decision by the Minister for Immigration does not create a fresh pathway to a visa. The government's position on border protection has not changed. Anyone who arrives in Australia illegally by boat, Senator McKim, will not be resettled permanently. Anyone who is not found to be owed protection, and Senator McKim, as this the parents have not been found to be owed protection through numerous courts now, they are expected to leave Australia. The result of what you want us to do Order. is Senator a Cash, clear signal the to the people smugglers. Senator McKim, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The government's argument that this family must be detained and mistreated to prevent people from coming to Australia by boat to seek asylum is an admission, is it not, Minister, that Australia's immigration system is built on a foundation of torture? Minister, how many other government policies depend on the deliberate mistreatment on, of children and families to be effective? Senator Cash. Uh, well, unfortunately, Senator Kim, yet again, and you and I have done this before, we are going to agree to disagree. The decision that we have made strikes the right balance between our government's strong border protection policies and the Morrison government. We will not, unlike yourself, Senator McKim, and the Australian Greens, we will not send a message to the people smugglers that Australia is open for business. Because this case alone reminds Australians that we are still dealing in 2021 
with the legacy case load of what occurred last time, Senator McKim, when you were given the opportunity in joining with the Australian Labor Party when in government to unravel Australia's strong border protection policies. 50,000 people arriving illegally here by boat. 1,200 people, Senator McKim, that we know of dying at sea. We will not, as a government, send that message Order. to the people Senator smugglers. Cash. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In Senate estimates, the CMO confirmed the source of the Victorian outbreak was from a breach in hotel quarantine in Adelaide. New South Wales Liberal Premier Gladys Berejiklian has said, and I quote, in the future, you can't have a hotel built for tourism as a quarantine facility. Does the Morrison government agree with Premier Berejiklian? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And I would urge uh, those on the other side to use the entire quote in context rather than the way that they do in this place because it provides a very different perspective. Mr. President, what this, what this, what's, happening in, what, what's occurring in Australia right now in the context of the provision of quarantine for people coming into Australia is that we are operating a quarantine system based on a national cabinet agreement that's been reaffirmed by national cabinet a number of times. Mr. President. So the hotel quarantine system is, is being operated uh, at a national level in con a consultation Order. and collaboration between the states and the Commonwealth uh, based on a national cabinet decision, Mr. President. That's the process and the fundamentals under which the, hotel qu the quarantine system for people returning to Australia is being conducted right now. Mr. President, as the Prime Minister has said and a number of my colleagues have said, we're very happy to receive submissions from states and territories uh, with respect to further quarantine proposals. Um, there's a conversation occurring right now, in fact, an agreement between uh, the Commonwealth and Victoria with respect to a proposed additional um, facility in Victoria. The arrangements for those are being finalised right now, Mr President. Those, uh, those negotiations with Victoria continue. So we will continue to work in accordance with the National Cabinet decision under, for the operation of quarantine for people coming back into Australia with COVID. We will continue to work with the states and territories, Mr President. Uh, on the development of, of additional capacity in the states and territories based on proposals provided by those states and territories, Mr. President. We've accepted the uh, proposal from Victoria. We continue to operate that. And I might add, Mr. President, those proposals are about additional capacity, providing additional capacity to the system so that we can bring more people home, Mr. President. And we will continue to work in the collaborative way we have Order, with national, through Colbeck. National Cabinet. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, Premier Berejiklian also said, and completely unambiguously, I quote, if the feds want to increase capacity in New South Wales, they're going to have to build and operate a facility themselves. Will the Morrison government listen to Premier Berejiklian and build and operate a federal quarantine facility in New South Wales? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator O'Neill for the question. Um, as I have just indicated, and had Senator O'Neill wanted to listen to the question, uh, to the answer, she would have noted that we were that the, the Commonwealth Government is quite happy to receive, quite happy to receive submissions from any state or territory for a hotel quarantine proposal. So, Mr. Mr. President, if the Premier of New South Wales wants to put up a submission for a, an additional hotel quarantine or an additional quarantine system in New South Wales, Mr. President, we will happily receive it. We will happily receive it, just as we have from, New so from Victoria, um, just as we're having conversations with other states and territories. So, if they want to put up a proposal, uh, we welcome that, Mr. President. But we are working collaboratively Order. with the states and territories through National Cabinet to bring people home. And I congratulate New South Wales, Mr President, for operating a gold standard system, but also carrying the, Order, the bulk Senator of the burden of bringing Colbeck, Australians time home. Time for the answers expired. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, we've had now 22 breaches 
of hotel quarantine to date. How many more hotel quarantine breaches will need to occur before the Morrison government finally accepts their constitutional responsibility and acts on establishing national federal health quarantine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, the Commonwealth does acknowledge and accept its responsibilities at a national level for quarantine. But we're working Order. in a global pandemic circumstance, Mr. President, and we're working collaboratively with the states through national cabinet to safely bring Australians home. That's what we're doing, Mr. President. We're not sitting at the sidelines just chipping away and, 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 and making, making criticisms, Mr. President. We are working cooperatively and collaboratively with the states to operate a national system of bringing Australians home through a process that was agreed by national cabinet. Order. And that's what we will continue to do. Uh, Responsible, responsibly and collaboratively, uh, and I think that's an, a, a really important thing that we continue to do to give Australians confidence that we have a system Senator that is 99 per cent effective, over 99 per cent effective in bringing Australians home. And as Senator O'Neill would know from New South Wales, New South Wales has done the bulk of the heavy lifting uh, in bringing over 50 per cent of the Order. people back to Australia through their hotel quarantine system and should be congratulated Order, for Senator their efforts. Colbeck. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. Last week we saw an exceptionally successful police operation that landed a significant blow on organised crime in Australia and abroad. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the Liberal National Government is building a more secure and resilient Australia in the face of growing threats to Australia's security? Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz for the question. And, uh, Senator Pres uh, Mr. President, just last week we saw why Australian governments can never take their eyes off protecting Australia and Australians from organised crime. Operation Ironside is a great example of cooperation between our law enforcement agencies and their overseas counterparts in our ever-constant fight against organised crime networks that target Australia. In terms of Operation Ironside itself, the operation has inflicted significant damage to organised crime networks in Australia. Approximately 9,000 officers globally, including 4,500 from here in Australia, have been involved in this three-year covert operation. The operation has led to hundreds of alleged offenders being charged, over 100 weapons removed from our streets and over 500 search warrants being executed across Australia. The work done by our law enforcement agencies in this operation has led to police acting on 21 threats to kill, including saving a family of five. Mr President, the Morrison government is continuing to invest in supporting the international efforts to combat the ever-growing threat that transnational, serious and organised crime poses to us here in Australia. In the recent budget, the government committed an additional $1 billion to help tackle the risks our community faces from organised crime, from criminals and from terrorists. This will continue to support the investments our government has made in law enforcement, in intelligence and security agencies since we were first elected in 2013. I'd like to particularly thank, though, the men and women in our law enforcement agencies who work on the front line each and every day to keep Australians safe. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. Yes, I do, Mr President. I thank the minister for her most informative answer, and I ask further. As Operation Ironside exposed, a large criminal network exists in Australia which threatens our way of life. Has the government provided our law enforcement, security and intelligence agencies with more support since first elected, and if so, to what extent and how? Senator Cash. And thank you, Senator Abetz, for the additional question. And every decision we make as a government in this area of policy is to ensure that we equip our law enforcement, intelligence and security agencies with the necessary tools that they need to keep Australia and Australians safe. Since we were first elected Mr. President, in 2013, our government has now passed 22 
different pieces of national security legislation, legislation that is crucial in helping the relevant agencies investigate, monitor, arrest and prosecute extremists. Our national anti-gang squads have led to the arrest of 1,330 offenders and the seizure of over 6,000 illicit firearms and firearm parts and over 2.5 tonnes of illicit drugs and precursors. And that's at December 2020. Operation Ironside has built on this 224 alleged offenders charged Order. and over 100 Senator weapons Cash. confiscated. Time has expired. Senator Betts, a final supplementary question. I ask the minister, how is the government providing the tools our law enforcement agencies need, as shown by the successful Operation Ironside, to identify and disrupt serious crime on the dark web? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as a government, we are determined to provide our agencies with all reasonable powers necessary to protect the lives of children and to protect the Australian public from criminals acting anonymously online to perpetrate other serious crimes. As technology has changed, so too has the tradecraft of criminals. Our government has introduced a bill to parliament that will provide new powers to law enforcement agencies to shine a light into the darkest recesses of the internet and hold those who are committing serious crimes to account. These key new powers are critical in enabling law enforcement to tackle the fundamental shift in how serious criminality is now occurring online. Without enhancing the AFP and the ACIC's powers, we leave with outdated ways of attacking an area of criminality that is only increasing in its prevalence. As a government, we are committed to doing all that Order. we can Senator Cash, to tackle time this. For the answers expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister of Defence, Senator Payne. At estimates, I asked the Chief of Army about the issues at the Sydney University Regiment. Since then, I've heard more stories about young cadets and armed reserves training to be officers being pushed around and harassed by older officers who think they own the joint. Is the Minister of Defence confident that the next cohort of 18 and 19 year old gap year officer cadets and armoured reservists who go through the Sydney Uni University Regiment will be safe from abuse, illegal room searches and other unacceptable behaviour from the hierarchy? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Lambie for her question. Senator Lambie, uh, through you, Mr President, uh, I don't have a specific brief with me in relation to the Sydney University Regiment, uh, but I can absolutely reiterate the expectations of the highest standards of behaviour uh, applying right across the system, including to the regiment, uh, its leadership. Uh, and its administration. I will take the details of Senator Lambie's question on notice, Mr. President, and provide further information to the Chamber. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The cadets who have blown the, the cadets in the armed reserve uh, that are training to be officers have blown the whistle and told me and others what's going on here have been incredibly brave. What protections is the minister planning to put in place to make sure there won't be serious consequences for their careers because they have finally found the courage to speak out? And we're going to have the same thing go on with the Royal Commission unless we give full protection to diggers to come forward so we can get to the bottom of why we've got suicides. So what is there any anything put into place? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I will take uh, the specific details of Senator Lambie's question uh, on notice. But I can say that the uh, bravery and strength and leadership it takes to speak out, to uh, call out inappropriate behaviour, uh, is most certainly acknowledged. Not just in relation to the ADF, not just in relation to cadet and reserve units, but uh, much more broadly across uh, our society and our communities. So I do acknowledge that, and I do. Uh, uh, I do agree with Senator Lambie uh, that appropriate support should be provided to those people who are appropriately calling out uh, bad behaviour where it exists, uh, no matter where that happens. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. As per usual, the ADF has called in one of its own, a colonel from the very regiment that is dishing out the abuse. 
Um, why haven't the military police or IDADF been asked to investigate serious allegations of illegal ream searches instead of doing a stupid fact find, which we know goes nowhere? It's no central database for it to report on these fact finds. I mean, once again, you would think with a royal commission coming up uh, that they would be, be trying a little bit harder to make sure that the right people are investigating these things that are going on in their regiments. Why not? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I understand there would, of course, be initial steps taken in a, a circumstance such as this. Uh, and again, I'll take the details of Senator Lambie's question on notice, and I'll turn to the chamber with further information. Yeah. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question this afternoon is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. After four months, why is it that less than 15 per cent of Australia's 300 and 66,000 aged care workers have been fully vaccinated. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as I've indicated to the Chamber a number of times, order uh, today, Mr. President, uh, on a number of occasions, we've had to reset the vaccination rollout to aged care workforce. In fact, Mr. President. Uh, the vaccination of the aged care workforce was a topic of discussion, a specific topic of discussion at National Cabinet only um, a couple of weeks ago, Mr. President. So both the, state, both the states, all the states and the territories in the Commonwealth are taking the matter of work, uh, vaccination of the workforce extremely seriously, Mr. President. And, and as I've indicated to the chamber already today, uh, on, a, on a couple of occasions we've had to reset the vaccination process for the workforce of the residential aged care workforce because of health advice that we've received with respect to firstly vaccinating the workforce and the, uh, the residents at the same time and, of and also of course Mr President the utilisation of the AstraZeneca vaccine for those 50 and over uh, and of course a preference for the Pfizer vaccine for those under 50. Mr President so what is in place right now to support the workforce? is uh, access to uh, their GP, uh, state Pfizer clinics, uh, GP respiratory clinics, uh, an in-reach program that's uh, out for tender, uh, an open tender for aged care providers to vaccinate their own works, workforce in, in conjunction with other health professionals. And of course, we continue to offer the aged care workforce uh, in residential aged care access to the Pfizer vaccine while, while we're uh, doing the second round vaccinations and completing that process, Mr. President. So we continue to provide a number of opportunities for the aged care workforce to access a vaccine, Mr. President. And of course, it remains a topic of discussion at uh, the highest levels, including at national cabinet. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. By what date will all aged care workers who want to be vaccinated be fully vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, every aged care worker who wants to access a vaccine right now has access to a vaccine right now. Uh, they have a number of channels to access that vaccine, Mr President. They've been, in, they've been given priority access to that vaccine by, the, by states and territories, Mr President. Uh, and we continue to work uh, with the states and territories, with the aged care providers, on a num providing a number of channels for the, the aged care workforce to access a vaccine, Mr President. Uh, as you would all be aware, the topic of whether or not the aged care workforce should be compulsorily vaccinated was discussed at the National Cabinet uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Mr. President. Uh, that, the fact that it was discussed at that level is an indication of how seriously both the state and territory governments and the Commonwealth government agree that this issue is to be managed. So we continue to offer a number of opportunities for the aged care workforce to access their vaccine to make it as easy as possible for them to do so, Mr President. Uh, and we continue to work Order, with the states Senator and territories Colbeck. to achieve Senator that goal. Pratt, a final supplementary question. The government has broken its promise that all Australians will be fully vaccinated by October. Four million would be vaccinated by the end of March. All 1A would be vaccinated by Easter. And six million Australians would be vaccinated by May 10. Isn't the Morrison government refusing to take responsibility for vaccinating aged care workers because it would rather not have a target than miss yet another one? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator, for the question. Mr President, we continue to build and grow the, role, the rollout of the vaccine. And Mr President, 
uh, the, the fact that Mr. President, we now have uh, had over five million Australians receive their first dose of, the, the, of a vaccine uh, is a significant, uh, a significant achievement, Mr. President, uh, and we're very close to achieving six million doses of, of vaccine administered, Mr. President. Six million doses administered. So we Order. continue to build the, the, the vaccine rollout. Uh, as we increase the capacity of supply, uh, that's always been the case. That we have been, uh, we've been basing the rollout based on the supply of vaccine into the country. Our distribution to the states and territories. Order. The GPs who have done a fantastic job, Mr. President, in, in administering over 50% of the vaccines that have been applied, uh, and, the, and the vaccination process uh, continues to develop, Mr. President. And we will continue to work with the states and the territories and all of the outlets to ensure Australians have access to a vaccine. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the Morrison government's commitment to ensuring there is strong, skilled, and sustainable NDIS workforce? Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for that question and for her support uh, for people on the NDIS in Tasmania. The Australian government is committed to fully funding and delivering on the vision of the Na National Disability Insurance Scheme. And that, of course, includes ensuring there is a strong and sustainable workforce for many generations to come. Last week, I had the pleasure of launching the NDIS National Workforce Plan whilst visiting Autism WA in Perth. Autism WA is an extraordinary organisation that for over 50 years has been providing life-changing services to more, today to more than 4,500 children and adults with autism. I was incredibly privileged to present Long Service Awards to Stacey, to Ken and to Darren. These three dedicated individuals so clearly love their jobs and are passionate and proud about what they do each and every day. The values and the skills and the heart and the passion that these uh, three bring to Autism Western Australia is what we need uh, in our workforce, and we need so many more of them. In fact, we need 83,000 more Stacys, Ken and Darren. Today, 270,000 Australians work in supporting and caring for 45 uh, sorry, 450,000 NDIS participants. However, that is not enough. We now need to recruit over the next few years another 83,000 workers into the support workforce. And that's why I've launched the NDIS National Workforce Plan. It's a comprehensive and it is a very practical blueprint for today and also well into the future. It's designed to attract workers with the values and the attributes and the heart we need, while also improving existing workers' access to training and also to new development opportunities. But to do that, we Order. need all Senator Australians Reynolds. to understand— Senator, ask you a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you. How will this plan benefit NDIS participants, workers and providers? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you again for the question, Senator Askew. Uh, this workforce plan focuses on a range of very practical initiatives that the Australian government is implementing. But the government is not doing this alone. We're working in partnership right across the sector. And the plan focuses on the following initiatives, which together will make a real difference. We're improving training and career opportunities for workers. We're strengthening entry pathways to the sector. Uh, to provide school students and leavers and also job seekers with improved access to entry-level careers, including supported traineeships and also workforce placements. We're also innovating by creating new and accessible tools so job seekers can themselves self-assess their suitability for jobs across this sector. We're also upskilling the workforce with the development of micro-credentials, something which is long overdue in this sector. A skills passport will also speed up the recognition of training in the sector, and Order. we're enhancing Senator leadership Reynolds, opportunities time for staff. For the answer has expired. Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. Could the minister advise how this NDIS workforce plan also supports alignment across the care and support workforce? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and indeed I can. 
The initiatives in this workforce plan also support workforce growth in both the aged care and veteran sectors. And this simply makes sense for us to create a single care and support workforce uh, for all Australians who need this assistance the most. The $12.3 million care and support workforce package in this year's budget is the first stage of regulatory alignment activities across the aged care, disability and veteran care sectors. We're establishing a single worker screening check, alignment of standards and also an alignment uh, of auditing processes and regulations. And pleasingly for providers and also for their staff, this will significantly cut red tape and also reduce the regulatory burden, particularly for providers who work across all three sectors. The Morrison government is utterly and completely uh, committed to creating meaningful, sustain sustainable and also Order. skilled careers Senator in Time this critical the sector. Has expired. Support Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The Prime Minister has, for almost two years, refused to answer any questions about his friendship with prominent QAnon supporter Tim Stewart. Why? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I am surprised that, uh, that Senator Wong particularly has framed the question in that way. Let me make it very clear, as the Prime Minister has, that he sees QAnon as being a discredited and dangerous fringe group. The Prime Minister has been very clear in relation to his uh, condemnation of the organisation, his rejection uh, of the approaches of it, and, Mr President, uh, very clear, of course, in relation to the fact that the Prime Minister takes his security advice uh, from the nation's security agencies. Mr President, uh, the Prime Minister could not have been clearer in that regard. Uh, the fact that uh, those opposite may wish to ask questions uh, about the husband of a friend of the Prime Minister's wife is a question for them. The Prime Minister's position in relation to the security advice and briefings he receives and his actions upon those uh, has been clear, as has his condemnation of this organisation. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. If the Prime Minister believes QAnon to be as dangerous as he claims, then can he, you ex can he explain why he failed for almost two years to repudiate the claims made by his good friend and QAnon supporter Mr Stewart, including that the term ritual sexual abuse came to appear in the Prime Minister's speech at Mr Stewart's request? These are claims Mr Stewart has made. Why has the Prime Minister not repudiated them? Senator Birmingham. No. Mr President, the Prime Minister doesn't go around repudiating individual statements made across the nation. The Prime Minister has made clear, as I said in my primary answer, the, fact, the fact that he repudiates QAnon. Full stop. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. For months, Mr Morrison tried to keep secret his request that his friend Brian Houston be invited to the White House. For nearly two years, he has been secretive about his relationship with Mr Stewart. Why is Mr Morrison so secretive about some of the company he keeps? Order. Senator Birmingham. No, no Mr President, indeed, I hear some of the interjections from behind me, uh, and it is astounding, Mr President, that here we are at 2.52 p.m. Uh, 2 PM, uh, coming through question time, the first parliamentary sitting week, the first parliamentary sitting week since the budget week, and I've sat here all question time and not a single question about the budget or the economy. And of course, why is order, that? Why is that order, from those opposite? Order, well, it must be something Senator, to do with a good Senator economy. Wong on a point of order. Absolutely, yes. Order. I'll call Senator Wong when I can hear her. Order across the chamber. Senator Wong. Uh, Mr President, direct relevance. The question does go to the Prime Minister's refusal to be transparent. If the Minister now wants to answer all the unanswered questions on notice, I'll give him leave to do so now. Um, you remind, reminded the Minister of the, answer, of, of the question. Uh, he has 36 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the Prime Minister has addressed the substantive issues here in terms of his repudiation of QAnon 
and that organisation. But those opposite won't address the matters of actual interest to Australian families, their jobs, the economy, the fact that this side of politics has ensured that we have got more jobs and an economy coming back stronger than anywhere else in the world. The fact that this Order. side of the parliament has made sure Australians have got more money in their pockets thanks to our tax cuts, and they won't say whether or not they'll support them into the future. That's the contrast. That's the clarity Order. for us. Senator we are Birmingham. working for Australian Time families. For the answer has expired. Order. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister advise how the Morrison government is supporting Australians who are escaping violence? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Hughes for her question on this really, really important issue. Mm -hmm. um, in the 2021-22 budget, um, I think we have demonstrated um, our absolute commitment to keeping Australian women safe with our historic $1.1 billion commitment to ending do domestic violence, family violence and sexual violence against women and their children. And it also lays the groundwork for the establishment of the next national plan. And as I said, the, the, we are talking about ending violence against women and their children, not merely to reduce the level of violence. The package um, focuses on all aspects, prevention, early intervention and responding to give women support when they made that extraordinarily brave decision to leave a violent relationship. And that's why we have made an investment into the escaping violence payment, $164.8 million over the next two years to provide up to $5,000 support to women and their children when they leave a, a violent situation, because we know that financial dependency is something that often keeps women uh, in a, a violent relationship. And we are absolutely committed to helping women who wish to escape those situations. So this money goes towards a $1,500 payment in cash so that, uh, that you can buy the essentials for herself and her family, uh, and also a further $3,500 to do things like maybe it pay yeah. the bond, maybe yeah. it is to register the car, uh, you know, and, and maybe it is just being able to give her the confidence yeah. to be able to start a new life. We also have provided $130 million through the COVID pandemic to help frontline services. We will be providing an additional $260 million to continue to support our states and territories to bolster frontline services over the next two years. We've also um, added money to our Safe Places uh, program, $60 million over the last two years, with another $12.6 million to make sure that women have a safe place to go when they're escaping violence, because we know that emergency accommodation is one of the most critical things on that night or that day that you choose yeah. to leave home. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government is helping prevent domestic, family and sexual violence into the future? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, our priority has to be early intervention and prevention because we know that a future without domestic, family and sexual violence can only happen if we change behaviours and attitudes and we make sure that people understand what is acceptable behaviour. So we have announced $35.1 million to expand our, our national campaign Stop It at the Start, which mm -hmm. has been so tremendously successful to date. But yesterday I was very pleased to announce uh, the launch of a five-part children's uh, series um, of audio books that you can download um, from wherever you download your podcast from to encourage respectful behaviour amongst children. Yeah. And um, I'd like to thank Nova Entertainment for partnering with this and, and the government in this thing called, we call Project Ari. And it's a series that's been written by our children's author, Nat Amore, and focuses on a young robot called Ari, who is sent to live with a family, and he has to learn to have a human experience. It's a fantastic resource. It's great fun, and I encourage everybody in here to download it and Order, listen to Senator it. Senator Rustin. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And can the minister update the Senate on the work the Morrison government has been doing with the states and territories to keep women and children safe? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we know that domestic violence orders or apprehended violence orders are not worth the paper they're written on unless they're enforced. Uh, recently, uh, Minister Cash, Minister Payne and I convened an extraordinary meeting yeah. of our state and territory counterparts, yeah. women's safety ministers, attorneys general and police ministers to discuss how we can all work together to improve safety outcomes for women and their children, particularly in the wake of the terrible tragedies that we have seen again this year. 
Um, so states shared details of what they were doing. Um, and last week I was uh, visited Tasmania uh, and had the opportunity to actually uh, talk to the Tasmanian team down there about a GPS monitoring system that they have in place. Um, on people who are high-risk domestic violence um, order um, people. Um, and the fantastic news is that we have seen an 82 per cent decrease in the number of AVOs that have been breached since yep. people have been on this program and a 100 per cent reduction in the amount of stalking that is being reported. Wow. A fantastic initiative, and I congratulate order. the Tasmanian Senator government. Rustin. Yeah. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr yeah. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister of, uh, for Sport, Senator Colbeck. In a submission uh, to the Senate Select Committee on the Administration of the Sports Grants, dated 14 February 2020, Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Mr Gatesons, stated that Senator Mackenzie was the final approver of funding decisions. Uh, Mr Gatesons reaffirmed this evidence before the committee on the 22nd of July 2020. Is Mr Gatesons correct? That Senator Mackenzie was the final approver of funding decisions. Uh -oh. The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, the guidelines for the uh, sports uh, community sports infrastructure grants were uh, very, very clear. Uh, the minister was the decision maker with respect to the allocation of the grants. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, in reference to a current federal court proceeding, it was reported on the 2nd of June 2021 uh, by The Guardian that, and I quote, Sport Australia insists it retained the final say on which applications would be approved for funding despite a flurry of late changes to grant recipients requested by the former federal sports minister. Why is the Commonwealth asserting one thing before the federal court and another thing before the parliament? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, I'm not sure that some of you should say that, make that sort of comment. Um, serious reflection on a. I did, so I didn't hear if there, if someone wishes Senator, to raise something. Senator, can. Uh, th thanks, Senator, for the question. Um, Sport Australia. Sport Australia has put forward a defence for the case that's been taken against it into the court. Um, Senator Farrell did ask some questions of Sport Australia at estimates as, 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 a, part of, uh, the, as, as a part of the estimates process. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the, the uh, CEO of Sport Australia uh, indicated that uh, he was not prepared to, uh, under legal advice, to answer questions with respect to the defence uh, while the court case was ongoing, and Mr. President, I don't intend to either. Senator Farrell, order, order. Senator Farrell's on his feet. Senator Farrell, final supplementary question. One, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. Will the minister now tell us who was the final decision maker? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President, as I've indicated, the guidelines for the uh, Committee Sport Infrastructure Grant program were very, very clear. Uh, that the minister was the decision maker with respect to the grants. Um, uh, that does a very, very clear, Mr. President. The guidelines for the community sport infrastructure program stated that the minister was the decision maker with respect to the allocation of the grants. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, I further table for the information of the Senate. Response to Senate question number 3572. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. In accordance with st uh, Standing Order 74.5, I seek an explanation from the Defence uh, Minister representing the Defence Minister as to why question on notice 3359 has uh, not been answered. Oh, Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, uh, I don't have specific information in relation to question 3359, Senator. I was not aware that you were ra raising this today, uh, but I will uh, seek further information for you from the Defence Minister's office. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patrick. So I move that the Senate take note of the Minister's answer. I did actually inform the Minister's office or uh, raise a question in the Minister's office this morning in relation to these questions uh, and it indicated that I might uh, exercise my rights at uh, the end of question time. I'll just uh, let the Chamber know what this question is about. It's an important question about defence industry. Um, 
It, uh, you know, quest it, it's, uh, I've got four questions. The first is, what is the current status of the mapping or matching of industry capability to defence requirements? Uh, this is something that defence had indicated they were undertaking, and uh, it was merely a question to try and find out what the status was. I also asked a second question, how is the department capturing or documenting this? Uh, third question was Mr Swarzek adv advised the department was working with EBS on a feasibility study to enhance the mapping. What is the status of the feasibility study? Again, quite a reasonable question. And uh, uh, the final question was uh, uh, reminding the, the department or the minister that uh, uh, Ms Kate Lewis, as the first Assistant Secretary of Defence Industry Policy, had previously stated to the, to the Senate Committee that such work was being done in 2016 and 17. So I just wanted to know what happened with, uh, with the work and the associated plans and what was the output of that work. So these are important questions that go to, uh, to defence industry uh, and the uh, use of Australian industry in our defence projects. Uh, it's much, much easier for the department to operate if it, can, if it has a, a prior understanding of exactly what industry is able to do. Now, you know, comfort is the, uh, is the enemy of progress, and right now what we've been seeing for uh, far too many years is comfort, and there shouldn't be. The government needs to wake up in relation to industry capability not just from a defence perspective, but also from a national resilience perspective. And I'll talk uh, br briefly about that. Um, World War II forced us to do this. In late 1942, the government was considering a post-war uh, reconstruction, and we had a division uh, of, uh, of government called the Division of Industrial Development. It was aimed to develop and expand uh, secondary industry in post-war Australia in areas that included rural reconstruction conversion of munitions and armaments factories for other industrial uses, encouragement for an Australian car manufacturing industry, workforce training and employment, opportunities in electrical, uh, electricity supplies, um, fuel production and industrial technology. So that was what we were doing at the end of World War, uh, World War II, in fact, be well before it ended, to make sure we had a plan coming out of it. Now we've had COVID. Um, now, the government has done a reasonably good job, or did a reasonably good job at the start of COVID. I won't uh, talk to the, the vaccine rollout and the lack of, uh, of, of quarantine facilities, but a reasonable do job was done at the start to protect, uh, uh, to protect uh, Australians. And we did call on Australian industry to assist us in that regard, making sure that we had uh, uh, medical uh, supplies, making sure we had things like uh, PPE. Now, sadly, all of that seems to have uh, sort of uh, tapered off. All of that, uh, all of that emphasis. The government's approach to Australian uh, industry, as, as been de demonstrated by the department, seems to be that industry should be standing up by, ready, willing, and able. Should government decide to engage them, that happens often when uh, we've got a foreign supplier that gets us into a mess, or, in, or, or it's an emergency. Um, but there's a general belief that Australian industry will be ready and waiting, when we, and, and they'll be there when we need them. That's an unfair proposition, and it's also not a reality. There's the saying, use it or lose it. If we don't have our industry, if we're not engaging our industry, then in actual fact, of course, it's going to taper away, and, and it's not going to be there when we need it. So whilst uh, you know, I can use uh, defence as a reference point. Okay? The, the problem is not strictly limited to defence. We have uh, the largest island nation, and yet we have no merchant navy. And that has a corresponding uh, impact on shipbuilding and sustainment. We have tier one contractors now that are all foreign owned. All those large projects that we're developing under the uh, extra $10 million of money that has been provided uh, by the government in the budget has to go to foreign-owned companies because our companies are uh, tier two companies, the Australian-owned companies are tier two companies, and uh, that simply means that we hand over those, those functions to foreign companies. 
dwindling offshore oil and, and fuel refining. Uh, we're now seeing uh, later listed on the notice paper the need to uh, weigh in and support our refineries. Even when we asked the four remaining refineries to stay uh, in Australia, only uh, two of them took up the offer. And uh, we will be dealing with that, but we shouldn't be in this problem. Reducing textile production. So, you know, last year when I asked uh, Defence, where's the map? Where's the thing that tells us how we integrate um, uh, our defence, or sorry, our industry capability into our defence capability? Well, we were told there was work going on, but uh, but they don't have one. Okay, so. You know, we look at things like the Commonwealth procurement rules. They were changed uh, in 2016. They require officials to achieve value for money. Of course, we want that. But we also require for, for procurements above $4 million or $7.5 million for construction services that officials are required, uh, in accordance with the rules, to consider the economic benefit of the procurement to the Australian economy. Now, this hasn't been happening. Even since the, the uh, August 2020 guidelines were issued, it still doesn't seem to be happening. What we need to be doing is making sure whenever we buy something with Australian taxpayers' money that we look to the economic benefit that comes from selecting a particular entity for doing that. That includes uh, looking at how many jobs they might create, how much investment might they may make here in Australia. Uh, what supply chain effects going with the particular tender will offer. So, uh, th these are questions that are required in our rules but are not uh, followed through. And one of the reasons I think they're not followed through is because uh, de you know, uh, departments like Defence simply don't have the tools to be able to work out uh, the trade-offs between uh, taking one particular option versus another uh, option and understanding what the economic benefit of that is, because the government simply is not tooling them up correctly. But we, what we shouldn't be doing is just saying what's what's value. We want to be talking about. Uh, sorry, we shouldn't be saying what is what is the cost, what is the price. We should be saying what is the value of going with a particular contractor, and we're not doing that. You know, we have a requirement to have Australian industry participation. Uh, plans developed. The AIP authority that we've, we've uh, had, and uh, it's under the, uh, um, the Australian Jobs Act, uh, basically needs a re revolving door for the amount of people that pass through that office. Um, uh, you know, it's it just a continual churn. We do have Australian industry capability plans. The reality is that uh, these plans are not being implemented and enforced. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen the plan that was offered up by Na uh, Naval Group, then DCNS, for the future submarines, and actually it was a good plan. It involved partnering with ASC. It involved establishing a whole bunch of centres of excellence. It involved developing technologies here in Australia, exactly the sort of thing we want, want to do with a, uh, an Australian industry capability plan. And Yet we find what was contracted by defence was nothing along those lines. They did everything they could do to avoid ASC, and they did everything they could to avoid contracting in the very things that, that uh, DCNS promised. And uh, you know, it's, it's, we also note that in that particular contract, um, even though—and I've seen this in the in the documentation where Naval Group offered. Uh, uh, did offer metrics. They offered 50 per cent. We didn't contract that. We only just recently had to retrospectively contract in 60 per cent, and that's a, that's a huge problem. You can't ask people to front up with an AIC plan, assess them on the, the quality of their uh, AIC plan, and then just put it on in, the back, in the back drawer. One of the problems I, I think we have is defence people, defence people concentrate on defence. They don't think about industry. Recently, we tried to have industry driving some of this uh, in, in the defence space, and defence pulled it back into, uh, in, in under their wing, so that uh, I guess industry players didn't have to be uh, or wouldn't be wouldn't be loud. So uh, there's a whole range of things we need to be thinking about uh, in in relation uh, to 
uh, to this. You know, we've just seen um, uh, with the Boomeranger contract, Australia contract out a whole bunch of sea boats. When that's something we can do here in Australia, we can do here in Australia. And indeed, under our World Trade Organisation rules, because it's defence related, we can um, overtly state we are going with an Australian company. And yet we don't seem to do that. I'll tell you the story of, uh, of uh, uh, how, di how uncoordinated we are. Uh, we had uh, uh, a company, an Adelaide company called EasyFit uh, procure. They paid part of, partly, part of the, the, the procurement was paid by them. Part of it was paid by the Department of Industry to buy uh, machining tools that would allow them to build periscopes for the future submarines and indeed to assist with sustaining columns. Then what happened? Defence contracted the job overseas. So the taxpayer lost and indeed the company lost. They'd bought an asset that uh, could now no longer be used. So we, you know, we need people to, to focus on, on um, the, these uh, sorts of matters. There are many, many things that we can, we can do. You know, at the end of uh, COVID, I'll just turn to uh, an executive order um, uh, signed by um, the, the President on uh, the 25th of uh, January this year, executive order on ensuring the future is made in all of America by all of America's workers. Let me read from that executive order. Just, uh, just one paragraph because it's enough. It is the policy of my administration that the United States government should, consistent with applicable laws, use terms and conditions of federal financial assistance awards and federal procurements to maximise the use of goods, products and materials produced in and services offered in the United States. Now, there's leadership from the United States president signing into, into to, uh, effect uh, an executive order which must be complied with. We still have this view here in Australia that, uh, uh, that um, uh, we, we simply let the market decide. What we have happen is the Australian government, and this, I'm not being critical of what we do here, we impose upon uh, Australian companies uh, minimum wages leave loadings, um, holiday pay, super, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, long service leave, superannuation. We make them comply with environmental laws. We make them, make them comply with occupational health and safety laws. We make them uh, comply with a whole range of quality regulations. We do that and, of course, that drives cost. That drives cost up. And I don't say that's a bad thing. I think that ends up with Australians producing quality products. But then when the government goes out and procure things, it looks at the price coming in from Vietnam or from China or from some other foreign jurisdiction where those particular requirements are not mandated. It's not an even playing field. And yet the doctrine of competitive advantage gets played out all of the time on the other side of the chamber. It is not a level playing field. It's not a level playing field when we deal with uh, procurements that involve Chinese companies because often they are well and truly backed by the state. So let's not pretend this theory of competitive advantage uh, applies. Look, I've stood up, I've talked a little bit about Australian industry. It's really, really important. It's important for our resilience, it's important for our national security, and yet when I ask a simple question, and remember I ask these questions not for me but on behalf of my constituents, I ask a simple question about what the government is doing to map industry capability to, to our defence needs and I can't get an answer. I can't get an answer in, in a timely fashion. Uh, firstly, that worries me about uh, what's happening behind the scenes because they ought to be easy answers to, to come to. But secondly, it is disrespectful to my constituents who have a right to know through Senate processes what the answer to their questions are. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Is this on the same matter, Senator Watt? I'll just dispose of this matter first. So the question is that the... Oh, it is. Thank you, Senator, Senator Watt. 
<laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I also do I need to seek leave? Rise to take note uh, of the minister's statement, and I particularly want to address remarks that Senator Birmingham made. Wouldn't be quite so smart, no. Senator Birmingham. You haven't heard what I've got to say yet. Um, Senator Watt, I'm just uh, so Senator Patrick stood to ask um, Minister Payne uh, a response to a question he put. So that's the matter that we're dealing with because. The government's answer in relation to some questions on notice, and I'm informed that I can do that as part of this process. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'll just double check. Um, do we need to just. Yes. So, Senator Watt, I am advised that as long as it is in relation to the matters that um, Senator Patrick asked of Minister Payne, you are well in order, so please continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I, I would submit that I am uh, relevant to the point raised by Senator Patrick because my comments also relate to government minister's statements in relation to questions on notice. Um, I do want to focus on uh, an answer that was just tabled by Senator Mert Birmingham at the end of question time to a qu question on notice number 3572, uh, which I lodged uh, nearly two months ago, um, and it was a question seeking details from the Prime Minister as to representations made by the former Foreign Minister, Ms Julie Bishop, uh, to government ministers on behalf of Mr Lex Greensill or his company, Greensill Capital. Now, the, uh, this, it is highly unsatisfactory that it's taken uh, me flagging my intention to raise this today, uh, that we finally get an answer from the Prime Minister of this country uh, to this question. And it does go to government integrity, uh, something that we should be able to expect from our Prime Minister, if not all ministers in this government. Uh, what, the, what the question uh, sought, the question that I lodged nearly two months ago, uh, was detail from the Prime Minister as to how many introductions Ms Bishop had made between government ministers and Mr Greensill or employees of his firm Greensill Capital, uh, in what capacity government ministers understood Ms Bishop to be making such communications, uh, and details of the dates and nature of the me any meetings that did occur between ministers and uh, representatives of Greensill Capital as a result of Ms Bishop's uh, representations. Now, the on the 23rd, this, this matter does have some background, uh, and one of the reasons that we are asking questions about this is that anyone who has followed uh, either the collapse of Greensill Capital um, or particularly developments in the United, United Kingdom relating to this company would be aware that quite a scandal has emerged in British politics uh, involving the former British Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, who has been hired as a lobbyist by Greensill Capital, and uh, various text messages, WhatsApp messages and other information, information has surfaced demonstrating uh, Mr Cameron's abuse of his former role as Prime Minister of the British government and his personal connections to serving British Conservative ministers in pursuit of his client, Greensill Capital, who, as we know, has gone on to collapse, uh, putting many funds and many creditors in jeopardy. Uh, and what we're concerned about uh, from the opposition's point of view here in Australia is whether something similar has uh, occurred in relation to the efforts of the former Foreign Minister, Ms Julie Bishop. Now, it's a matter of public record that Ms Bishop is on the payroll of Greensill Capital. Uh, she has now registered as a lobbyist uh, uh, on behalf of Greensill Capital, among other companies. She was a bit tardy in updating her register, uh, but she is now a registered lobbyist on behalf of, among other firms, Greensill Capital. So there has been a connection 
uh, between Ms Bishop and Greens Hill Capital in the same way that there has been a connection involving Mr Cameron in, uh, the, in the United Kingdom. Now, on the 23rd of April, I submitted questions to the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Finance Minister and the Attorney General about representations made by Ms Bishop, the former Foreign Minister, on behalf of Green Seal Capital. And these were very simple questions. Um, all they tried to establish was what contact had occurred between Ms Bishop and, and various government ministers uh, regarding her client, Green Seal Capital. Uh, but it seemed that ministers needed longer than the 30 days dictated by the standing orders to get their stories straight. The Attorney General, who frankly should be aware of standing orders, responded to my questions on the 8th of June. That's 46 days to respond rather than the conventional 30. And interestingly, uh, the Attorney General did not respond until after Senate estimates was completed. Subsequently, the Attorney General tasked her acting secretary with seeking clarification from the former deputy leader of the Liberal Party, Ms Bishop on the nature of her role with Greensill prior to her registration under the lobbyist code being lodged. As I say, from facts that are on the public record, it does appear that Ms Bishop was undertaking lobbying work on behalf of Greensill Capital prior to her having registered at, in, in a public way as a lobbyist for that company. She needs to explain that, and she's been asked to do so by the Acting Secretary of the Attorney-General's Department. Uh, the Treasurer responded to my question on notice on 10 June, 48 days after I submitted my questions and only after it was revealed in Treasury estimates that Ms Bishop, acting on behalf of Greensill, had approached the Treasurer, who then ensured that Ms Bishop and Greensill Capital secured the ear of Treasury officials. All very convenient, all very cosy. And then the Finance Minister and the Leader of the Government in this place also seemed to forget the standing orders and responded to my questions on the 11th of June. That's 49 days after I lodged my question on notice. Now, the Minister for Finance says that he has not ever received communications from the former Foreign Minister, Ms Bishop, relating to Greensill Capital. We can only take him at his word on that. But we do know that the former Minister for Finance and the former leader of the government in this place, Matthias Cormann, did open the back door to his mate, Julie Bishop, when he met with Greensill Capital in Davos in January 2020. Again, all very convenient, all very cosy. Uh, captains of industry, uh, leaders of this government, all sitting down having a nice mulled wine around the fire in Davos in the middle of winter. Now, Ms Bishop, this, this meeting uh, that Mr Cormann arranged for Ms Bishop uh, and, and had with Greensill Capital occurred despite a Department of Finance memo warning the then Minister, Minister, then Minister Cormann uh, that Greensill's scheme uh, for financing, which was being touted to this government, was, quote, wages on demand and, quote, economically similar to payday lending. So we've got a company uh, who the Department of Finance has advised ministers wants to offer a service that is similar to payday lending, being promoted by a former minister of this government, Ms Bishop, being facilitated by a former minister of this government, Mr Cormann, uh, and ministers aren't really very keen to talk about what their involvement was. At least, though, the Attorney-General, the Finance Minister and the Treasurer answered those questions, albeit exceptionally late. And it wasn't until we flagged today that we were intending to ask Senator Birmingham where the answer to the question to the Prime Minister was um, that we finally got an answer. There was one minister who it took prompting from this Senate uh, before he was prepared to answer my questions about representations made by Julie Bishop on behalf of Greensill Capital. And it wasn't just any minister, it was the Prime Minister of this country. Uh, it took 53 days since I lodged my questions, 23 days after they were due, to get an answer, if you can call it that, from the Prime Minister. Now, I've just had a quick look at the answer, if you can call it that, that we've received today to this question. Uh, and essentially what that answer says is that uh, the Prime Minister is unable to answer my question. And the question, of course, was how many introductions Ms Bishop had made between government ministers and Mr Greensill or employees of his firm. So the Prime Minister, despite taking 53 days since I lodged this question, now comes back and says he's unable to answer 
uh, because answering this question would amount to an unnecessary diversion of resources of his department. Well, again, how very convenient, how very cosy that we have the Prime Minister covering for his mate Julie Bishop, uh, refusing to answer questions about representations that she has made as a paid lobbyist for Greensill Capital to government ministers touting the services of a firm that the Department of Finance has likened to a payday lender. How very convenient, how very cosy. Why is the Prime Minister wanting to cover up for the activities of his former Liberal colleague, Julie Bishop? Why is the Prime Minister covering up the representations that she has made to government ministers on behalf of her client, Greensill Capital, a company likened to a payday lender by this very government? Is it because we're facing a similar scandal to what we've seen in British politics involving former Prime Minister David Cameron, exposed for having made all sorts of private contacts to his mates in the current UK government on behalf of Greensill Capital in return for his payment as a lobbyist for that firm? Is that what we're seeing here with Ms Bishop? Um, we don't know because the Prime Minister won't tell us. We don't know because the Prime Minister won't even tell us how many introductions Ms Bishop has made on behalf of her client, Greensill Capital, to government ministers to promote their services, to promote their payday lending services, which would be offered at the expense of ordinary Australians. This Prime Minister, if he has any sense of accountability, should be answering, should be telling the Australian public what representations his former Liberal colleague, Ms Bishop, has made uh, to ministers in this government. What work has she done on behalf of this payday lender, so-called by the Department of Finance, um, to try to generate government business in return for a payment that she receives as a lobbyist for this firm? We, we deserve to know this. In the absence of answers from the Prime Minister, we can only go off what has been reported, and that is fairly damning. On 12 April this year, the Australian reported that Lex Greensill sought to win influence with Scott Morrison by dropping that he had signed up as a premium platinum member to the Liberal Party's Australia Business Network in a WhatsApp message to the Prime Minister. So we've got Mr Greensill sending WhatsApp messages directly to the Prime Minister, talking up the fact that he's taken out a premium platinum membership of the Liberal Party's business network, um, but we can't find out what his, Mr Greensill's lobbyist Julie Bishop has been up to. What, what WhatsApp messages has Julie Bishop been sending to her former colleagues, trying to line up business for her client, the payday lender, Greens Hill Capital? What meetings has she arranged with government ministers to promote their services? We don't know because the Prime Minister won't tell us. The Prime Minister won't be honest with the public because the Prime Minister wants to cover up for his former colleague, Julie Bishop. Now, I understand that premium memberships to this Liberal network that Mr Greensill joined cost around $120,000. Is this why the Prime Minister doesn't want to tell us what his former colleague Julie Bishop has been up to? Because he's protecting a very valuable donor, donor to the Liberal Party? $120,000, not a bad donation to a political party. Is that why the Prime Minister is covering up for Ms Bishop and Mr Greensill, because he doesn't want to jeopardise those donations? After a Liberal Party business network event in September, it turns out the Prime Minister himself met with Mr Greensill on 30 October 2019. This has been confirmed by a spokesperson for the Prime Minister. Was this meeting arranged by Julie Bishop as the lobbyist for, Julie, for Greensill? We don't know because the Prime Minister won't tell us because the Prime Minister is covering up for his colleague Julie Bishop. So we've got an Australian businessman, Mr Greensill, running a payday lending outfit that is mired in controversy, at least in the UK, if not in Australia at this point, has collapsed owing creditors significant amounts of money, donating money to the Liberal Party, getting meetings with the Prime Minister through WhatsApp messages that he's sending, hiring Julie Bishop, former federal minister in this government, to tout his services to ministers but the Prime Minister won't tell us what his former colleague Julie Bishop has been up to. He won't tell us who she's met with. He won't tell us what WhatsApp messages she's been sending to her former colleagues. Are we facing our own David Cameron-style scandal in Australia, similar to what we've seen in the UK, based on 
a former minister of this government, a former Liberal minister of this government, using her private connections to line up business deals for one of her own clients. We'd like to know that. I think the Australian people would like to know that, but the Prime Minister won't tell us that because he's covering up for his colleagues and he's covering up for what seems to be a major donor to the Liberal Party. This stinks of Liberals helping out their mates. We know that they treat taxpayers' money like Liberal Party money, and we're starting to find out that they apply special rules for Liberal mates who make nice donations uh, to the Liberal Party, who like to cosy up with former ministers around the fireplace with a mulled wine at Davos. They're the kind of people who get protected by this government. They're the kind of people who we don't find out about meetings with because this government has too much at stake. It's about protecting mates who've paid $120,000 to sign up as premium platinum members of the Liberal Party's business, business network. We deserve answers and transparency. It is not and should not be negotiable for the Prime Minister to comply with the standing orders and properly answer these questions. Senator Polly. Mr. President, I rise to take note of answers uh, oh, sorry, given just, by Senator. I've just got to put the question oh, forward, sorry. then I'll call you. Sorry, I thought you were speaking to that motion. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Polly. Mr. President, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Senator Watt, O'Neill, and Pratt. Now, in estimates, uh, what we saw was the minister, Minister Colbeck, asked on numerous occasions, I think it was the 11 that Senator Watt referred to, as to what was the responsibility of the federal government in relation to vaccinations for not only older Australians but older workers. And he wasn't able to give us a direct answer during those estimates, but clearly he did today. What families are asking of the Australian government is, with their parents and grandparents and aunties and friends who are residents in residential aged care, is, has this government ensured that every older Australian in residential care that wants to be vaccinated has had that vaccination. They also want to know, because it's critically important, that aged care workers have had access to a vaccination. Now, what we heard today was the minister saying that vaccinations are available for aged care workers if and when they want them. But the reality is they have to take time off work and quite frankly, too many of them have to work across a number of sites to be able to find the time to do that. The most simplest, easy plan would have been to roll out those vaccinations to older residents and to staff. Now, we've heard that the government was given advice that they shouldn't have happened at the same time. It doesn't say that they couldn't have gone back and started that program. What is just as alarming is that the supplement that was being paid to aged care workers so they didn't have to work across more than one site during this pandemic was taken away. And then when we saw another outbreak in Victoria had to be reintroduced. That's just not good enough. There is no planning by this government. During this pandemic, the government has had two responsibilities. One, to roll out the vaccine. Two, to provide quarantine. And what have we seen from this government? No leadership whatsoever. They can't even roll out the vaccine in a timely manner. We still, to this day, do not know accurately how many aged care workers have in fact been vaccinated even once, let alone the second dose. It is not good enough. It is not good enough. What we have seen from this government is their failure to accept the responsibility for quarantine. Now, there is no reason why there should not have been built federally funded quarantine facilities that were purpose built for such a contagious virus as the COVID-19 is, but we have not seen that leadership. We have one such facility and there's been no outbreaks from them. Now, everyone knows only too well that hotel quarantine has, on the whole, been a failure. 
Hotels are not built to accommodate people quarantined from COVID-19. It is just unacceptable to have hotels in inner cities trying to do the job that this government has failed to do by providing purpose-built quarantine facilities. Now, every state and territory should have one of those facilities. That is the safest and the best way to protect older Australians. Now, what we've seen time and time again from this minister is his failings in this portfolio. I asked a question during estimates. What is the protocol for new residents, older Australians going into residential care? What is the protocol to ensure that they have been vaccinated? They couldn't tell me. They had to take that on notice. With the deaths that we've had in this country in residential aged care, they couldn't tell me what the protocol is. Ask them what happens when those residents who, for whatever reason, they may have been ill, they may not have been ready to have the COVID-19 vaccine administered to them, what happens when they've changed their mind and they want to have the vaccine? How is that protocol being rolled out? No answers. Silent again. We'll have to take that on notice. Mr President, it is not good enough. Order. This Senator government Polly, has time failed. Has expired. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. And yet again, we find ourselves in this place with Labor conveniently ignoring many of the facts that have underpinned Australia's incredible success in managing the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's not forget that the Morrison government led the world in closing the international border to arrivals from overseas declared COVID-19 a pandemic more than two weeks before the WHO did and, in fact, took the very, very important decision in August of last year to ensure that Australia has sovereign vaccine manufacturing capability. Despite taking those decisions early, despite ensuring that not only were the lives of Australians protected through the health response, that their livelihoods were also protected uh, through programs such as JobKeeper, cash flow boost and the other important economic stimulus measures. The government has worked collaboratively with the states and territories through the national cabinet process to ensure that the vaccine rollout occurs uh, in an orderly and planned fashion. It's also important to note that not only has national cabinet had complete oversight of the vaccine rollout, that also the Australian uh, approvals of the vaccines were not done in an emergency fashion. Because the Morrison government's success in managing the pandemic meant that we could uh, allow evidence from overseas to be assessed, where countries such as the UK, the US and Europe experienced death rates far in excess of that experienced here in Australia, and were forced, with their backs against the wall and bodies piling up in the street in some cases, to rush through emergency approval of the vaccines. Instead, Australia's uh, expert authorities reviewed that evidence, came to the decisions that they have, and we find ourselves rolling out the vaccine uh, through the ca National Cabinet process. Uh, National Cabinet agreed on 8 June uh, to increase access to the COVID-19 vaccine program uh, with people aged over the age of 40, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people between 16 and 49, the NDIS participants aged over 16, and indeed temporary visa holders who had previously been excluded. So we have responded to the dynamic situation of rolling out an unprecedented vaccination program in this, uh, in this nation. National Cabinet further agreed at the same time not to proceed with the identification of other essential and high priority workers in phase 2A, given the difficulty of defining these populations uh, simultaneously with the expansion of access to people aged over the age of 40. So at the end of the day, the Commonwealth, through the national cabinet process, is collaboratively prioritising vaccinations for those who most need it. With simplified and streamlined access to the vaccination program uh, through state and territory operated sites, 
uh, including, uh, for example, providing walk-in access and no requirement to pre-book an appointment. Not only this, we face criticism, despite that success in managing both the pandemic and the approvals and rollout of the vaccination program, uh, disingenuous attacks from those opposite on the quarantine program. Cast our minds back to the 27th of March 2020, that's some almost 15 months ago now, where National Cabinet collectively made the unanimous decision that mandatory hotel quarantine would be implemented under state public health orders. That reflected the fact that the Commonwealth uh, wasn't resourced with either the workforce or the facilities to handle the return of Australians overseas in these circumstances. Notwithstanding that, some 360,000 Australians have been returned to our shores through that program with a greater than 99.9 per cent success rate. So whilst those opposite criticise us for not uh, allowing Australians to return, they're equally criticising us for using hotel quarantine systems that give us the capacity to have more than 360,000 people thus far and counting return safely to Australia. It belies belief that this is a credible attack on government policy. It ignores the success that we have achieved in the health uh, battle against COVID-19 and completely misrepresents the realities of the situation that we face. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. I also rise to take note of answers to questions asked by, by myself uh, and my colleagues to Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The government, as we have seen clearly now month after month, is behind in every aspect of the pa COVID pandemic in Australia, and Australians continue to suffer. The government promised, just as recently uh, uh, as late last year, October, that all aged care workers would be vaccinated by March this year. Yet here we are in June, in this question time, with the Minister for Aged Care speaking on behalf of the Minister for Health, being unable to tell us how many aged care workers have had the vaccine and uh, to be unable to give us any kind of state breakdown of what that looks like. It's all very well for those opposite to try and uh, blame uh, the procedures and processes of the National Cabinet. This is not a job of the National Cabinet. This is not a cover-up where the states will have paid detailed attention to this and that leaves it open for the Liberal Party to blame, well, this is how it was supposed to be all along. We did this deal with the states. The simple fact is, in this nation, aged care is a Commonwealth responsibility and that the need to track any vulnerabilities in our aged care system due to COVID-19 is clearly and firmly a Commonwealth responsibility. And yet we have a government that simply does not know how many people uh, who work in the aged care sector have been vaccinated. People's occupation isn't asked when people uh, line up for their vaccination. And yet within this context, uh, plenty of workers who are younger who were supposed to be in that 1A cohort, who would not have otherwise been el eligible in the older cohort, are not asked about what their profession is that would see them be a vulnerable frontline worker. Just in the recent estimates, we've heard that fewer than 2 per cent of people living in residential disability care are fully vaccinated. And yet we hear time and time again that the government is comfortable with the vaccine rollout. This is the very same government that said they were committed to under-promising and over-delivering, and yet they have not, in their own explicit measures, 
of what they promised they would do, which even they said in effect was not a very high benchmark, they have not been able to meet. The government hasn't, has uh, lift the, lifted the ban on employees working at multiple facilities, which was imposed during the last outbreak. And yet again, we see only 15% evidence to show that only 15% of aged work care workers have yet been vaccinated. We know a proportion of these workers may be Medicare ineligible and have to go through the clinics. But where's the oversight to ensure that the state-run clinics, as per our protocols with the states for people who are Medicare ineligible, are actually prioritising and seeing aged care workers? There's nothing here that demonstrates there's been any proactive effort by this government as the regulator of aged care to ensure that aged care workers are going through any of those systems. Staff members that were vaccinated uh, at aged care homes were done with, we're told, the extra spare doses that were left over. It wasn't an intention to completely vaccinate uh, those staff members because they were vaccinated with the dregs of the system. And it's frankly clear to me that with many workers being uh, under 50, that they would want to be waiting for the Pfizer vaccine. We know there's been some vaccine hesitancy, and I'm in, by no means endorsing that. But Order, Senator Pratt. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of answers in response to questions by Senators Watt, Pratt and O'Neill to Senator Colbeck. I find it absolutely incredulous that those on the other side of this chamber would take something that has been a massive success. We have been one of the most successful countries in the world at uh, combating COVID and in bringing our people home from overseas, bringing Australians home from overseas <clears throat> without spreading COVID to the rest of Australia. We have been one of the most successful countries, and yet those across the floor can only nitpick and criticise. Oh, you haven't built this, you haven't vaccinated fast enough, you haven't done this. Yet they take, they take absolutely no notice of the science behind it, of the health advice and of the actual success of this government in managing this disease outbreak. Now, if we take up the issue, um, Senator, uh, Senator Polly mentioned the fact that we've been using hotel quarantine, and we have. That's a state decision. Quarantine of Australians returning is a state and territory responsibility and decision. Now, um, the, wonderful, uh, the wonderful place that is Danistan decided to use hotels that were possibly not suited and personnel that were possibly not properly trained and equipped to do this. And we have seen outbreak after outbreak. In the Northern Territory, where she referred to one facility um, that has been enormously successful and we've had no outbreaks from, that is Howard Springs Quarantine Facility. Now, that was not a purpose-built quarantine facility. That was a workers' camp. So yes, it has proved ideal for the purpose of quarantine, but that's not because it was a Commonwealth-built purpose facility. Um, it was a Northern Territory facility. It is still owned and operated by the Northern Territory government. But the success of that facility is not purely down to its location or its structure or its build or the facility itself. The success of that facility is down to the people who are running it which is Professor Len Notaris and his OSMAT team. These people are specialists in biosecurity, specialists in disease control and prevention. And that is what ma has made the facility so successful. We can have hundreds, even thousands of people through that facility safely and without the virus escaping due to the professionalism and the training and the expertise of those personnel. 
Um, I will disagree with Senator Polly on, on one point she made, and that was that we have one facility. Well, we don't. In the Northern Territory alone, we have two facilities, because there's a second one, which is very similar and possibly even better in its design and construction than Howard Springs, and that is Bladen Village. Now, why are we not using Bladen Village? I don't know. You'd have to ask the Labor Northern Territory government, because they are the ones that are refusing to utilise this facility. Um, now, if we go on to vaccination, and the criticism of the vaccine rollout, again, that is a function of the states and territories. The Commonwealth is supplying the vaccine. The states and territories are rolling it out. And we don't necessarily have um, the ability to dictate to them how they will do that. Um, however, in uh, all Commonwealth residential aged care facilities, everyone has received their first dose and 94.1 per cent have received their second dose. I think that's not a bad achievement. Um, nearly all are fully vaccinated. If we look at the issue of the workers in those facilities, yes, that rollout of vaccine uh, did, did receive a hiccup in that it was discovered and it was in fact pointed out uh, in, in this chamber by uh, the senator that sits in front of me, Senator Canavan, that issues started to uh, be discovered around this vaccine overseas, and we have since seen them occur in Australia, with a very tiny percentage of people uh, coming down with blood clots. Now, would you want us to barrel on ahead? Would those across the room want us to barrel on ahead Order. under senator those circumstances? McMahon. Time has expired. Senator Muriel Smith. Thank you, President. I also rise to take note of questions by Senators Pratt, Watt and O'Neill. We've been in this pandemic for one year now, and in that time there's been time to learn, to look at what's happening on the ground, to think of solutions, to roll them out. And on the two things that we know the federal government is ultimately responsible for—quarantine, vaccinations, We've seen failure after failure, failure after failure. On the vaccine, Scott Morrison has said that the vaccine rollout isn't a race, and he could not be more wrong. It is a race, and Australians are paying the price for his failures in it. South Australians don't want any more excuses. They don't want any more deadlines missed, avoided, dodged. They don't want to hear the federal government continue to blame the states or indeed anyone they can look at or point to. They want the federal government to take responsibility and they want the federal government to deliver. They want to be safe. They want to be safe and they're fearful that they're not safe. Nowhere are the government's failures on the vaccine rollout more stark than in aged care where we have lost Australian lives, where workers and residents alike are fearful, are fearful of this virus and fearful of what happens if the vaccinations aren't rolled out quickly, if they aren't protected, if they aren't kept safe, and can we blame them after everything they have been through these past 12 months? They expect the federal government to deliver for them. They expect to be kept safe. It's not just aged care, it's the disability sector as well. Just today I met with advocates from this sector who told me that their staff were yet to be fully vaccinated, that their workforce was concerned about their safety. The PM promised to vaccinate vulnerable workers by Easter, and with good reason. Easter mattered, right? It was a promise with reason because the Australian winter is the most dangerous time for this virus. It's when respiratory diseases are at their highest, when Australians are most vulnerable. They promise Easter with good reason, and they have failed to deliver on it. That has left Australians less safe. That has left people who work in and live in aged care less safe and more fearful. It has left people who work in the disability sector less safe and more fearful, and it is simply not acceptable. Two jobs—quarantine vaccinations. 
Hotels aren't meant to be quarantine facilities. They're meant to house tourists. This has been a failure of the federal government, a failure which affects Australian lives, a failure which affects South Australian lives. The vaccination rollout is failing too in its speed of delivery. It is so important the federal government gets this right. It's important for confidence and it's important for the safety of some of our most vulnerable workers and our most vulnerable Australians. And instead of coming in here and defending it, instead of coming in here and puffing up your chest and saying, we've done a great job and therefore that's it, game over, we're done, you actually need to keep working on this. You need to keep working every day, doing everything you can to keep South Australians safe. You always need to be looking to do better, always need to be looking to roll out better, spend less time focused on excuses for errors and failures in delivery, and more time working out solutions to these problems. Less time focused on labour, although you might want to think about some of the things we've suggested to fix this, like purpose-built quarantine facilities, an advertising campaign wouldn't go astray, Channel 9's done a pretty good one. You can listen to us and our positive suggestions, but less time focused on the politics of this and more time focused on the things you're responsible for, on the rollout, on the delivery, on the implementation, the fundamental roles of federal government, the responsibility you have to keep your fellow Australians safe. It's a clear, linear responsibility that you hold. There's a clear job ahead of you. Australians expect it of you, and if you don't deliver it, you are, you are leaving Australians less safe and you are leaving them fearful. After year, the year that we have had, after the lessons that we have learned, it's time to take responsibility, time to actually set targets and meet them. It's time to stand up for South Australians. Thank you, Senator Smith. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Polly to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I uh, move that the Senate take note of the response given by uh, Senator Cash to the question I asked today. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> well, here we are again. A sickening case before us today that has appalled so many people in Australia. Priya. Nadez and their two little girls, the Murugappan family, originally from Sri Lanka, more recently from Biloela, a family that has been deliberately mistreated because it suits this government's political ends to do so. And this family has now finally been let off Christmas Island, and the Australian Greens are very pleased that they will no longer be detained in inhumane and unsafe conditions on Christmas Island. But for them to simply be placed into community detention in Perth is not good enough. They should be released not just into community detention in Perth, but in fact released to go back to their home, to the community in Biloela that wants them returned there and will support them when that happens. Biloela, a place where they were building a life and where they were welcomed and loved by the local community. And the developments of the last week, but uh, really over the entire life of this government, shows that the mistreatment and cruelty that has been doled out to this family is not some byproduct or some accident. It's not a bug, it's a feature of the government's policy. It's a deliberate choice by a government that chooses to build in torture as a cornerstone of its immigration policy. They've militarised our borders. They've advertised their cruelty for the world to see with slogans that have been aped by far-right nationalists in Europe. They've turned around people fleeing persecution and in some cases turned them straight back into the hands of the regimes and the persecutions they were fleeing. They have destroyed thousands of lives in offshore detention, an appalling, bloody policy that has the full support of both major parties in this place. It is a brutal 
policy with brutal human consequences. And make no mistake, the quarter, cornerstone of Australia's immigration detention system, both offshore and here onshore in Australia, is to make people's lives so miserable, to harm people so grievously that they decide that going back to the persecutions in the places they fled from is the lesser of two evils. It has been designed to break people, and break people it has. And it has the express and admitted intent of deterring other people from seeking asylum. It's like the old medieval practice of impaling corpses on the walls of cities to dissuade other desperates from trying to enter. And here we are in the early to middle 21st century engaged in that kind of medieval barbarism. And those millions of Australians who know this is wrong, who believe we are a better country than this, know all too well how hard it's been to achieve even a glimpse of humanity and compassion. They're fighting against billions of dollars, a paramilitary campaign supported by the two major parties. A, um, they're, they're fighting against racist, baying elements in the media and the two major parties who wear their cruelty as a badge of honour. But in face of all that, the Australian Greens and the millions of Australians who want to see a more compassionate approach will never stop fighting so that families like the Murugapans are given the freedom and safety they so richly deserve in this country. And when they win their freedom on a permanent basis, and I, I genuinely believe they will, we'll continue to fight for those others who need it, for those people who are medivaced here and still languish in hotel prisons, for the people still stuck in Papua New Guinea or Nauru. And let's not forget, in regards to this Sri Lankan family, if they arrive tomorrow in Australia by boat to claim asylum in this country under the policies of both major parties, they will be immediately exiled, kids and all, to a prison camp on Nauru. Shame on the bloody lot Thank of you. Thank you, Senator McKim. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion to take note of answers as moved by Senator Kim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now, um, that concludes taking note. Um, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? No? Okay. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Smith. Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators from the 15th to 24th of June 2021, Senator Griff for personal reasons and Senator Molan for medical reasons. So the question is that the motions moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So no, I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General Business Notice of Motion 1121, standing in the name of Senator Waters from today to 16 June. Notice of Motion 1097, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young from today to 23 June. And Notice of Motion 1119, standing in the name of Senator McKim from today to 21 June. And committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item nine on today's order of business. Thank you. Um, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and I'll go to a general business notice of motion at number 1113, standing in the name of Senator Hanson. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1113 proposing an extension of time for the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Hanson. Move the motion. The question is, the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll now go to
General Business uh, Notice of Motion number 1122, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Before asking that General Business Notice of Motion number 1122 be taken as formal, I seek leave to sadly increase the number of women killed from 11 to 18. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion uh, number 1122, as amended, uh, in my name, be taken as a formal motion. The question is that the oh. so the question is that the uh, uh, Senator Roberts. Would you make a short statement? I haven't put the question. So, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Uh, Deputy President, I move the motion. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Apologies for confusing you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Every single death is one too many. We know that domestic violence against women takes many forms, including coercive control. The decision to legislate in this area sits with state and territories. However, we have committed $4.7 million to invest in legislative reform across the country as part of the $1.1 billion women's safety package. This is the single largest investment in women's safety and acts as a down payment on the next national plan, which is currently being consulted upon. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. One Nation opposes this motion. The national crisis is the very existence of violence in our homes and communities. That is violence against men, violence against women, violence against children, the elderly and those living with disabilities. It is fact that males are less likely to be victims of assault from an intimate partner compared to women. But that's not the whole story. When it comes to violence and assaults from other family members, the statistics show that men and women are almost equally likely to suffer. Australia loses six men per day to suicide, and more men die from suicide in, died from suicide in 2019 than the entire Australian road toll of 2019-2020 combined. Men are 75 per cent more likely to commit suicide than women. These figures are a national tragedy. This motion separates out a portion of the problem without regard for the whole. To solve a problem first requires understanding the problem and its causes and understanding what drives the perpetrator and the victim. To separate out only a part of the problem will perpetuate the violence. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that the motion as amended and moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now um, go back to uh, the matter of privilege and I'll call Senator Patrick Thank you, uh, Deputy, Madam Deputy President. Um, I seek leave to amend matter of privilege notice of motion number one before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? The leave is being granted, Senator Patrick. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. So uh, the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick be taken as formal. Is, uh, those of that opinion say aye. Against. Amended. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. The government does not support Senator Patrick's motion. This motion contains inappropriate imputations about a distinguished senior public servant, which would be further compounded if it's carried. The amendment is nothing but a sleight of hand, and the intent and outcome of the motion remain unchanged. Secretary Moriarty has served the Australian people with distinction in a life of public service. He was the senior negotiator with the Peace Monitoring Group in Bougainville and served as our ambassador to Iran, our ambassador to Indonesia and Australia's Commonwealth Counterterrorism Coordinator. The government is committed to working with senators where concerns are raised, but this motion is not an appropriate or constructive way to advance public debate or the public interest. So the question is that the uh, motion as moved by Senator as amended and moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Order. So the question is that the motion as amended and moved by Senator Patrick uh, on a matter of privilege be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31 and noes 27. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. We now go to a general business, notice of motion uh, number 1116, and I advise senators there may be further division. Standing in the name of Senator Thorpe.
Sen. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1116 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. And Senator Dunningham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the Morrison government is committed to supporting access to justice. We're providing more than $2.3 billion over five years for legal assistance services across Australia through the National Legal Assistance Partnership, including approximately $350 million in additional funding to follow, uh, sorry, following the 2021-22 uh, budget. The budget also provided $26 million over four years to improve the quality capability and cultural safety of Indigenous and non-Indigenous family violence services, including for the uh, Family Violence Prevention Legal Services. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 1116, standing in the name of Senator Thorpe, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business, notice of motion number 1117, standing in the name of Senator McKim. Senator thank, McKim. You. thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1117 in my name be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 1117. Uh, standing in the name of Senator McKim be agreed to. I'll oh, beg your pardon, Senator Roberts. Statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Robert. Thank you. One Nation supports this motion. Many broad strokes policies were voted through in the early days of COVID due to the uncertainty at the time. Yet mistakes were made and these must be admitted and addressed. In some cases, JobKeeper payments went to companies with no need for the money and who used the money for purposes having nothing to do with the intent of JobKeeper, which was to protect jobs and to help workers and families get through tough times. Mega car dealership, Eagers Automotive, claimed JobKeeper and then paid out dividends for almost ex the exact same amount, $67 million. Star Casino received $64 million and then gave CEO Matt Beckier an equity bonus of 800,000. Without basic governance, greed has come out to play. Company executives purloining JobKeeper for their own financial benefit does not pass the pub test. It's time this government stopped running the country for the benefit of its big business mates and started caring about the people paying for all of this, Australian taxpayers, current and future. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1117, standing in the name of Senator McKim, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <coughs>
order. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1117, standing in the name of Senator McKim, be agreed to. Uh, the ayes should move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. So the result of the division is 32 ayes and 27 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business. Notice of motion number 1120, standing in the name of Senator Billick. Senator Urquhart. Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1120 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being yes. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Oh, thank you. I, I move that, pursuant to contingent notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Wong, that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. It's a I'm going to put it again because I, I, I didn't hear more than one voice. I only heard one voice. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, the ayes have it. Aye. So division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Patrick as teller for the noes. Order, there being 60 ayes and two noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We'll go back to Senator Gallagher. Or Motion in the name of Senator Billick. So the question is uh, general business notice of motion number 1120 standing in the name of Senator Billick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. I oh, beg your pardon, Senator Faruqi. Make a short statement. Is leave granted? Uh, we usually table at this point. So are you happy to do that? Yes. Thank you. So uh, the question is that general business notice of motion number 1120, standing in the name of Senator Billick, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Ask yourself. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1120, standing in the name of Senator Billick, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 27 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to general business notice of motion number 1114, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Deputy President, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 1114 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted to amend? Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Uh, so the question is the motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a shortish statement. Our leave is being sought to yes for one minute. One minute. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. The government is committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of young Australians. We acknowledge that the clinical treatment of children experiencing gender dysphoria is a complex and evolving area and that more research is needed. In Australia, state and territory health departments are the system managers of their public hospital and health services and have primary administrative and clinical responsibility and control of uh, relevant services. It's important that the states and territories work to develop a nationally consistent evidence-based approach to best practice treatment and clinical care with appropriate safeguards, and we encourage them to immediately prioritise this critical work. 
Also, this motion touches on complex issues that could be a matter of conscience, and therefore coalition senators will be voting in accordance with their consciences. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Rice? A short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Rice. Um, newsflash. Transgender and non-binary people exist. They are valid and they deserve our love and support. And for some of them, medical support to affirm their gender is life-saving. This motion is harmful. It is full of misrepresentation, misinformation, fear-mongering, and it's got no place in our parliament. It is a complete misrepresentation of the support being offered to young people in Australia affirming their gender identity, such as the world-class services being provided at the gender clinic at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. The Greens reject this motion absolutely and state our support for all trans and gender diverse people. You are valid. We see you and we support you. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that the general business notice of motion number 1114 as moved and amended by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1114, moved and amended uh, and standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Robert as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. <clears throat> there being 23 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. That now uh, finishes general business and we'll now move to the urgency motion. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator McKim proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 11 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on this matter of public urgency, which is about not spending public money to open up the Beedaloo Basin, which would turbocharge the climate crisis that 
our, our globe is already in. Now, sadly, uh, we know that there was almost um, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars of public money committed in the budget to open up the Beetaloo Basin. And perhaps even more sadly, we know that the opposition also supports opening up this basin. Now, I want to make a few points about what a bad idea this is. Not only is it a climate bomb, not only will it have an enormous threat to 90 per cent of the Northern Territory's groundwater systems, but there is no consent from the traditional owners for any of this gas mining, this fracking, this extraction from their land. Now, that should be enough to stop this proposal in its tracks, but uh, as we all know, the laws do not provide any protection for First Nations people to um, have any sort of determination over what happens on their land. Um, but it should provide pause to this government and the opposition that the First Nations owners of this part of the territory do not want fracking on their land. They do not want their groundwater jeopardised and they do not want the world's climate stuffed up. Um, that hasn't provided any pause to this government because they've allocated so much public money. Um, $175 million for roads in and out of the Beetaloo Basin. Um, a number of uh, dollars for, uh, in fact, $1.1 billion of new spending, um, 16 million of which is for so-called strategic gas basins, including the Beetaloo and $50 million for actually drilling in the Beetaloo. I mean, is this government going to actually get in there and drill gas fracking wells for the company themselves? I mean, frankly, they are essentially bankrolling the whole project. Um, but it's very interesting to see who is, in fact, undertaking the project and who's going to benefit from this largesse of public funds. Uh, two billionaires are set to profit in particular. Surprise, surprise. And the big energy companies pushing this, uh, many of whom are actually donors to the Liberal Party. Again, blow me down with a feather. So the companies are comprised of uh, people that have been accused of tax dodging, Gemina and Santos, um, people who donate to the Liberal Party, Origin, Santos, Empire Energy and Jacaranda, uh, billionaires Gina Reinhart um, and Dale Elphinstone, and Liberal Party luminaries Paul Elsby. What a bunch of folk to get public money to open up a gas basin against the wishes of the traditional owners that will turbo turbocharge the climate crisis that we're in and potentially wreck 90 per cent of the groundwater of the Northern Territory. So fracking the Beetaloo will increase Australia's emissions if it goes ahead by at least 8 per cent, possibly up to 23 per cent. It is that much of a carbon bomb. And we just had the G7 yesterday say not only should we be not funding uh, more fossil fuel subsidies, not more fossil fuel projects with public money by 2025, but we should have strong emissions reductions targets by 2030, at least double what this government is proposing, and the opposition doesn't even have a 2030 target. So Australia is flying in the face of the rest of the world in wanting to sink um, a quarter of a billion dollars in public money to open up a climate bomb that would wreck the groundwater against the wishes of the traditional owners of that land. It is hideous. You could not think of a worse proposal. Um, naturally, it's for the benefit of the big corporations that either donate to the Liberal Party um, or have other links to it, but the Australian people will not let this fly. They want genuine action on the climate. They want renewable energy investment and they want the wishes of First Nations owners respected. Thank you. Senator Rennie. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. <clears throat> and I'd just like to touch on, first of all, Senator Waters' uh, comments about public money being used uh, for energy projects in this country, because uh, the Morrison government has committed billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, to renewable energy, uh, not the least $10 billion in the Clean Energy Fund, uh, $5 billion in the Snowy Hydro. Uh, $3.5 billion for the Climate Solutions Package, another $2.5 billion for a Emissions Reduction Fund, uh, $1.5 billion for the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, another $1 billion for a Grid Reliability Fund that has now become another fund, and of course half a billion dollars for the Hydrogen Strategy. Now, so that comes to about $24 billion all up. So I think it's a bit hypocritical, and I mean I'm happy. You know, my, my view is either you nationalise the energy market or you let the market rip. But this idea where we go around subsidising uh, energy producers, regardless of the sort type of energy, uh, is not on. So I will agree. I mean I think the private industry should pay their tax, and if they make money, 
they should pay money, and anything that we put in terms of roads to enable this to happen, I'm, I'm more than happy to argue that they should pay uh, their fair share of tax on that. However, the Beetaloo Basin does have over 200,000 petajoules of shale gas in place. So, to put that in perspective, Australia currently uses 1,920 petajoules a year, uh, both for uh, domestic use and uh, export, uh, export. So, there is over 100 years of gas just for Australia. Uh, in the Beetaloo Basin, so you know we'd be mad not to use our own natural resources uh, where we can. We we cannot rely on wind and solar alone. It's it's intermittent energy, and ultimately it's it's not renewable, uh, and uh, it's not clean either, which I'll, I'll talk about in a money, in a minute. Um, the other thing I, I would like to talk about, however, is this allegation of it being a climate bomb and in particular uh, the description of methane as being a dangerous climate heating gas. Now, we've got to get over this notion that greenhouse gases are somehow warming the planet. Okay? What warms the planet is the sun, and the scientific equation for that comes under E equals mc squared. 600 million tonnes of hydrogen are burnt every second and converted into 596 million tonnes of helium and 4 million tonnes of energy. And that energy is transported in the form of a photon to planet Earth. Not all of it, but some of it comes here in planet Earth. And depending on where it was created in the sun, if it was created internally in the sun, in the middle of the sun, it can take up to 170,000 years just to get out of the sun. And then once it's out of the sun, it takes about eight minutes and 20 seconds to get here. But that'll have a lot less energy of a photon created on the edge of the sun. Uh, we will get here with a lot of energy, and that will come either as an ultraviolet uh, ray or a gamma ray. <coughs> And that'll have a lot of energy, hence why you know, we've got to stay out of the sun, uh, because ultraviolet light will knock out a, an electron. Um, it's got that powerful uh, ionising effect, uh, and hence could cause cancer. But the stuff that the infrared radiation, which is on the other side of the vis uh, visible spectrum, uh, two parts. You've got near radiation uh, and thermal uh, radiation. The near radiation, infrared radiation, is the incoming stuff. The thermal stuff is the outgoing stuff. Um, and methane, interestingly enough, is actually even though it stays in the atmosphere for about 20 years versus supposedly carbon dioxide for 200 years, but that ignores the photosynthesis effect and lots of it gets absorbed by the ocean to create corals of all things, um, does actually emit at about 8 microns versus 15 microns of carbon dioxide, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but interestingly enough, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd just talk a little bit about the science because we often hear people say how they believe in the science. Well, you don't believe in science. You either understand it or you don't. Science isn't a cult. It's not a faith. You've got to actually understand the science. Now, when it comes to heat, we've got three forms of heat transfer: convection, conduction, and radiation. Now, I'd like to quote a paper actually that was released in 1917 um, that talks about uh, the quantum theory of radiation. Um, that happened to be uh, put out by a bloke by the name of Bert Albert Einstein. Um, and interestingly enough, in this paper, he concludes that uh, if I just go there. The momentum transferred by radiation is so small that it always drops out as compared to that from other dynamic processes. Um, and if I just refer, so what that basically means is that radiation has such a minimal impact that it's basically neg negligible uh, in the overall uh, transmission of energy um, on planet Earth. Uh, and interestingly enough, he says at the start, um, and I love to quote these scientists because we're told we've got to believe the science. Well, here's the science. Um, that you know, molecules uh, will acquire as a result of their mutual interaction by, co by collisions. So interestingly enough, and he goes on in this paper to talk about well, nitrogen and oxygen, which make up over 95 per cent of the atmosphere, they're also heated up as well. So given that they don't emit radiation, how is it that these things heat up and, uh, you know, if, if, if radiation is such a powerful effect? And effectively, they heat up because the major form of heat transfer in the environment is convection and conduction. So, lots of you know about eight million collisions a second go on. That's that's conduction, and then convection is basically where the wind and the evaporative cooling from the ocean, everything basically cools the planet. Now, the reason why we need to understand that is because, unlike climate theory, uh, you know climate science theory, and that's all it is. It's a theory. Uh, there is actually a true science that's been around for about 200 years, and that's the science of heat, which is called thermodynamics. And there's two laws in that that really, really matter. First applies to conduction, the first law of thermodynamics, and that says that the heat can neither be uh, energy can neither be uh, destroyed 
uh, or created, only transformed or transferred. Uh, and that's important because when we have a collision with molecules, whatever one molecule, whatever one molecule lo loses in energy, the other uh, molecule gains. But overall, there is no increase in energy in the system because ultimately energy is kinetic energy, which when we talk about heat is kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, which makes a mockery of the whole climate science carbon dioxide traps heat because nothing traps heat. As per the Stefan Boltzmann laws, everything absorbs and radiates, absorbs and radiates. So this idea that you know, carbon dioxide is up there and it's sucking up all this heat is absurd. And if it was sucking up all this heat, the question is you've got to ask yourself, given it's been around for three and a half billion years, why we just don't get hotter and hotter? And of course, the answer to that is, is that effectively um, it emits as well. Now, then we go to the second form and the major form of heat transfer in the atmosphere, which is convection. And that's the second law of thermodynamics applies to that. And yet again, I, I emphasise the word law as opposed to theory, because laws have been proven through empirical science. Um, and that basically says the entropy of a system must always increase. Now, what does that mean? That effectively means that if I've got half a cup of water here at 10 degrees and half a cup of water here at 20 degrees and I pour one into the other, it'll average out at 15 degrees. Well, it's a bit like the atmosphere. If you turn those two cups uh, on their side, uh, effectively whatever heat is uh, emitted downwards by the so-called greenhouse gases, convection, will naturally balance it out. Why? Because the atmosphere is based basically one big pressure gradient based on temperature differentials. And any change in the pressure or the temperature will always seek to increase the entropy of a system. So, as I said, if you're putting heat downwards, so if we've got those two cups on their side and your carbon dioxide is radiating downwards and suddenly the bottom cup increases to 21 degrees, and using the first law of thermodynamics, that means the upper cup will go back to 9 degrees. If you combine them two again, it still averages out at 15 degrees. So, long story short, uh, we really have to stop scaring the world with this whole climate change mantra because the climate has always changed and the earth has always been able to balance it out uh, as a result of the atmosphere, pressure gradients, evaporative cooling and so on. Now, the other thing that I want to touch on here is, of course, the idea you know, the proposed solutions to all of this is somehow renewable energy. Well, let me tell you, there is nothing renewable, renewable about lithium. Lithium is a 1 per cent ore body. What does that mean? That means that you've got to mine 100 tonnes of ore to get one tonne of metal. Now, these ore bodies don't sit in the ground in a nice, perfect shape where you can go in and just uh, dig it up. You've actually got to go around and around and around. So when you see those mining pits, those mining pits will probably be 10 size, times the size of the ore because you can't just, you know, you've got to get down to the ore, so you've got to have, you can't just have a big truck driving down the steep gradient. So you might have to shift 1,000 tonnes of dirt just to get one tonne of metal. Now, that metal lithium, to get that actually out of the ore, has got to go through four intensive uh, electrolysis processes before it's even ready to be put into a battery, right? And that's just one half of the battery. You then got to use a graphite uh, as the cathode, so then you've got to dig all that up as well. Now, interestingly enough, a, a guy by the name of Richard Hetherington, who's the uh, head of the natural uh, sciences uh, in Earth Sciences in the Natural History Museum, he says just to power the UK fleet, you're going to have to use half the world's uh, 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 available copper, the entire uh, amount of the uh, world's available lithium, um, and about three quarters of the world's uh, available cobalt. So it's just never going to happen. Thank you. Um, Senator Watt. Thank you. Uh, Madam Deputy President, it's always good to follow Senator Rennick, uh, the Senate's own Julius Sumner Milner, um, <laughs> giving us all a version of a science lesson, um, just like he does at Senate Estimates as well. Um, this, this debate is an important one. It's about uh, a particular basin in the Northern Territory, and it's also more broadly about the gas industry and its future in Australia. Uh, I thought it was important at the outset to put on the record what Labor's position actually is on the gas industry, because we hear a lot from people in this chamber and people in the media about what Labor's position allegedly is, and it's about this and it's about that. Um, so, for the benefit of Senator Seselger and other people, our friends in the Greens, our friends in One Nation, our friends in the LNP, um, I thought I'd actually enlighten you on to what Labor's policy is. Because if you'd actually bothered to pay attention and have any uh, observe Labor's national conference earlier this year, 
Our position on the gas industry was made crystal clear, and it's been made crystal clear ever since. So here, are, here, here this is the direct quote from Labor's national platform. Labor recognises and supports the critical role that gas plays in the Australian economy. Labor recognises that gas has an important role to play in achieving Labor's target of net zero emissions by 2050. Labor's policies will support Australian workers in the gas extraction industry, building on Labor's legacy of supporting sufficient and affordable gas supply for Australian industry and consumers. This includes support for new gas projects and associated infrastructure, subject to independent approval processes to ensure legitimate community concerns are heard and addressed. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, pretty clear. Uh, so for anyone out there who is actually interested in what Labor's position on gas is, I'd encourage you to maybe not worry too much about what the LNP says Labor's policy is, what One Nation says Labor's policy is, what the Greens say Labor's policy is. You know what? It might actually be a good idea to go back to the original source document and look at Labor's platform. And there it is. Very, very clear. So what that policy means in practice is that Labor does support the gas industry. We support the jobs in the gas industry. We support the expert on earning, export earnings in the gas industry. And we also support strong environmental protections applying to that industry, as we do for any resource or other industry in the Australian economy. Labor does recognise that gas has an ongoing role to play when it comes to firming and peaking electricity, as well as being an important feedstock for manufacturing. As I say, Labor supports the jobs created by our gas sector, in particular those 17,000 who are already employed in the industry and also the role that the industry plays in creating economic growth and export income earnings. Labor will support new gas projects that meet all regulatory requirements and that stack up environmentally and economically. Any new exploration must of course be done safely with widespread genuine community consultation and importantly consultation must include consultation with traditional owners as a priority to ensure that cultural heritage and the natural environment of country is protected as a matter of importance. Um, we will always assess public spending for gas or any infrastructure being funded by government on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure that Australians are getting value for money and are not being ripped off uh, by this government and its own preoccupations. Now, the energy debate in this country and I suspect we'll see a bit more of that this afternoon, is too often dom dominated by loud voices on the extremes of each argument touting all or nothing opinions. Labor does not take that approach. As I've made clear, we support the gas industry and we support our resources industries generally and the jobs that they create. But unlike the government, we also acknowledge that climate change is real, uh, that we need to take action to combat it, and that one of the best ways we can do so is to genuinely support the expansion of renewable energy in this country. Now, to think, as some do, that gas is not going to play a role in our transition to renewables is, quite frankly, unrealistic. We will need reliable energy sources to back up our renewables industry as it grows and until we have the technology for it to power the grid alone. If you talk to anyone who knows anything about energy in this country, renewables, uh, uh, while we want to see them go ahead in leaps and bounds, will require firming, whether it be by gas, by pumped hydro or by batteries, for some time to come. So gas will have an important role in backing up those renewables even as we expand their use. As I say, gas is also important as a feedstock for manufacturing and for the jobs that come with it. Uh, but of course, we also know on the Labor side that uh, the need for action on climate change is urgent. Every single day we have reminders of that, whether it be what we see in the climate or what we see in expert reports warning us of the dangers if we do not take action on climate change and drastically reduce our emissions. Um, that's why Labor, for some time now, has committed uh, to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. That is the best thing that we can do as a country contri to contribute to the global fight against climate change. And I might note uh, that we are not alone in supporting uh, net zero emissions by 2050. In fact, most of the key bodies and companies involved in the gas industry in Australia also support net zero emissions by 2050. 
the peak body for oil and gas. Apia supports net zero emissions by 2050. Santos and Origin, two of the biggest gas producers and exporters in this country, support net zero emissions. And of course, it goes beyond the gas industry to pick up the big mining companies like BHP and Rio Tinto and the National Farmers Federation speaking on behalf of real farmers in this country as opposed to people like the National Party who pretend they speak for farmers. Uh, and this is where it's on this point, uh, net zero emissions and the need for strong action on climate change, that the Morrison government fails time and time again. What their energy policy even is, is still a mystery to most of us. It's time the Morrison government made a serious commitment to renewable energy in this country. We are falling further and further behind on energy and climate policy, to a point where if you speak to gas or mining companies, as I do on a regular basis, they will tell you that they have given up on this government and they're just getting on with it. They've all adopted net zero emissions by 2050 because they know that's the direction the world is taking and they want to be able to compete in that environment. Um, they are leaving this government in the shade uh, while it continues with its ideological preoccupations and its own internal divisions on matters like climate change. Um, these companies uh, whether it be in the oil and gas industry, the mining industry, in agriculture, in many other extractive industries, are getting on with the job, are moving ahead and recognise the need for action on climate change, including a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. Industry can see that this is the logical and rational thing to do. It's just a shame that we don't have a government in Australia who can do so as well. Now, Australia is perfectly poised to take advantage of the opportunities in renewables, both domestically and overseas. We have an abundance of sun, wind, water and critical minerals, and frankly, we should just start using them properly. Let's look, for instance, at northern Australia. There are critical minerals present in the north, which are needed to manufacture batteries, solar panels and wind turbines. There is a massive opportunity in northern Australia not only to mine these minerals, but to process them, export them and even create our own advanced manufacturing industry, where it's Australia that builds batteries, builds solar panels, builds wind turbines, rather than exporting these minerals only to see other countries value-add, create jobs producing products which we then import. We can do it in Australia. We could do it in Australia if only we had a government that was prepared to pull its head out of the sand, recognise that there are, there are jobs and dollars to be made by tackling climate change, as well as the obvious environmental benefits that come with it, and to allow Australians to actually seize those jobs rather than offshoring them to other countries. Similarly, we are well positioned to, de to develop use and export hydrogen. Uh, even in my own state of Queensland, places like Townsville and Gladstone are at the forefront nationally of grabbing these opportunities in hydrogen and creating jobs for North Queenslanders and Central Queenslanders. Why does this government not want to see those jobs go into places like North Queensland and Central Queensland? Why does this government want to continue sticking its head in the sand, ignoring the reality of climate change, ignoring the jobs and export opportunities that come with tackling uh, climate change? Why does this government want to see these jobs go offshore to other countries who are recognising these challenges rather than have them in places like North Queensland and Central Queensland? And I know the same can be said about places in Victoria, Western Australia, Tasmania and pretty much every state in the country. Where is the federal government on these issues? When are we going to have a federal government that tax tackles uh, climate change seriously, that grabs the job opportunities, that has a sensible policy about energy, that recognises that gas will have an ongoing role to play for some time to come and supports the jobs in that industry, but at the same time grabs the incredible opportunities that we have in solar, in wind and other forms of renewable energy? It's not difficult. All it requires is for people to get over their ideological preoccupations. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to discuss this issue, which at its core, quoting from the Greens, is about climate heating. Really, about humans heating our climate. One Nation relies upon data, facts and empirical evidence proving causation. Senator Watt relies upon belief. Let's have a look at some data on another issue, and that is the Greens' claims. On the 9th of September 2019, I invited Senator Waters and the then leader, Senator Di Natale—remember him? 
I invited them to present us with the empirical scientific evidence proving that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. I also challenged them to a debate on the empirical evidence and on the corruption of science. What have we heard since? Nothing. Not a thing. Just more claims, more beliefs. On the 7th of October 2010, I invited Senator Larissa Waters, who is now the Greens leader in the Senate, to debate me on climate and climate science corruption. She jumped to her feet and said, I will not debate you. Six years later, in May 2016, five years ago, I challenged her again, along with the Labor Party, and again she won't debate me. She won't debate me because they haven't got the facts. So let's go instead to someone who used to be part of the Obama administration, Stephen Coonan, or should I say Professor Stephen Coonan. He's written a book called Unsettled. And he says, quote, heat waves in the US are now no more common than they were in 1900, 121 years ago. Secondly, the warmest temperatures in the US have not risen in the past 50 years. So much for warming. Thirdly, humans have had no detectable impact on hurricanes over the past century. These are facts. These are things that I have spoken about in the past in this chamber. Professor Coonan continues, tornado frequency and severity are also not trending up, nor are the number and severity of droughts. The extent of global fires has been trending significantly downward. The rate of sea level rise has not accelerated. Global crop yields are rising, not falling. And listen to this. And while global atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are obviously higher now than two centuries ago, they're not at any record planetary high. They're at a low that has only been seen once before in the past 500 million years ago, as I have said repeatedly. So then we go on. Since all that data that, Dr. that Mr. Coonan uses are available to others, he poses the obvious question. Why haven't you heard these facts before? He's cautious, perhaps overly so, in proposing the causes for so much information, he, misinformation. He points to such things as incentives to invoke alarm for fundraising purposes and official reports that mislead by omission. Exactly. Let me touch on the CSIRO. The CSIRO has admitted to me, we've had three presentations from the CSIRO. Under my cross-examination, they've admitted there is no danger from carbon dioxide from human uh, from human activity. They've admitted today's temperatures are not unprecedented. And they have claimed the rate of warming is, but their own papers reveal that that is false. There is no merit to this matter of public urgency. Madam Acting Deputy President, we say toss it in the can. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise today to speak on the matter of urgency and um, I would just like to start by saying that there has been a crime committed here, and the crime in, is Senator McKim's motion is that it demonstrates a complete lack of genuine understanding and knowledge of basic chemistry and perpetrates John Kerry's apparent scientific qualifications and practical experience of oil and gas and energy in general. So it states to re release massive amounts of toxic methane. Well, sorry, when I did chemistry, methane was not toxic. It's actually a biologically inert, and it is only harmful if it displaces oxygen, which leads to asphyxiation. Or in uh, large concentrations, it is, it is a flammable gas, so uh, if, you, if you strike a match and you're down a mine and there's lots of methane, it will blow you up. So it can be harmful, but it is not indeed toxic. And it is certainly not going to be deliberately mass released into the atmosphere. I mean, the whole, the whole point of methane is that it has a value. It's, uh, it's a valuable gas. And, uh, when we talk about the oil and gas industry, well, we, we don't just take it out of the ground and throw it up into the atmosphere. We collect it and we do things with it. Uh, methane has many uses, 
It's uh, used in LNG, in, ironically, hydrogen production, and production of ammonia and other chemicals. Now, if we look at the Beedaloo Basin, which is, is what we're talking about, um, which is in, in my neck of the woods in the Northern Territory, and if we put the gas reserves into perspective, the gross potential revenue from the Beedaloo Basin would be in the order of $1.7 trillion. Uh, this is the equivalent of all of Australia's annual GDP. So we're talking about fairly high value commodities here. The development of the Beedaloo has the potential to create 6,000 jobs by 2040, and it would transform the NT's economy and supply gas into domestic markets for decades to come. Uh, 6,000 jobs in the Beedaloo region of the Northern Territory is absolutely massive and staggering. Um, his historically, there have been very few labour market opportunities, other than the pastoral industry, in this region of the Northern Territory. In 2016, the region's unemployment rate was almost double the Territory's unemployment rate. Um, this likely understates the real jobless rate in the region, with only half of all people of working age in a job or actively looking for one. There are many more people that are unemployed than turn up on official figures. So jobs represent one of the best opportunities for the Beedaloo Basin and for this entire region of the Northern Territory. I know that the Greens don't care about regional Australia, but I and my coalition colleagues do. And in this case, so does Senator Watt and Joel Fitzgibbon. They know how important the oil and gas industry is. A couple of fun facts about the Beedaloo. It's approximately 5,000 kilometres southeast of Darwin, as I've said, in the Northern Territory. It lies between Catherine, 100 kilometres to the north, and Tennant Creek, 250 kilometres to the south. The Stewart Highway bisects the sub-basin from north to south. It covers an area of 28,000 square kilometres and comprises mainly of vast rolling plains. It sits within the larger, at 180 thousand square kilometres MacArthur Basin, which covers the majority of the northeast of the Northern Territory. Population is very sparse. Fewer than 1,500 people reside in the rural communities which border or lie within the Beedaloo. Most of the land in the Beedaloo is used for cattle grazing and indigenous land practices. Perpetual leasehold covers most of the Beedaloo region and native title exists for most of these leases and the rest are under application. Um, Tennant Creek is the key service centre of the Barclay region. It has a population of 3,200 and the town has a long history of uh, mining and cattle grazing. And Tennant Creek also has a strong Indigenous presence, comprising 51 per cent of the population. I would reject the premise of the Greens that um, Indigenous people oppose the oil and gas industry in the Beedaloo region. Many of them have engaged with oil and gas exploration companies and have come to agreements with those companies or are in the process of coming to agreements with those companies because they realise that this represents their best opportunity at economic independence and jobs for their people. They, they know that at the moment there is very little to look forward to in the way of economy and jobs in this region of the Northern Territory. And they understand the importance that the development of this basin will play uh, in their economic independence. Now that is something that the Greens do not want um, traditional owners to have. They want to keep them oppressed. They want to keep them living in communities that have no economic opportunity whatsoever. They don't want to see them lift out of a lack of economy. They don't want to see them get jobs. They don't want to see them get training. They don't want to see them get trades. They do not want to see the economic development of traditional owners and Indigenous people in the Northern Territory. Um, 
With regard to our future energy mix, we understand that gas has a role to play. Yes, solar and wind and a whole pile of other uh, emerging technologies and intermittent generators have a role to play, but um, they need to be firmed. And we understand that gas is one of the best ways that we currently have to do this in a transition to a future energy mix. Um, gas will continue to underpin these emerging industries. Uh, and uh, gas will be a way forward to go from a fossil fuel-based economy fuel. to a future economy where intermittent generators will have a role to play. Um, the development of the Beetaloo and the technological development of um, renewable gases such as hyd hydrogen and biomethane will complement each other. Now, if we look at, uh, at where methane comes from, seeing as it's such a, an evil, horrible, non-toxic gas, um, methane obviously comes from the oil and gas industry, extracting it from the land and from the seabed. It also comes from biomass burning. It comes from livestock. And it comes from waste management practices. Um, if we look at emissions, the government's gas-fired recovery measures are a key component um, of our transi transition, as I said, to future energy mixes. And that may include wind, it may include solar, it may include pumped hydro, um, and uh, it, it also may include hydrogen, which uh, the Greens like to, to trot out as um, the future energy mix, the, the, renew, the renewable energy mix of the future, the panacea for everything that's evil about the oil and gas industry and fossil fuels. Well, let me tell you that nearly all hydrogen on the planet today is ironically manufactured from, guess what, that evil, evil methane. So does that make hydrogen evil as well? Well, maybe it does. Um, if the Greens truly want to go as fast as they can to low emissions or no emissions, then they should consider gas as a transition fuel and they should consider nuclear power generation as something in their mix of uh, renewables and uh, intermittent generators. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise today to speak on this urgency motion uh, and in doing so recognise the contributions from Northern Territory senators such as Senator McMahon. Uh, this is a um, an issue uh, that relates to the Northern Territory, but as we know, this is um, a far-reaching debate about much more than just one area of our country. It's about the government's energy policy, it's about where we're going in the future, and it is about the jobs that can be created right now and how those jobs are going to be created. See, the, the problem with what the government puts forward in these debates is they talk about a transition, but there's no plan to where they're going to. So they talk about a transition, but there is no support for, for renewable energy. There is a walking away and a walking backwards of support for renewable energy. And even as we've seen from some of the contributions today, a complete denial that this is something the government needs to address, that these jobs um, can be created and that they will uh, assist our regional communities, um, but that even climate change is something that we need to talk about in this place. So it's disappointing. I respect the, the, um, the views of um, the Territory and Senators that have contributed to this debate, uh, but the broader debate around this government's energy policy is incredibly lacking. 
On the Beedaloo Basin, can I just say that Federal Labor respects and understands the Northern Territory Government's support for exploration in the Beedaloo. Labor also understands that there are strong community views and concerns on the issue in the Territory. And that's why Labor will continue to advocate for the government and industry to continue to consult with traditional owners to ensure that cultural heritage and the local environment is protected as a matter of urgency. Now, under this government, we've had repeated attempts to put into place laws that will not do that, that will not protect the environment, that will not protect, protect cultural heritage. So again, we call on the government to do what is necessary under the Samuel Review and bring a bill to this parliament that isn't just a repetition of Tony Abbott's one-stop shop, uh, that we can actually move forward and get good environmental protections, good cultural protections in place to assist state, um, par state parliaments and to assist state governments to be able to do this work. More broadly, this motion uh, raises issues around uh, the contribution of gas and the contribution of renewable energy more broadly um, to the energy mix and where we're going from here. Labor has always continued to, to argue for urgent and meaningful action on climate change, in keeping with our commitment to reach net zero by 2050 and in keeping with our support for the de declaration of a climate emergency. Uh, can I say, uh, Labor's record in government was to ratify Kyoto, supercharge Australia's renewable energy sector and to put Australia on a pathway to sharply declining emissions. That's what Labor governments do. But this government has walked backwards from all of those achievements. Labor's position has always been that on matters that involved environmental and heritage protection that we must adhere to, defend and act upon analysis and research. This is science-based, and as much as members opposite want to come in here and give the Senate a science lesson, they are not the scientists. And we do need to listen to the scientists when it comes to these issues. Of course, Labor knows that gas has an ongoing role to play in both firming and peaking electricity, as well as feedstock for manufacturing. Where there is a role for gas to play in firming and peaking electricity and as a feedstock for manufacturing, it must be subject to rigorous independent scientific assessment, not scientific assessment from Senator Rennick over there, but scientific assessment that is independent and rigorous. Labor supports the Australian gas sector. Let's be clear about that. Australia supports Australia's gas sector and the jobs that it creates and the jobs that it supports right now in recognition of the important role in creating economic growth and exporting incomes, earnings and both job retention and job creation. There's no uh, opportunity here for the, the Greens to put a wedge motion through and the government to point the finger at Labor. Labor has a strong position on this and we want to make sure that that is clear, but we also know that we need to invest more money in renewable energy. We want to make sure that we invest money in jobs that create economic um, uh, development, but also contribute to our country's um, need to do something about climate change. I want to quickly address the comments that were made by the Deputy Prime Minister, the Acting Prime Minister this week, about climate change, where he again sought to frame this debate as a city versus country divide. Because let me tell you this, this isn't about regional versus city. Climate change is not a regional issue, it's not a city issue, it's not about baristas. Because the jobs that will be lost if we fail to act on climate change are regional jobs. Climate change is the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef that supports 64,000 jobs. Now, those aren't my words. That's the words of the member for Leichhardt, the special envoy for the reef. But this government isn't listening to their own members or their own scientific panels on this. The jobs that we will be created, the jobs that will be created if we do something and support renewable energy are regional jobs. And you only have to go to the wind farm that was vetoed by Minister Pitt. 250 jobs in North Queensland vetoed by this government to understand that renewable energy jobs are being created right now 
in regional Queensland, but they're being held back by this government. And we also know that the communities that will be impacted if we don't take any action on climate change are regional communities. They're the, they're the islands in the Torres Strait that are facing uh, rising sea levels right now. They know that they may have to leave those islands because this government is failing to take action. So can we just agree that we this Time is a has problem. Expired. Sorry, Senator Green. Senator Steele John. We are in a climate emergency. We are in a climate emergency. And yet, across our nation, particularly in our north, the major parties are opening up massive gas projects, from the Beedalo in the NT to the Scarborough Gas Project uh, in Western Australia. Both parties are in lockstep towards the precipice of oblivion. Against the wishes of traditional owners, against the advice of the best science, against the common sense of communities coming together to oppose fracking in all of its forms, to keep coal in the ground and to invest in renewable energy solutions, this government and state governments like Mark McGowan in WA and Michael Gunner in the Territory are tramping over the top of the desires and wishes of traditional owners, embodying the very finest arrogance that white men have ever brought to government in this place, seeking to exploit and open up from the ground some of the most filthy fuel in existence that will supercharge global heating. This is one of the most disgraceful moments in Australian political history, when the world is moving to action on the climate crisis, Australia has dug itself in. The Morrison government, helped by Anthony Albanese's so-called opposition, is leading the charge of the denialists globally, blocking action on climate change left, right and centre, particularly here in the Asia-Pacific region, when our neighbours and friends are struggling with the reality of the water lapping round their ankles. We turn up to international fora after international fora and block action. Why do we do it? Why is it that these two parties are so willing to sell the future of young people, particularly in this country? Because they take millions for it. Because they are on the take. Two million dollars from Woodside alone given between 2013 and 2020 to the major parties. Millions more from other gas giants. And what do they get? in return. They get to be able to utilise their claims over the Fitzroy River in Western Australia. Whether you be Boro Energy or Origin Energy or Black Mountain or Mitsubishi or Twiggy Bloody Forest, Excuse all me, are Senator. able to circle at the trough and pursue their claims over one of the last great pristine wildernesses in this country. And just a few weeks ago, we see the former Treasurer of Western Australia leave his position and join the board of Rio Tinto and join the board of Woodside and claim $400,000 for it. The disgusting, slimy uh, turnstile of Australian politics on full display. Well, we in the Greens oppose it. We are a united united in support for the community to keep the gas in the ground and go you, Senator, bloody John, renewable. Your, your time's expired and I just comment on your unparliamentary language during the course of your oh. presentation then I ask you to apologise for that please. The, the swearing. Uh, the, the swearing and the raspberry Both, or just you, the raspberry? Please. 
Both, thank you. Uh, both the raspberry and the swearing. Yes, thank you. I'll withdraw both. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. I rise to speak on the matter of public importance, ma Madam De Deputy President. The contrast is becoming so clear. As the world moves away from digging up fossil fuels, it is Australia's absolute shame that the Liberals are propping up oil and gas by funneling endless taxpayer dollars to this dying industry. No amount of actual science or the climate disasters that we have been witnessing in our own backyard the fires, the floods, the heat waves. Nothing seems to convince this government that digging up fossil fuels is dangerous in the extreme. It is killing us. It is destroying our livelihoods, our communities, and our planet. Just this morning, Mr. Morrison spoke via video to the oil and gas lobby's annual conference after being isolated and shamed at the G7 summit. We know who your real mates are. I can never forget that this is the same guy who brought a lump of coal to Parliament. The International Energy Agency has made it absolutely clear that if we want a future free from the climate crisis, it means no new fossil fuel projects, starting now, starting today. This means no more new coal, oil or gas. Yet this government single-mindedly continues down the path of the so-called gas-led recovery promising hundreds of millions of dollars worth of new projects and exploration. And sadly, the Labour Party is being led down the same garden path. This bipartisan refusal to take significant action against the climate crisis is leaving us behind. Any new fossil fuel assets will become useless to us in the next decade or two. At the most, the Beetaloo Basin drilling, the Curry Curry gas-fired power station, the Woodside Scarborough gas project, are all doomed to fail. But the government is only interested in spin. They are very focused on faking it. Faking that they care about, the climate, they care about climate change. Faking that they and their oil gas lobby mates are taking action. Their hollow rhetoric about technological change and emissions reductions means nothing as they continue to bankroll dangerous fossil fuel projects with tons of carbon emissions. But you know what? Time is running out for these climate criminals. Climate change has become a real problem for them because the community has risen up. Because people are demanding change, and they are demanding change right now. And the Liberals will soon have to reckon with this. Or better still, they will soon be booted out with the Greens in balance of power, and we'll push the next government to phase out coal and gas and transition to safe, sustainable, jobs rolling out renewables. Senator McKim. <clears throat> thank, you, thank you, Deputy President. Well, if you want to know how much the world's changed recently, consider this. Last month, the International Energy Agency released its Net Zero by 2050 roadmap. And at the launch, the head of the IEA said this. If governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investments in oil, gas and coal from now, from this year. Well, there it is, clear as day in black and white. Remember, the IEA were basically formed uh, uh, in 1974 to ensure the security of uh, global oil supplies. They basically, for the best part of the last 50 years, they've been part of the fossil fuel lobby. And here they are saying, clear as day, no fossil fuels. They are done. They are over. We're living in a climate emergency. We need to change course. And we need to change course now. Now, this is the rational response of most of the rest of the world. In the face of a, a, an existential crisis, the world is choosing survival. Well, it's common sense, right? Or wrong? Not here in Australia. No, not this government. No, no, no. This government is happy to choose the apocalypse. While the rest of the world is going the other way, this government, with plenty of support I might add from its mates in the Labor Party, is trying to turn Australia into a petro-state. A big part of their petro-dreaming is the plan to open up the Beetaloo Basin. This one gas field, the biggest in the country, would see the release of up to 34 billion tonnes of carbon pollution, the equivalent of 68 years of Australia's current annual carbon emissions. 
Now, why is this government apparently so hell-bent on cooking the planet? Well, because there's big money to be made in cooking the planet, and there's big money to be made in cooking the planet from the people who are donating big money to the LNP. Over the last decade, companies involved in Beedaloo have donated, wait for it, $1.4 billion to this government and, by the way, nearly another billion to the Labor Party. Now, those companies don't care about the future. All they want now is to squeeze another decade or two of obscene profits out of pillaging the earth and cooking our planet. And what comes after is somebody else's problem, according to them. Their view is pay off the, poly the pollies and party while the world burns. This is debased politics. It's a stain on our nation. It is utter, utter madness. And let's not forget the oil and gas behemoths who will profit from this madness, among them Santos and Origin, are also systematic and serial tax avoiders. So how does the government treat serial and systematic tax avoiders? Oh <laughs> well, by pumping hundreds of millions of dollars into their latest planet cooking venture. That's how the government treats them. This government has tipped over $220 million into unlocking the Beedaloo so that the big corporations and the billionaires, who've already got obscenely rich from cooking the planet while paying next to no tax, can get even more rich while pay paying even more no tax and cooking the planet even faster. It's morally bankrupt, it's economically irresponsible, it's planet destroying and it's stealing the future from our children and our grandchildren. Congratulations, everyone. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I've said it before and I'll say it again until you understand. First Nations people are of country. We are not just from country. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land, waters, air and sky of what we now call the Beedaloo and connected basins, the traditional owners that are still protecting country from desecration come from many nations and clans, but they have come together to fight for country. I acknowledge your struggle to protect your country. I support you, and everyone in this place must listen. They are standing united against the desecration of their lands and poisoning of their waters. They fight for country like their ancestors, their lawmen and women, and how their old people always have. They've maintained their country for thousands of generations, and, and you see what's just happened over just over 200 years. Absolute desecration of country. They're in parliament this week with one message, that together they will fight for country, and I'm proud to, to be able to join with them on their fight. For years they've been told lies by the gas and oil corporations, the very dirty companies that have brought so many of the politicians in this parliament. I've sat with those companies myself, like Santos. They've told me how they con our people. For years our people have been told that there would be no damage to country. That's what they walk into communities and say, everything's going to be all right. We're not going to damage. They're lying. They're dirty liars going into communities, destroying not only country, but they're destroying people's lives. Lies that have been facilitated by the very politicians in this place that have been bought cheap by these dirty climate destroying gas and oil corporations. And yes, we know that you're in their pockets and vice versa. That is the problem in this country. Lies like the acknowledgement of country every morning. We do what? An acknowledgement to country. You have your prayer and then you do your acknowledgement to country. 
right here in this chamber. What does that really mean, though? Do you really mean it from your heart? While you backdoor us and stab us in the back and, and rape and pillage our country and our water? Don't acknowledge country if you're going to go off and do that. These companies do not respect traditional owners. They have failed to properly consult. And I know Labor talks about consultation, but geez, Labor with their consultation are just as bad as the government. Consultation is not consent. Consultation is not consent. Don't think that it is, because you've been getting away with it for too long and both sides know it. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is clear. Free, prior and informed consent of First Nations people must be secured before any action on country. Are you doing that, Labor? Are you doing that, Libs? We know the National Party just don't give us stuff. So if that's how we're going to operate, you have no consent. We know Time fifty million dollars went. Thorpe. Thank you. So the question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
Lock the doors. Order. The question before the Senate is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Eyes to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Seawood as teller for the eyes and Senator Ciccone teller for the nose. The old one's still on there. Senators, there being eight ayes and 37 noes resolved in the negative. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. 
The documents are listed on pages four to nine of today's order of business. Senator Seward, I'll give you the call in just in a moment when the chamber clears. Senator Seward. Thank you. Can I, I um, take note of report three, uh, performance audit, COVID-19 procurements and deployments of the National Medical Stockpile in the Department of Health, Industry, Science, Energy and Resources and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Does any other senator? Senator Seward. If nobody else is jumping, I will jump. Uh, jump. I seek leave to take note of the Australian Human Rights Commission Human Rights and Technology Final Report. Now, this report, I think, is a very uh, timely report. Uh, I will point out, particularly as we finally had or we had the outcome of the robo debt debacle uh, last Friday, where the judge named the debacle, in fact, as a shameful chapter in public administration which has led to the federal court approving a settlement worth $1.8 billion between the Commonwealth and victims of the robo-debt scheme. The judge also described it as a massive failure and, said that, and, and the judge said that it, had, it should have been obvious to the government ministers and senior public servants that the debt-raising method central to the scheme was flawed. He said the evidence showed that it was unlawful. And of course, we know that this scheme led to the government unlawfully raising $1.76 billion in debts against 443,000 uh, 443, um, people. Or debts, sorry. Now, I raise that because this report, to highlight the importance of this report by the, human rights, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission. They actually list in their report or use the robo-debt debacle as an example of why we need to be making sure that uh, we are addressing the human rights and the use of technology, the use of artificial intelligence and, uh, the, digi and the digital world. In fact, there's a section on automated government services, and it says, and it first off talks about uh, the Council of Europe, um, who had a study that observed automation by government can reduce transparency and accountability, bingo for robo-debt, and increase the risk of arbitrary decisions, bingo, robo-debt. It says, the use of AI and especially automation in delivering government services can engage human rights, including the right to social security, being robo-debt, and an ad adequate standard of living, the right to non-discrimination and equality, and the right to, effective, to an effective remedy. This is why this sort of report is so essential. But the, and it contains a, a number of recommendations which I urge the government to take on board. But one of the issues that I particularly wanted to raise here is the disadvantage that people on low incomes and in poverty can face in trying to access a world, a digital world, an online world, where more and more services are being delivered by government online. They are being increasingly isolated. And in fact, people talk about digital poverty, because when you're living in poverty, you cannot afford these services. So what we have, and um, in particular at the moment, this place in the very near future will be talking about the delivery of employment services online, sending more and, pe more, and more people online digi dig onto the digital platforms again disadvantaging the most vulnerable members of our community who cannot afford the internet or have to do pay-as-you-go 
um, cannot uh, access their phones run out of uh, credit, for example, because again, it's pay as pay um, for as you go. Now, the report talks about that extensively. It talks about the fact that the Red Cross said pervasive service digitisation and dependence on technology in our public and private lives can further disadvantage vulnerable Australians. Improving digital inclusion is critical to ensure that everyone in our community is empowered to participate and contribute. Technology can empower people in so many ways. They can stay connected and involved with their social and community networks, access knowledge and services to help them stay well or linked to learning and job opportunities. I couldn't agree more. But the central point here is you have to be able to afford it. You have to look at hum that people's human rights. And that's why this report is so important. Because not only are people being excluded from society because of the digi digital divide, divide, but their human rights are being violated under a number of conventions, including the right to social security, including the right to not be discriminated against and equality. This report is very important. I urge people to read it and I urge the government to take action to ensure people are not excluded because they're vulnerable and can't afford the technology. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I just also want to add uh, my two cents worth uh, in relation to this report and uh, uh, you know, noting that Justice Murphy did call it as a shameful chapter uh, and uh, you know, talked about maladministration. And it does disturb me throughout this process. We've had government ministers, we've had government officials referring to the robo-debt scheme as legally insufficient. That's a word I'm going to have to try and use if I ever get dragged into a courtroom. Um, instead of saying it was unlawful, the government simply uh, sought to uh, invent a new word, put a new word in our lexicon, and that is uh, uh, you know, legally insufficient. Uh, what happened was wrong. I just want to add uh, to Senator Seawitt's remarks and say that there is still wrongdoing occurring. There is still uh, a robo-debt 2.0 playing out, and that is in relation to pay slip averaging, where um, the Department or Services Australia are in fact uh, guessing by way of pay slip averaging. I've had a number of cases from constituents that I've helped uh, now in the AAT, where the AAT has basically said these debts are not properly uh, proved, they're not the correct debt. It's like uh, you know, someone coming up to me and saying, you know, uh, Senator Patrick, you owe me uh, 50 bucks. And I say, well, how, how did that happen? Where, where did that come from? And they, they, uh, they're not able to ground the claim. Now, if it was my mate, I'd simply say, you're wrong, go away. Unfortunately, in this instance, it's the federal government. And so most people, when confronted with the federal government, they don't really know what to do. And uh, you know, sometimes they're greeted with, with officials, with uh, frontline staff who are quite assertive. Uh, and uh, you know, this has caused all of the difficulties that Senator Seawood has talked about. We do have an ongoing issue with uh, pay slip averaging. Uh, it may not be to the same magnitude uh, as uh, what's been dealt with in the court, but it does need to be looked at. Uh, ministers can't stand by and simply state that uh, you know they're unaware or they're not quite uh, sure. Uh, you know, I've invited uh, uh, Minister Rustin to perhaps put up a test case. So instead of having uh, chewing up the AAT's time with uh, differing. Um, opinions coming out. Let's get it to a federal court where uh, the decision of uh, uh, you know, in either the F federal circuit court or the federal court would be but would be binding on the executive, and uh, that would provide some clarity. So um, th this issue hasn't gone away, sadly, and the government does need to address it. 
Senator Patrick, do you seek leave to continue your remarks? And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Is there any other senator? Oh, senator Patrick? Yes, I'd just like to uh, uh, rise to take note of document number eight on uh, uh, future frigates and order uh, for production. I'd like to uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Does any other? Oh, Senator Seward, my apologies. Um, I take note of item 17, Medical Research Fund, uh, Future Fund Act 2015, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. No, I wasn't. Just I'm just seeking the call. If any, any senator wishes to. Um, I seek to take note of items 28, 29 and 35 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Does any other senator wish to have the call? Uh, senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Chairs of the Community Affairs and Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committees, I present additional information received by the committees as listed at item 13 on today's order of business. Honourable Senators, the committee reports and government responses are presented out of sitting. See pages 9 and 10. Does any senator seek the call? Senator Seward. Um, I take note of report 28, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the general report from the Joint Standing Committee, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Does any other senator? Seek the call. Oh, Senator Seward. Uh, I also take note, uh, actually, I missed um, what Senator Chisholm took note of, but if he didn't do this one, I'll uh, take note of uh, Report 33, Electoral Matters Joint Standing Committee Review of Electoral Legislation, Electoral Lobby uh, Funding and Disclosure Reform, and seek leave to continue my remarks. I understand that he didn't. So is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Seward. Sorry. Okay. Um, I also take note of Report 35, Environment Communications References Committee, the Australia Post Progress Report and the report dated uh, May 2021, 20, uh, uh, the Freedom of the Press uh, Report, uh, Impact of Feral Deers and the Seismic uh, testing report and seek leave to continue my remarks on all of those bills, is leave all, all of those reports. All those reports. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Well, the last asking, does any senator seek the call? I understand that no one's seeking to make a minister the minister is seeking to make a statement. Uh, the president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The president has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence: Financial Regulator Assessment Authority Bill 2021. 
and Financial Regulator Assessment Authority Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and now read a first time. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Financial Regulator Assessment Authority Bill 2021, Financial Regulator Assessment Authority Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills be narrowed a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading uh, speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The president has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence: Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021 and Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Cost Recovery Bill. 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, be taken together and narrowed a first time. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021. Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Cost Recovery Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Broadcasting Legislation Amendment 2021 Measures No. 1, Bill 2021, for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to broadcasting and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 115, subsection 3, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 17th of June 2021. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding a further six bills for concurrence in accordance with the list at item 16 of today's order of business and the Treasury Laws Amendment Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Competition and Consumer Amendment, Motor Vehicle Service and Repair Information Sharing Scheme Bill 2021, Higher Education Support Amendment, Extending the Student Loan Fee Exemption Bill 2021, Private Health Insurance Amendment, Income Thresholds Bill 2021, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures No. 3 Bill 2021, Sydney Harbour Federation Trust Amendment Bill 2021, Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021, and move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House representatives as follows, informing the Senate that the House has, 
agreed to the Special Recreational Vessels Amendment Bill 2021 without amendment and agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility Amendment Extension and Other Measures Bill 2021 and informing the Senate of the appointment of, of Mr Cunningham to the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 10 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill 2020, <coughs> in Committee of the Whole, considering the amendment moved by Senator Keneally. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, um, Acting, De Acting Deputy President. Look, I just want to draw back to um, questions we're asking about, and particularly regarding um, foreign seafarers, but also uh, comparing those foreign seafarers with and the MCV card um, with what um, to the MSIC card. And I just want to draw attention that you know, there was an article um, just on the 12th of March which went through a particular bust that was done of cocaine importers, alleged cocaine, cocaine importers, um, but they have the cocaine, so not so alleged. What we've got is the Australian Federal Police Commander Kirsty Schofield, um, and then we've got uh, the Australian Border Force Acting Commander Gary Lowe, and the New South Wales Police State Crime Command Director, Detective Chief Superintendent Darren Bennett, all which appear to have played a key role in uh, busting this group, and I congratulate them for the work they've done. But I want to draw your attention to this question about what, what the circumstances are for these M6 and uh, MVCs. Because what, happens, what appears to have happened in this particular uh, sorry story is that not only was there hundreds of thousands of dollars many hundreds of thousands of dollars um, uh, in uh, cocaine seized, but also um, they located $100,000 in a shed in New South Wales. Um, they further went on to find um, other evidence that said that the estimated value of the kilogram block per kilogram block was 230000 but could attract two to three times that amount on the street. They talked about the fact this, and this is probably the critical question because it comes back to, again, M6, which is required for, expected by employers in the, seat, in the shipping industry. They expect them to have M6 cards. They expect their workforce to be able to walk in any secure area on and off the port. So they all have M6. They're expected to have M6. It's part of the conditions of them um, performing um, their duties, um, and of course, you know, of course, a lot of those employees are also law-abiding, along with the workforce, that they are more than happy to have M6, because it actually goes through detailed requirements that are required from checks from um, from various parties, which I'm about to ask the minister about. Um, and then, of course, what it does raise is a serious concern about those that don't have M6 cards these foreign seafarers, which are doing now more and more of the local shipping around Australia's coast and, of course, plying in and out of our ports around this country. Now, with regard, regarding the joint agency operation I mentioned before, it marks the, it, in the quote it marks the third time authorities have nabbed boats attempting to import large quantities of cocaine since the pandemic crisis started. But the method of at-sea transfers isn't anything new. That at-sea transfer is a well-known method that a lot of organised crime groups use. What certainly has changed is the way in which we actually 
have to deal with these sorts of vessel importations when they arrive on our shore. There's a real COVID overlay that we have to apply, particularly if crew on the vessels are from a foreign country. So it talks about the complexity, but also talks most importantly about the fact that this is one of three major busts that have randomly been discovered um, purely by um, some intelligence, one, this one case, intelligence overseas. But also it goes to the point that a lot of the seafarers, in actual fact, all the seafarers that are potentially involved in this particular illegal activity, for those that are, that they have not got an MSIC pass. They have not been properly checked about what their what um, you know, ASIO might think of them, what uh, criminal intelligence, um, importantly in Australia, might have um, information that is only available to the Immigration um, Department, or Home, Department of Home Affairs, about in immigration checks. So all these things aren't as regular go-to by uh, these inspections that are taking place for maritime crew visas, because if they were. What we would see is that the average, not just the 80 per cent that takes nearly three weeks, at least an average three weeks, 15 working days, three weeks to act on, not only the six-week average and some that go to three months and six months, somehow in the case of maritime visa holders that were able to turn around and say that they have the capacity to come up with the answers within 24, 48 hours that all those checks we do on Australian crew, and often appropriate checks, I've given some examples where it's not been appropriate. You know, we one occasion where a person had been working in the industry in some, when he was uh, some uh, many decades ago, was involved in a fight at a very young age, and every year he goes to get his, his card, there's a further delay. Now, he's given evidence to the Senate inquiry more than once. I congratulate him for having that um, that uh, peace of mind to come forward and be open to open scrutiny of everybody to say that these are the circumstances that I find myself in. And when I try to get my security pass, it's delayed, it's delayed, and it's delayed. And we've seen him miss ships as a result of it. So we go back to this question about MSIC and ASICs and about the different two standards that are applying. So we've got ammonium nitrate carried around our borders, all around this country. You know, the ammonium nitrate, you know, two and a half thousand tonnes, which you know, blew a huge hole in Beirut, but most importantly and most horrifically, not only uh, substantial financial damage, but loss of life, loss of limb, loss of uh, injuries that occurred as a result of that ammonium nitrate exploding. Well, we see examples where ammonium nitrate is now being moved all around this country by foreign seafarers, none of which have a, they don't have a 15-day wait, you know, working days, that's actually three weeks, but 15-day working days. They don't have six weeks, they don't have three months, they don't go to six months. They get their licence within 48 hours. And what's clear in this, the way that it's approached by the government, and that is that there is a failing to turn around and properly check the people are the most dangerous individuals, potentially, that are applying drugs on our borders. And of course, you know, the government argues that's all too expensive. Well, too expensive to do that. Well, what about the lives that are affected? What about the fact that we don't take action to make sure that drug importation and uh, weapons are not imported in this country? It's appropriate to turn around to make sure that these same crews, the Maritime crew visa is extended to has the same obligations or similar obligations to what MSIC has. Because when you're off a ship, as we spoke about this morning, Geelong, you know, two people now have left a ship. They can't be found. I gather they are um, MCVs because they're certainly not MSICs. Because MSIC will require even further detailed checks. And we've got people now roaming around the countryside as a result of the inappropriate systems we have to know what is actually happening on those ships that are coming to and from our ports. Three separate major cocaine busts. Was there any minister, uh, acting, uh, 
Minister um, acting on behalf of uh, the government, I just want to go, go ask this question. Can you step us through um, the MC card, which was we got part of the way through before question time came up, and then through the maritime uh, crew visa, and highlight the differences between the two? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, so um, the MCV currently involves an assessment of the following in relation to a visa applicant. Uh, it involves character concerns, including an assessment of criminality, security concerns on advice from ASIO, risks relating to weapons of mass destruction, uh, any, uh, whether there's any debts to the Commonwealth, has complied uh, with previously held visas, poses fraud risks and holds a valid passport. Now, the ASIC MSIC uh, background check currently consists of an assessment of the applicant's identity, a full security assessment from ASIO, a criminal history check uh, by uh, ACIC, which involves obtaining a full criminal history of the applicant and assessing that against relevant eligibility, and an immigration check where required uh, by the Department of Home Affairs. Uh, whilst there is a degree of overlap between the MCV and ASIC MSIC checks, they are undertaken for different purposes and in relation to different risks. An MCV check is tailored to a temporary visa to enter Australia. The ASIC MSIC checks are more detailed assessments of people with an ongoing need for unsupervised access to the secure areas of Australia's ports and airports. Senator Sheldon. Uh, Deputy Acting President. Just want to go to the question of um, you, you raised that in the case of um, maritime crew visas that there is a assessment of the character um, and could you just step me through what the assessment is of the character of the individual, how that's actually formulated, like who, who's contacted, do they, do they ring up the, um, the captain, you know, like Sal, was, um, so what was Salas? Salas. Captain Salas. How could I forget? They ring up Captain Salas and wait for an email from him that he sends off to head office? Or how do, what's the process that's applied for these appropriate checks that you say are appropriate? Minister. All right. Thank you. I'm advised uh, that strict qualifying criteria apply to all online applications to maintain the integrity of the department's border management and enable the department to control volumes of applications. Pre-COVID, around 280,000 MCVs uh, were granted per year. Now, applicants must be outside Australia at the time of application, but the application may be finalised when the applicant is on shore. Applicants are checked against the central movement alert list, uh, which checks biographical data, such as name or passport number, for matches against specific people or documents of concern, uh, will refer an MCV application with either a mal match or a potential match for manual processing. Applications are also checked against the Safeguard system, which is a rules-based risk profiling system that alerts processing officers to risks and suggests potential treatments, such as further document fraud checks, site visits or interviews may also refer an application to MGPC for manual processing. Checks against these systems run automatically several times during application processing, so that applications are frequently checked against the latest contents of the risk systems. Discretionary checks can also be performed by the processing office. If an applicant does not meet the relevant requirements after a manual assessment, the application is refused and the applicant is advised. An application which has either been auto-granted or manually granted may also be ceased under subsection 33b3. The decision maker may make a written declaration for the purposes of this section that it is undesirable that a person or any persons in a class of persons travel to and enter Australia or remain in Australia. Senator Sheldon. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I was going to this question then on the MCV. Maybe in, in, in layman's terms, or maybe I might even understand it then. Um, heaven forbid anyone else listening to it might understand it. Why does it take six weeks to do an investigation of the average person who gets an MSIC or ASIC card? And why does it only take 24, 48 hours? Because it's clear to me, and most normal thinking person would say that 
one's more thorough and one's less thorough. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so during 2020, Auscheck processed 85 per cent of the 59,814 ASIC and 40,941 MSIC applications received uh, within 15 business days, including the time spent with external checking partners. Uh, this represents almost uh, 10 per cent improvement in processing over 2019, where 77 per cent of applications were processed within 15 business days. An ASIC MSIC background check consists of verifying an applicant's identity, criminal history check, a national security check, and a migration status check where required. Uh, where a complex criminal history is returned, Auscheck may be required to contact local jurisdictional courts to seek additional information to ensure accuracy within the assessment process. These complexities may require additional processing time and are beyond Auscheck's control. Senator. Well, I just want to just go to one of the Parts of the, thank you for that, um, that um, answer. Uh, the migration status um, that, that may be required to be checked, um, what's, on what basis is it required or not required to be checked? Um, if you're an Australian citizen, uh, it obviously wouldn't need to be checked. Uh, and if you're not an Australian citizen, uh, it would be a check uh, to make sure you have the appropriate uh, visa. Senator. Good. Thank you very much. And, that's, and that, I gather that um, is applying to so that there is a, um, if they're not Australian citizens, then there isn't a migration check. Full stop. Is that just what is that what happens? If I understand it correctly. Minister. Yeah. Senator. So we don't do a migra migration check on them. We don't put it through the system. What's the other reasons why it takes just 24, 48 hours in comparison with doing what is lengthy um, in, in investigations into, um, and I'm saying inappropriate investigations, but they are lengthy, sometimes too lengthy investigations into um, Australian crews. Minister. Uh, thank you. So, uh, while an MCV can be granted in 48 hours, it is important to note that the MSIC and MCV schemes operate for two very different purposes and undertake different checks. Well, they do. The MSIC scheme operates for the purpose of access to security zones, uh, whilst the MCV operates for the purpose of immigration entry and stay rights, where a foreign seafarer requires unsupervised access to a maritime security zone, they must have an MCV and MSIC. Any evidence of people accessing a maritime security zone without holding an MSIC or being supervised by an MSIC holder should be reported to the Department for Investigation. During the 2020 calendar year, Auscheck processed 85 per cent of ASIC and MSIC applications within 15 days. Minister, uh, sorry, Senator. Good. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, what, what beca what's becoming clear, and that is that we have a situation where we've got three major drug busts, kilos upon kilos upon kilos of cocaine coming into the country. On those occasions, it's been identified that it's foreign crewed ships. We've got ammonium nitrate that exists applying around our borders that have been, coast, been taken from coastal port to coastal port by foreign crews. We've got people that are on MCVs that are given the, what appears to be the tick and flick. And then we've got Australian seafarers who have a thorough check, and a thorough check is not inappropriate. In actual fact, we're in agreement with the government that the thorough check should, be, should take place. What we're in disagreement about is that the vast majority of people who are actually plying on our coastal shipping and coming into our waters and our ports are not checked for being terrorists in an appropriate fashion or checked for criminality. Because there is no sensible way, on the descriptions that we've just had, that there could possibly be the same detailed checks that take place on those particular crews. 
Now, you would think that there would be like high dangerous areas that you would actually be making considerations about. You were considering about you know, when, as has been um, suggested by uh, amendment uh, from, from Labor, they're looking at important areas of where there's vulnerability. And of course, the MCV is one of those very fundamental areas where there is vulnerability. We should be turning around and making sure that those people are held to account. If they are doing something wrong, many of them aren't. But there is enough doing it to see thousands of kilos of cocaine over a period of time, over years, come through our borders. And it's not being, uh, as we saw in that example I gave just a few minutes ago at Port Botany in, only in March this year, it's coming from people that are going out to these ships, these foreign crude ships, and bringing in multi, multi amounts of cocaine and uh, illegal gotten gains and monetary gotten gains uh, into our, um, into our, onto our shores. So it is clear that we have to make sure that we have a proper and robust system. And what, I, what I'm not clear, and that is that does the government agree with the Department of Immigration and Border Protection 2017 finding that and I read, there, was, there are features of flag of convenience registration regulation and practice that organised crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit, reduce transparency or secrecy surrounding complex financial and ownership arrangements are factors that can make FOC ships more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organised crime or terrorist groups. This means the FOC ships may be used in a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling and facilitating prohibited imports or exports. So does the government agree that the Department of Immigration is right? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, so it is imperative that the government put measures in place to prevent serious crime for the safety and security of all Australians. Now, this bill was developed in response to a number of independent reviews that recognised the critical vulnerability created by serious and organised criminals exploiting the ASIC and M6 schemes for criminal purposes. The government acknowledges that flags of convenience ships can also pose a risk to the maritime environment that can be exploited by organised crime groups. The government regularly reviews the aviation and maritime environments to address all vulnerabilities and to strengthen aviation and maritime security. Senator. Sir. Look, look just, just following from your answer there, the, you've, you said that the monitoring by the government of the, you know, what's the appropriate security levels that should be existing um, at our ports. Um, when was the last time the MCVs were, were monitored? and what reports were given regards the MCV monitoring about its deficiencies and efficiencies? Um, I'm advised uh, no specific review, uh, but the government is regularly um, updating uh, and considering uh, all of those visa settings. Senator. Thank you, Deputy Acting President. So now, now we learn that there's no review of our borders when it comes to MCVs. Three ships coming into our country, and there is no review on the MCVs when people are throwing off drugs into, uh, into sister ships and coming into our ports. So there's been no review of the MCV. And this, doesn't this just demonstrate the importance of making sure that they get off their backside and start turning around and taking this seriously? Because if you really throw your mind back, a lot of this was thrown up over a period of time about when in the, in the, in the uh, guys of doing something for national security, then the guys are doing something for serious crimes, and then turning around and saying, well, actual fact, we're not worrying about the ones that are the worst, 
We're not worrying about the people that are actually committing the crime on these foreign vessels, these foreign crews. Look, it seems absolutely logical that the, that the government should be doing a proper investigation, and it's important in light of what we've been discussing with uh, amendments, that the MCV, which hasn't been reviewed, gets reviewed. The MCV, which has seen multiple uh, players involved in drug importation, don't have the same requirements as ASIC and MSIC cards. And it's not because the ASIC or MSIC should be changed. As a matter of fact, we've already indicated the importance of, this of the, um, the ASIC and MSIC card in the past. But it's about how you actually turn around and make our borders safe. And making it safe isn't talking about we regular review, whether we have a review, whether we should have a review. It is actually reviewing. You know, we, we've, got, we've got examples you know, slapping you in the face in March with a huge importation of cocaine. You know, an extremely good job done by you know, um, joint forces um, to try to deal with that particular incident. But the people are on MCVs. There isn't appropriate checks. So I just want to just um, turn to one other, one other issue is about, um, before I might well come back to the um, MCV question. But last year, at one time, there were eight Rio Tinto ships off the coast of Queensland. Four were Australian vessels with Australian crew. The other four were flag of convenience vessel, vessels with foreign crew. Why are these crew not required to hold an MSIC? Minister. Um, thank you. The reason is because only anyone seeking to have unescorted access to secure areas of airports or seaports uh, needs an ASIC or an MSIC, uh, regardless of their nationality. Senator. Thank you, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, um, Minister. Well, doesn't this go to the heart of things? Like, so what what's being suggested here is that we should go to the criminals and ask them, do you want an MSIC card or an ASIC card? And when they say no, we do nothing. You know, like the whole idea of having security checks on people is having an appropriate security check. Like the people who are actually involved in criminal activity don't ask for MSICs. You'd be surprised the things that criminals do get up to. They won't even abide by a regulation about asking for an MSIC because you're going to walk off unescorted. I mean, heaven forbid, next I'll be importing hundreds of kilos of cocaine and bringing in guns and weapons and various other threats to this country. I mean, it seems absolutely illogical that there'd be a situation where we have, in the case of Rio Tinto ships off the coast of Queensland last year, as I said, four were Australian vessels. And to the credit of both the crew and those companies that run those vessels, they made sure that people had MSIC cards because they know they want the extra check. They want it to be safe. They want it to be secure. They want people to actually work efficiently on their ports. All things which are of high merit. But when you go to the other four, the flag of convenience, doing the exact same types of work for Rio Tinto, doing the exact same types of work, funnily enough, those companies don't want or require M6 to be taken out. In actual fact, those crew members don't want M6 taken out either. Funnily enough, maybe because it's just a bit too, you know, takes a little bit of time. Or maybe because they're criminals that can't turn around and be held to account in this country under the system that we're applying at the moment, unless you actually apply for an M6, which requires a more rigorous approach to the oversight of those plying our borders all around this country. You know, I want to then ask the minister that is the minister telling the parliament that every single foreign crew people who are not required to have an MSIC are never left unattended in secure areas of ports? Minister. 
Yeah, thank you. So the reason we have these screening processes for people with M6 is because they have unescorted access to secure areas. Uh, where, where there is evidence of someone uh, illegally accessing uh, those areas, of course, that, that should be uh, reported. But the whole purpose of the scheme uh, is to make sure that those who do have access to these particularly sensitive and particularly secure areas uh, are given, are given uh, particularly rigorous uh, background checking. Senator. Thank you. Minister, um, <clears throat> I was hoping not to go down this path to have to regurgitate, but with the greatest respect, we have a different minister at the table, so I think it's imperative that we take a few. It's it, it, very important we take a few steps back, so you can get a handle on what's going on. So what we do know in this nation that when the ships come in, foreign ships with foreign crews, foreign flag vessels or flags of convenient vessels, within 24 to 48 hours, an email is sent off to ABF and said this is who was on this ship, and then the ABF go off and they have a little uh, check, background checks, to make sure that no flags come up. And what the minister was trying to tell us that everything's tickety boo, everything's Mickey Mouse. With the greatest respect to minister, so you understand understand that uh, the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee had some five, I think, four, five, no, might have been five inquiries into this. I also spoke to the Greens and the cross benches when this bill was before us months ago, back in March, very t similar around the time when that big heap of cocaine fell off the mothership and was picked up by the small fishing vessel and said that, hang on, we've got to look a little bit further into this, you see, because we have a very filthy stain on our maritime history that only goes back a few years. And it was a ship called the Sage Sagittarius. And you should know, Senator Sasselger, what actually happened on the Sage Sagittarius under the leadership of his captain, the captainship of Captain Salas for the Filipino. So what actually happened was just on its way to Australia, not far out of port, some one of the crew members fell overboard, went missing, tragic, terrible. As the ship was coming into, and I thought it was Newcastle, but I'll stand correct if it was Botany or whatever it was, just prior to it coming in the heads, and I mean within hours, another crewman head first down into the um, bottom of the ship, dead. So you see it was owned by a Japanese. So the Japanese owned the ship and thought, what are we going to do? There's something mysterious going on on this ship. So what they did was they engaged a... Um, and I hope you are taking it in, Senator Sasselja, because I'm going to put the same questions I put to you, the previous minister, who was um, given the wrong information and I believe didn't provide the right answer to the Senate. I'm not suggesting for one minute purposely misled the Senate. The Senate was not told the truth. So um, have a good listen here. So what actually happened was the uh, Japanese got the undercover detective or inspector and agent, put him on the ship disguised as a seafarer, went off, it left uh, Australia's shores, it headed back to, and Chair, you would remember this vividly, uh, uh, headed back to Japan just as the ship berthed and they were unloading, somehow the undercover detective fell into the, uh, the hopper, the loading, the, you know, the conveyor belt, killed. Two deaths, one missing overboard. But you see, the worst part about this was before Captain Salas left our shores, Captain Salas admitted to gun running and bootlegging alcohol, illegally uh, selling alcohol. So you see, when Senator Sheldon asked the questions of ministers and department officials, how rigid and how solid are these background checks? We expect that they are rigid and they are solid. How the hell we can find that out in 24 to 48 hours still baffles me. You see, because what we have worked out here, Minister, is if there is a red flag, if someone has been caught doing something illegally and the name on the passport that, ma passport that matches the face brings up a red flag, then, yeah, oh, well, aren't we great? We can stop this. The truth of the matter is you, the government, have no idea if we, are, if we are criminals are mixing on these ships, if they haven't been caught mixing before. How the hell we can, in this chamber, delay the passage of legislation because we want to have a greater look into this to see that you want to do this properly. The same damn time you would have thought Labor concocted this, where a big heap of cocaine went off the side of a ship so we could say, see, there you go. It happened, but there it is. I asked the previous minister, who were the seafarers on that ship? Do we have the names? Are there investigations? 
Still waiting for an answer. I'm hoping someone will come back to me. And also, Minister, when I asked the previous minister at the, in the position you're in with the, uh, with the advisers there in the box, and I clearly said I don't hold these advisers, these advisers uh, culpable because I'd said very, very clearly there is a minister in this place who no longer has the portfolio, Minister Dutton, who knows every filthy, sneaky, dirty little thing that happened on the Sage Sagittarius. And yet he's been conveniently transferred to another one. You would think that he would pass on the info all the way down the chain so the new advisers get to know, the department officials get to know what he knows and what we know, the Senate committee that did the inquiry. So you see our frustration here, Minister, when we say to Minister Cash earlier on, so can you guarantee us 100 per cent kosher? You know if there's anything gone wrong, that if there is a criminality or criminal uh, conviction or there's uh, accusations around these foreign seafarers coming in, you would have a red flag that goes up. Now, the minister said very clearly, and I'll stand corrected if I'm wrong, no, we had nothing on Captain Salas. There was no dramas. Captain Salas admitted gun running. Captain Salas admitted bootlegging alcohol and selling alcohol. Captain Salas left our shores. Now, Minister, here's the crunch, and be very, very careful, please, because I don't want to see you getting done for something that you innocently might walk into. You see, because there was, in, uh, you know, in his absence, the New South Wales coroner were doing an investigation in Sydney. And they couldn't find Captain Salas. ABF couldn't find Captain Salas. AFP couldn't find Captain Salas. The state jurisdictions couldn't find Captain Salas. It was a couple of years in between the deaths of these three, or the two deaths in the missing seafarer that went overboard, to when this this uh, New South Wales coroner's court was going on. And at the smoke o break, you see they were going to pull up stumps. They were going to say we can't go any further because we can't find Captain Salas. But lo and behold, in the audience, there was a journo who writes for one of the News Corp rags up the coast, there on the south coast somewhere, Owen Jacques. Owen Jacques was in the room. Owen Jacques went up to the prosecutor at the Spoko break and said, I can tell you, sir, where Captain Salas is. All our agencies couldn't tell us, and our spooks and everyone else, but, but Owen Jacques could tell us. Because you know why, Minister? He went to that magnificent thing called the internet. He punched out whatever it was that he punched out. And blow and behold, there's Captain Salas, and he's they could tell you the ship he was coming on and what port he was going into. And I believe he was going into Gladstone. But it also showed that he had been in and out of Gladstone and Weeper on a number of occasions. So Minister Cash was advised that there was nothing on Captain Salas. That's why his name never popped up and they couldn't find him. So I will very, very, very carefully ask again, how the hell can we and the rest of Australia actually, without the help of Owen Jacques, how can we believe this government, that your 24-hour or 48-hour faxes where your stringent border checks or background checks on these seafarers can make us rest assured in the Australian population, all 25 million of us, be really, really confident that you know what's coming in this nation, who's coming in this nation. How can you tell us that, Minister, when the previous minister sat where you are, stood up and answered that that couldn't happen because they didn't have anything on Captain Salas? The rest of the world that followed this inquiry knew what was going on with Captain Salas. Owen Jacques, the reporter, knew where Captain Salas was. So you see, Minister, I ask you one more time, following on from the questions that Senator Sheldon asked, can you stand up there in front of this Senate here and categorically tell us that you, the government, know every single person coming on our shores. They are the face on the passport. They have no criminality because your checks are rock solid and they, they, nothing will get past you. Minister. I will thank you. Uh, and Senator, uh, given you've already asked the question of uh, Minister Cash and the answer's been given, uh, I don't intend to add anything to the answer. Yeah, that's a shame because I still say that the Senate was misled on its answers. Take it however you want, push it further up the chain. I'm happy to confront any committee in this, this, this Senate to put forth my case and the appropriate minister can defend themselves because I look forward to it. So let me bring you to another debacle. And this goes back on another debacle. I can't believe this myself. You know? Every time we seem to be talking about the transport security amendments in this place, something goes to, turns to custard. So here we have today. News breaking that two Asian crew members have snuck off a cargo ship docked at the Geelong port. So before I go any further, and I'm going to go further, can someone please tell me 
Is the Geelong port an MC port, or is it one of those ones that falls through the gap and you don't have to have M6? Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm advised uh, that uh, the Geelong Port, I think it is, um, uh, it, uh, would uh, be a secure area for the purposes of an M6 um, based, on, based on risk assessments at particular times, depending on uh, what ships I think are coming in. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Okay. This makes it worse then. So what we are well aware of and the whole world knows, I and mean, if you haven't known, you've got to know now, that two Asian crew members snuck up the cargo ship docked at the Geelong port. And this was more than 60 hours ago. Now I'll go back to when this email came through, so it's probably 65 hours by now, or even longer. No, no, about 60, 62 hours. So they've snuck off a ship called the Glorious Plumeria. Uh, 60 hours ago and disappeared. So then I would ask, I would ask, Minister, while you have listened to my case, previous ministers have listened to what the senators on this side have been putting, how can anyone now stand up without cracking up or falling into a pile because they've been caught out fibbing? Tell us that there's an M6 port and two Asian crew members have snuck off not a score. Were they escorted off by MSIC people? I don't know. Enlighten us, please. Minister. Um, I'm advised that in relation to the specific case, the ABF uh, will investigate. Senator Stirl. Well, Chair, you know, I was ready for that piddly little response because I was, uh, while we draw piddly, pathetic, sorry, I do I respect you as the chair. I was expecting that pathetic. So here we go, Australia, 25 million Aussies, nothing to see here. 2 a.m. in the morning they snuck off the ship in an M6 car, uh, port you know, where they're supposed to be escorted because we got eyes on everything, no one gets past us. But I'll raise another one here. And I want the 25 million Australians in this nation to see through See through the bulldust that comes from that side of the chamber. You talk up a big fight on, on security, you're full of bulldust. There you go. I was rather restrained there for you, Chair. Okay, now here's another one, you see, because what we're very clearly told, very clearly told, because you see, Senator Sheldon and myself and our good mate and the Chair and Senator Barry O'Sullivan, we lived and breathed this stuff for, for, for a couple of years, you see, because they couldn't wait to tell us. The, the, the government departments couldn't wait to tell us. As part of the here's my you but tickety boo, I wouldn't lie to you, email 48 hours or 24 hours out. But I'm gonna, the ship's captain keeps, I don't know if you know this minister, but you will in a minute. All passports are kept secured in a safe on the ship. Now I'll give you the opportunity, Minister, to consult with the uh, the officials in the box there. Am I right? Minister. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I thank you, uh, Mr Acting President. Look, anyone seeking to have unescorted access to secure areas of airports and seaports needs an ASIC or an MSIC, regardless of the nationality, as I've pointed out. Now, Labor is clearly, I think, in this filibuster, uh, seeking to muddy the waters. And no surprises there, because they don't want to support this legislation. There's no Australian government requirement for all Australian seafarers to hold an MSIC. An MSIC ensures the holder has been background checked and allows the holder to be unescorted inside a maritime security zone. Senator Stirl. Chair. 
Thank you. I'm actually starting to feel sorry for you, Senator Seselja. I know it's not in my character, but I am starting to feel sorry for you because you're only reading what's being handed to you. And I understand you have many strengths in this, in this building. Shipping's not one of them, or foreign shipping. Let me tell you this. Let's get this very clearly. As you said, this is an M6 port. These people did not have M6, and nor did I even try to attempt to mislead you by saying they had M6. But you see what I did say, Minister, and I really would like you to have a real good think before a piece of paper flicks over that just is completely off the planet. A fax would have come in, supposed to have come in, with all the names, 48 or 24 day, four hours out to sea, of who was on the Julia Plum, uh, what was it called? The Glorious Plumeria, you see. But as I said to you, Minister, we know this. The world knows this. Australia knows this. Everyone knows this. That the part of the uh, uh, opportunity or the um, receival ship of a, a maritime crew visa. So for you, Minister, not an MSIC, a maritime crew visa for a foreign flag, uh, a foreign seafarer, the passports are to be kept securely locked in a safe in the captain's quarters or the cap on the ship somewhere. That is fact, Minister. So while your people are having a look there, I ask you once again, could I have got this wrong? Passport. That is correct. Senator Stowe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. So, Minister, while I am feeling sorry for you and I do appreciate your honesty, um, I have to raise this for the world, for the 25 million Australians to know, because what we have been told very, very clearly is that the two Asian crew members who snuck off the glorious plumeria, they think around 2 a.m. on Sunday morning, and the ship sailed at 3 p.m. today, their passports were missing out of the security box, stroke safe, whatever it may be. So I come back to this. How can we, as concerned Australians, who all want to unite to do everything to stop the insidious trade of drugs into our nation and weapons and all that, can seriously take this government with our hand on our heart saying, you've got it all worked out, Nothing's going to get past you. This is before I even start talking about where the freight moves, because it ain't going. It ain't the, the M6 card holders running around the port moving these drugs. These are going on the backs of trucks in containers. So I come back to my question, Minister: How can we take how can we take this government serious that you have a handle, and how is this legislation going to stop that sort of um, criminal behaviour? Minister. Ah, thank you. Uh, so um, I thank the senator for the question. Um, in terms of the specifics you're talking about, uh, the ABF will, of course, investigate those specifics, and I wouldn't make any further comment uh, in relation to that uh, on uh, the government. But when it comes to our record, uh, this is a government that has had a record that is the envy of those opposite when it comes to securing our borders. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we, can, we could go over the, the years and years of history uh, to show uh, that it is a coalition government uh, that takes these issues seriously and it is those uh, opposite who operate an open borders approach. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And when it comes to securing our borders or when it comes to dealing uh, with serious and organised crime, uh, we've demonstrated our bona fides. You know, we've seen in relation to oper Operation Ironside uh, just this week. Uh, organised criminals uh, are taking advantage and we are doing everything we can to stop them. Uh, and, it, and serious crime is a major threat to our, our way of life. And that's what this legislation is about. It's about saying that those who are going to have unescorted access to secure areas will have to undergo uh, these kind of serious checks. Now, it's, it's interesting from the Labor Party that they seek to delay this legislation, that they seek to now filibuster, that they seek to talk about anything other than the actual legislation that is now before the Senate. 
and because they haven't been able to explain uh, why they don't believe we should be delivering these reforms. They'll point to all sorts of other things that they might like to improve that they didn't improve when they were in government eight years ago. Uh, well, that's fine. Have that debate, but it's transparently clear that this is simply about them not wanting to bring this to a vote. They don't want to see it come to a vote because uh, they don't want to be on the wrong side of this. And so they need to now make the argument as to why they're going to vote against this. Or are they not? Are they just going to, are they just going to draw it out and draw it out and draw it out and then maybe eventually vote for it? Are they going to sort of have, have a bet each way? That's what they seem to be doing here, because they're throwing up a lot of red herrings. Uh, that aren't about what this legislation is actually about. It is actually about having proper security checking, proper vetting for those who have unescorted access to these areas. And we've explained the differences and we've explained the different checks through the detailed questions that were asked by Senator Sheldon. So we can see what's going on. Thank you for the lectures. Uh, when it comes to border security, we will compare our record over yours any day of the week, absolutely any day of the week. And the Australian people. Uh, you keep referring to the 25 million Australians listening. That's optimistic. But regardless of who is, who is listening, of how many are listening, uh, any of them would know uh, that this Liberal national government uh, has an, a, an enviable record on keeping our borders safe. Uh, those opposite, when they were last in government, couldn't be trusted. And it was one of the reasons the Australian people got rid of them. Senator Stirl. Chair, thank you very much. I would like to correct the record now. I don't feel sorry for you. Now, now we're going to have some real open debate here, all right? Because you've just proved, Minister, that your pay packet will guide you, not the common sense. Whatever you get be paid, you'll parrot the, the, the line when you've got no proper answer. So let's come back to this. I want to use your words, Minister, not mine. I wrote them down. You talked about, because I asked you about these two Chinese people that scurried off this ship at 2 a.m. in the morning, disappeared. Nothing to do with MSIC. They would have had maritime crew visas. You couldn't answer that. You, help, you hid behind border force. We'll have an inspection. And yeah, 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 okay. And then you use words unvetted access to these areas. Uh, so I assume you mean the port where the two Chinese um, seafarers had scurried off. <laughs> Hey, hey, how good is this? If I want something off a ship, I only got to walk in at 2am in the morning. Is that what I got to do? Because no one's watching, no one's there. Is that what happens on our ports, Minister? While well, you want to start going to the bottom of the barrel and talking about the difference between organised crime or those poor devils that want to seek a better life here in Australia, you want you got into the gutter, Minister. You want to get into the gutter with me? You want to be very? You want to get into that? I'm happy to take that challenge up with you. You also used these words, Minister. You also said. And I know you're referring. I assume you're referring to all seafarers, but in particular the two Chinese whose um, passports were missing out of the safe. And I don't know how they got access to the safe. And is anyone going to ask how they got access to the safe? Is anyone dragging the captain in to ask what's going on? You said this. So they undergo these serious checks. <laughs> oh shoot! Serious checks. You're telling us you have serious checks and you've got two Chinese that have scurried off an M6 port? This is, oh look, Hollywood can't write comedy. Oh look, the, the Brits are funny people, they couldn't. You can puff and blow as much as you like, Minister. But see, if you want to take on someone who's been working in this area for the last eight years, done all these inquiries, get your facts right. Because if you can beat me with the facts, you know, I'll be the first one to put my hand up. You say we're filibusting. We're the ones that have seriously said we want to do this, we want to do this properly. I'm asking the same questions because two Chinese, under your watch, Minister, are now roaming around our nation with their passports. You have no idea who they are. You have no idea how they got off the port. You have no idea uh, uh, who's connected. There are a series of questions here that the media have asked Border Force to. And I'm I'm going to start reading them because you know what? I'd love to know if you could answer this. These are the questions. Who are the men you're now searching for? We don't have any names. Why you're in the gutter, Minister? Why don't you drag yourself up for a little bit, get your head above the little the, the, the mud line and start listening to this because you see a lot of people thinking this. What's the personal details of these people? What is their description? Do you know? We just know they're two Asians. Can you provide photos of them? You haven't got hey, hey, how's this one? You haven't got their passports. This will be interesting. So how the hell are you going to know what they look like? Oh, this, oh my goodness, this is going to start hurting my head. Do you have an answer? Do you think you have an answer? Do you think you can pop find two Asian people in Australia Senator with no passports and you know who you're looking for? Senator resume your seat.
It being 7.20 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. The committee reports to the Senate, and I propose that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Earlier this year, I spoke of an iron curtain falling around our region, from Mandalay to Moresby, from Manila to Melbourne. Communist China is intent on domination, not through the traditional means of military warfare, but through three fronts economic, political and cultural repression with the no matrix of cyber warfare. While China has continued with its wolf warrior diplomacy and while territorial concerns continue to be raised, including in seas off Japan, Vietnam and the Philippines, the Chinese Communist Party government and its military arm have been quietly making strategic acquisitions of another kind, especially in one of our oldest allies, the Philippines. And some of these were laid bare a few weeks ago when President Biden expanded the scope of Executive Order 13959, addressing the threat from securities investments that finance certain companies of the People's Republic of China, originally signed in November last year by President Trump, in order to take additional steps to protect the national security, foreign policy and economy of the United States. This expanded executive order increased the list of Chinese companies banned from United States investments from 31 to 59, a list of Chinese companies that undermine the security or democratic values of the United States and its allies. Mr Acting Deputy President, tonight I want to speak about one of those prohibited companies, China Telecom, and its empire building in the Philippines, one of our oldest allies. According to the United States Federal Communications Commission, the Chinese Communist Party government has substantial control over China Telecom. China Telecom itself describes itself as a main force for building a cyber power, and it is bound by China's national intelligence law, Article 7, which states that any organisation or citizen shall support and assist and cooperate with the state intelligence work in accordance with the law and keep the secrets of the national intelligence work known to the public." End of quote. Particularly of concern is China Telecom's 40 per cent share in Dito Telecommunity, a new multi-billion dollar telecommunications company established in the Philippines. Many are concerned that Dito Telecommunity is a Trojan horse for spying, including on the armed forces of the Philippines and its allies, the United States and Australia. Asia-Pacific consulting firm Creator Tech recently released a study into the new telecommunications operator, and they said, and I quote, China Telecom reports to the China People's Government in, in, in China. This partner of DITO, which describes itself as a main force for building a cyber power, is China's preferred third mobile operator put forward by China's leaders upon the request of President Duterte. This raises serious questions on cyber security, citizens' privacy and national interests. These will have serious repercussions on multiple fronts." End of quote. Creator Tech also noted that this new venture was not happening in isolation. For example, the Chinese Communist Party government also has a stake in the National Grid Corporation in the Philippines, NGCP for short, the corporation in charge of operating, maintaining and developing the country's state-owned power grid, as it is co-owned by the State Grid Corporation of China. Also concerning our proposals in the Philippines under their Senate, including Bill No. 2094 to allow 100 per cent foreign ownership of public utilities, including telecommunications and transportation. Filipino lawmakers are rightly concerned this could allow China to own infrastructure, which is crucial to the Philippines. And when considering how many Australian companies house parts of their businesses in the Philippines, such as call centres, this should ring alarm bells with cyber security experts. Communist China is on the march. We must be awake to the Philippines being one of the first dominoes at risk of falling to the nefarious influence of that, that evil regime in China. Whether in Manila or Maruchidor or Mariba, we must be awake to the threat of Communist China to freedom. Senator Green. 
Uh, thank you. Far North Queensland is facing a housing crisis. People are sleeping in cars. Uh, they're unable to get rental properties. We've got single parents unable to get homes to live in. And we know that overcrowding in Indigenous housing is getting worse. But instead of doing anything to fix this crisis, the member for Leichhardt, Warren Ench, told the ABC recently that he doesn't hold a building licence. That's what he said, that he doesn't hold a building licence. It sounds an awful lot like I don't hold a hose. It was clear that the member for Leichhardt didn't like being asked about why the promise that he made to deliver $105 million of remote housing to far north Queensland hadn't been delivered. One election promise not delivered, but there are so many more. Not one single house has been built with that $105 million, and people are still living in overcrowded housing in Leichhardt. But Mr Ench has a knack for promising big and failing to deliver and then blaming everybody else for his failures. We have seen the same thing with insurance in North Queensland. For years, people in North Queensland have been facing skyrocketing insurance premiums. Some people have given up, choosing to risk having no insurance at all in a cyclone-prone region because they cannot afford the cost of rising insurance. Many people are underinsured because that is all that they can afford. And for so long, the member for Leichhardt has been promising to fix this problem, and the government has had eight long years to do it. But after eight years, numerous inquiries, reports, discussions and speeches and press conferences from the government, we have got a budget handed down that has a, a promised to uh, make an intention to have a reinsurance pool. So not an actual commitment, but an, a commitment to intend to do something. There's people right now who can't afford insurance, and this government is telling them that they need to wait even longer for this commitment to be delivered. Again, lots of photos, lots of headlines, but scant on the detail. No guarantees of reduced premiums, no clear idea as to how to ensure any savings are going to be passed on to consumers, and it won't even start until the next election. What we know is that Mr Ench and the Prime Minister like to come to Cairns and make big promises, but when the details come out, that's when far north Queenslanders understand that this is a government that takes them for granted. Then there's the promise to fix congestion on the Captain Cook Highway and to build the Cairns Western Ontario Road. Before the last election, the member for Leichhardt stood on the Captain Cook Highway and said that he would bust congestion. This is a stretch of road that all Cairns residents know about, especially the residents of the north side of Cairns who sit in their cars every morning for an hour driving at a snail's pace just to make the short journey to the CBD. The member for Leichhardt announced to the community in early 2019, before the election, that this was a game-changer infrastructure project. Lots of po uh, photos, lots of headlines, lots of promises. But how far have we come on this important election promise? Well, of this congestion-busting promise on the Captain Cook Highway, construction has not started, congestion has not been busted. While you're sitting in your cars in traffic in Cairns, Mr Ench is asleep at the wheel. And when it comes to the CWA funding in the latest budget, what we know is this, that it's another election and another roads announcement. But when we asked Senate uh, officials during the Senate estimates process, that they would, uh, how long it would take for this funding to be delivered in Cairns, what we found out is that it is several years away. Most of the funding will not be delivered until 2025-2026. You will have to vote for this government twice before that road is even built. This is another classic example of the member for Leichhardt talking big but glossing over the details and, and the actual delivery. Always there for the photo op, but never there for delivery. And these are just the local issues. In the past few weeks, on national issues alone, Mr Ench has supported the government watering down ARENA so it will no longer be investing only in renewable energy. He stood by and said nothing when Minister Pitt vetoed a wind farm in far north Queensland that would have created two 250 local jobs, and he failed to support the Bilawila family, two girls born in regional Queensland. He's failed to back them and instead blamed the lawyers and the parents instead. 
This is a government that is lazy, plumped Senator up on the Green, pandemic, tired and taking expired. final Queensland. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise this evening to talk about the government's dob seeker hotline. There is no limit to the ways in which this government does their very best to make people on income support lives a nightmare. From robo-debt to mutual obligations, we now have Dobseeker, a hotline for employers and job providers to dob in a person who, according to them and a lot of anecdotal evidence, refuse to take a job they've been offered. Not only is this an abuse of power that will hurt the most vulnerable in our community, there is actually no evidence to support the anecdotal claims of the so-called, in inverted commas, job snobs and people refusing to take work. The employment service system is rife with bullying, harassment of people being ignored or treated very poorly by their job service providers. But instead of dealing with that, the government has empowered employers and job providers with the means to intimidate and bully job seekers. There are currently 245,400 jobs available, with 1.14 million people looking for work. Anybody can do the maths on that. The problem is not the so-called job snobs, it's actually the lack of available work. And then Minister Robert is so keen to demonise and humiliate job seekers that a couple of weeks ago, just after estimates when we were asking about the job seeker loud, uh, line, he proudly announced that there were hundreds of people who had been dobbed into the, to this twisted hotline. Remembering that someone making a phone call to the job seeker line does not mean that the, jobs, that the job seeker is guilty. And when you've got 1.4 million people looking for work, a couple of hundred phone calls is nothing other than an attempt by the government once again to demonise job seekers. There was absolutely no need for him to make that outrageous claims that he did. So many people in this place have a lot to say about those on low income and how we need to be inflicting mutual obligations on them. But not a lot is said about the, jobs, the dodgy job providers and exploitative employers. And I'm not for one minute saying they all are, but there is a lot of dodgy job service providers. We hear crickets from the government on the employment program and providers who are paid a lot of money to find these jobs that in fact don't exist when we have 1.14 million people on job seeker and youth allowance but only 245,400 jobs available and of course businesses are going to be getting swamped with applications there are 1.14 million people looking for work who have to submit 15 job applications um, per month that adds up to millions and millions over 15 million job applications per month, and that's going up to 20 in July. So you can imagine that people are desperate to find work, desperate to get applications in, so employers are dealing with a lot of job applications. This paper pushing for the sake of it is only serves to depress and stress out job seekers. It is completely unmanageable for employers and a ridiculous amount of bureaucracy for the public sector, businesses and small business owners. It's because of the government's ridiculous mutual obligations that businesses are having to deal with this many applications. And, of course, it's ridiculous for people on income support. The employment service system is not fit for purpose with a major problem being the fact that job service providers have to do the compliance on these mutual obligations. They're the ones that have to enforce the compliance rather than assisting people into fulfilling employment pathways. The complaints process for the Job Active system is so poor and opaque, the only way that most people can get an outcome if they have a bad experience with the providers um, is, is um, to go to their local members of parliament or local senators. But employers, employers and provide job service providers, they can just call a hotline to get some help and make a complaint. But try being a job seeker who wants to complain about their employment service provider and the lack of support they're getting. Oh no, nothing, they get, 
very, very little response. The government can spend millions of dollars pursuing the illegal robo-debt scheme Senator with next Seward, to no consequences. Your time has expired. Senator Betts. When a party is devoid of a positive policy platform, it reduces itself to scare campaigns, unsubstantiated scare campaigns. And that is the hapless state in which the Labor Party finds itself. With nothing to offer, Labor regularly reaches into its bag of deceit and pulls out a new Medi-Scare campaign. Devoid of facts, devoid of any moral code, Labor seeks to scare our fellow Australians with campaigns suggesting the Liberals, which have a record of economic management allowing Medicare not only to be sustained but see real growth, is somehow under threat. I'm not sure who the Brains Trust is within Labor, but having failed with it twice, one wonders why they think the Australian people won't see through the dishonesty a third time. Labor operatives are authorising dishonest advertisements depicting the Prime Minister with a pair of scissors cutting up a Medicare card. Why do Labor need such visuals? Because if they quoted actual figures, their narrative would disappear without trace. The latest Liberal budget increases Medicare expenditure yet again, year in, year out, over the budget cycle. Labor's last budget had Medicare expenditure at $19 billion per year. Today it sits at $30 billion, representing a substantial increase in expenditure since Labor lost the support of the Australian people. Bulk billing rates today stand at 88.7 per cent. This Senator represents Brown. a 6.7 per cent increase from 82 per cent over which Labor presided. The compare and contrast the juxtaposition of Labor's record to Liberal achievements as stark is telling and explodes Labor's myth-telling. Labor's continual misrepresentation, distortion and scare tactics are a fact void while being a treasure trove of rhetoric, albeit empty rhetoric. The Labor Brains Trust appears to believe mere repetition obviates the need for evidence. Repetition does not obviate the need for evidence. If anything, it demands, requires, indeed it insists on the provision of evidence to support the rhetoric. The people of Australia deserve nothing less. Recently, our hapless friends in Labor were asserting we were cutting Medicare rebates for hip arthroscopies. The fact this procedure hasn't been listed for six years because there was insufficient clinical evidence to support the public listing of the procedure is willfully and deceptively airbrushed over by Labor, hoping people won't be across the detail. We on this side are across the detail. But we're aware some specialists have been inappropriately claiming other Medicare items for procedures not supported by clinical experts, so we are tightening the guidelines to protect Medicare and preserve Medicare for those in genuine need. So while Labor supports the frauders of Medicare, the Liberals support the true friends of Medicare, namely the Australian people. What Labor won't tell us is the changes to funding, according to Dr John Hall from the Rural Doctors Association, is, I quote, a game changer for rural communities. Any change, any reform, any refinement is cynically lab labelled by Labor as a cut, irrespective that the alterations were suggested by medical experts and will see extra expenditure. The facts in Tasmania show us that we have a bulk billing rate under Medicare of over three quarters of consultations, namely 79.2 per cent. And as for co-payments, we have the lowest rate of payment per visit. Good news in anyone's language. Yet Labor continues unabated, unashamed and unrepentant with its tissue of misrepresentations designed to scare the Australian people. To so cruelly play on Australians' genuine and understandable concern about the cost of health care identifies the bankruptcy and cynicism of Labor's approach. Order. The Tasmanian people can be assured that with the sound economic management of the Liberals, Medicare and our health system will continue to be enhanced 
for their protection and for that of their family. Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And if an Australian citizen is imprisoned abo abroad without just cause, it's an attack on the freedom of all Australians. Today I want to highlight the plight of one particular Australian citizen. He is a 71-year-old and a retired baker. His wife and two sons, who live in Bankstown and Sydney, are desperately worried about his welfare. The reports that have come from inside the prison that despite his age and frail health, the Australian is being subjected to hard labour and is being denied basic health care. In 2019, the man was sentenced to 12 years in prison and his crime was to be a member of an organisation that promotes democracy and human rights. His crime was to disagree with the Vietnamese government. The man is Van Cam Chow. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have both called for him to be released from the Thu Duc prison in Vietnam and for what they say is surely a death sentence. He was arrested in Vietnam on charges of terrorism, but the source of this charge was solely due to his membership of a pro-democracy organisation, Viet Tan. Chow's wife, Trang, told the ABC earlier on this year, I quote, my husband went to Vietnam to monitor the human rights situation on the ground there. Within hours of arriving, he was arrested and I haven't spoken to him since. We miss him so much just to hear his voice, hear that he is okay. would be better than this terrible silence. Well, I want to add my voice to others in this place who have called on the Australian government to do everything in its power to secure the safe return of Mr Chow to his family in Australia. We know that Prime Minister Scott Morrison has sought to build his relationship with, this, with his Vietnamese counterpart. It will be important for the future relationship of our two countries that we can raise challenging issues like this one and urge the government to do what it can to press the case for Mr Chow. Mr Acting Deputy President, a further matter regarding the Vietnamese community and the Australian of Australians of Vietnamese descent contribute to much of our country. There are some 300,000 Australians and Vietnamese her with Vietnamese heritage, and they are rightly proud of this heritage and proud of their history and culture. That is why it was so disappointing to see that the yellow flag, a strong and beloved symbol for many in the Vietnamese community, was recently desecrated in Sydney. A young man was deliberately filmed ripping the flag off a telegraph pole in Sydney's inner west, stamping on it and yelling that the flag should be burned. The video was circulated on social media in what was deliberately a hurtful act, coming one day after the April 30th National Day of Mourning to mark the end of the Vietnam War. Australians should be free to celebrate their heritage and their national days and for their flags to be flown without fear of desecration. I know that the members of the Vietnamese community in Sydney have taken their concerns to local police and to the Department of Home Affairs, as is their right. I share these concerns and would not want to see these kinds of acts continue to cause fear and hurt amongst the Vietnamese community. It is evident that this young man knew what he was doing. It is clear that others deliberately spread this provocation on social media to further inflame the situation. It will ultimately be up to our independent legal system to determine whether or not this act constitutes a crime. But regardless of the outcome, I think we can all agree that there is no place for willful harm like this in our democratic and multicultural society. A democracy that supports the right of everyone, no matter where they were born or where they trace their heritage, to celebrate their national symbols in a climate of tolerance and respect. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise this evening to speak in relation to the need to ensure that Australia's democracy remains a pluralistic, liberal an inclusive democracy which values freedom of thought, worship, association and speech as fundamental rights. Now, there has been much interest in the media regarding a story about people of the Christian faith being denied membership of the Liberal Party in South Australia this week. I don't support this decision. In my view, it sets an undemocratic and dangerous precedent in politics and says to the world at large that exclusion of Christians is okay. 
But there is much larger proposition here at play, and one which is worth considering, because, of course, the first organised Roman persecution of Christians was ordered by the Emperor Nero in 64 AD, who blamed the Christians for the Great Fire of Rome. And from the 7th century in the Middle East, large communities of Christians were forbidden to display a cross in order to convert to Islam. And during the 1920s, pursuant to the orders of Lenin, Christians on the Russian Orthodox Church were targeted, seeking to send a blunt and remove the religion as a competing doctrine to communism. So we would be foolish to think that the persecution of Christians is a matter which has been consigned to the history books. Sadly, uh, around the world, that persecution is alive today. And in fact, in 2021, worldwide, 13 Christians were killed for practicing their faith so far. 12 churches uh, had been attacked and 12 Christians had been attacked in themselves. Now, Australia is a country founded on Judeo-Christian values. And over the past two years, state parliaments across the country have been passing radical social policy laws, laws which many Christians, understandably, believe are direct attacks on their faith. Religious freedom is under attack in state parliaments and is systematically being set aside in favour of a new social justice identity politics style of ideology. In fact, wokeness is beginning to function as the new religion, as the values which have served us well are placed under attack and being forfeited day by day. The Change or Suppression Conversion Practices Act, recently passed in Victoria, represents an attack on religious freedom in the most egregious form in Australian legislative history. Similar bills have been introduced in Queensland, the ACT and South Australia is likely to see its own version later in the year. Euthanasia legislation has been passed in Victoria, in New South Wales, in Tasmania and Western Australia, and a similar bill has just been passed in my home state of South Australia. Now, 63 per cent of South Australians rejected the introduction of a late-term abortion bill in February 2021. Yet South Australian State Parliament passed that bill to allow abortion to the moment of birth. Christians are Australians too. In fact, they make up 52 per cent of our population and they deserve a voice inside the machinery of politics. In fact, it was Sir Robert Menzies, who was himself a Christian, who in 1960 said, if I were, as I am not an atheist or an agnostic or some other such unhappy person, I would still take the Bible with me to a desert island for two reasons. One, that I would have a noble piece of literature to accompany me, and two, because given an ample opportunity to study it, I might cease to be an atheist or an agnostic. Christians should neither exclude themselves nor be excluded from party politics, as was the case in South Australia last week. Christian, the Christian faith values family, industriousness, community and justice, the very same values which are held dear by the centre-right of politics in this country. So to the Christian community of South Australia, I want to apologise for the events of last week. There are many like-minded people in South Australian politics, like myself, who value you, your communities and your contribution to our state. If we are to ensure that Australia remains a truly inclusive democracy, then Christians cannot be allowed to be thrown to the lines in the area of politics anymore. Menzies would be appalled. Uh, Senator Davey? Sure, since no one else is here. Um, thank you. I rise to thank. Uh, I rise to thank Regional Australia. Uh, our regional industries got us through the biggest economic shock since the global financial crisis. Our agricultural and resources sectors have supported us through, and uh, it is also credit to the communities of Regional Australia who have come together, who have faced lockdowns and quarantines, even though many of those areas have not had a whiff of COVID. So thanks to Regional Australia. But Regional Australia and regional jobs are clearly not a priority for Labor. If you look at the budget in reply speech delivered by the opposition leader, not one word about agriculture, not one word about regional infrastructure. In fact, the word regional was only used twice, and one of those occasions was to accuse the nationals of over-delivering for the regions. Well, I'll take that. Thank you very much. The increasing divide between Labor and the regions is none more apparent than their lack of support for the coal industry, the resources sector and in key regions, including in my state, in the Hunter. I mean, after their humiliating loss two years ago in central Queensland, 
their member for Grainler had to cave in and accept that Australia should continue to uh, support and export our high-grade coal. The Hunter Valley is home to the highest quality coal in the world. This high energy, low emissions coal is high in demand, particularly for modern coal fired power plants being built around the world, including in nations with a net zero carbon target. They need our coal to reduce their emissions. Our coal is also playing a crucial role to help developing nations power up and bring their populations out of the dark. Now, I would rather they burn our cleaner coal than someone else's dirty coal. But the hunter is also so much more than coal. The hunter has a vibrant agricultural sector, some of the best wineries in Australia. It supports a quality thoroughbred industry and has a booming tourism sector. And the nationals know this. We support this and we are working with those industries to ensure their ongoing success. We know there are challenges. We understand there are workforce issues, not just in agriculture, but we are working towards an ag visa. There are also workforce shortages across tourism, meatworks and dairy that need to be addressed. We know there's internet and communication connectivity issues, uh, particularly around the key tourist destination of Pocolban. And we know getting the design of local infrastructure right is vitally important. Our people on the ground in Hunter, the recently elected state member for the Upper Hunter, Dave Lazell, and our candidate for the Hunter, James Thompson, are working with their communities to identify solutions and to bring ideas to their respective parliaments. Both of these men are locals. Both have been pre-selected by grassroots members of the National Party, and both will do their utmost to bring the issues that are faced in the Hunter to the fore so that we can continue to deliver for the Hunter. And I remind the Chamber what our government, our government has already done for the Hunter, including funding a detailed business case for the low stock to Glen East Creek Dam pipeline for water infrastructure, including providing nearly $5.5 million to the Hunter under the Roads to Recovery program. We also know that Newcastle is the gateway to the Hunter, and that's why we're supporting a $15 million uh, business case for the Sydney to Newcastle faster rail and $55 million for the Newcastle Airport upgrade to connect the people of the Hunter and the north of New South Wales to the rest of the world. Because we believe in the Hunter, we know the Hunter is a vital and vibrant place, and unlike the Labor Party, we don't turn our back on the Hunter or the jobs that support the Hunter. Thank you. Senator Steele, John. When Priya and Nada's Murugupan arrived in Australia in 2013. It should have been the beginning of a new chapter in their lives. Fleeing persecution and violence, they should have found in our country that safe place across the sea that Australia has been for so many people over so many generations. They should have found in our two major political parties institutions and entities that, while differing about their vision for Australia, were united in recognising the reality that this country, founded on stolen land, which has become to be called Australia, recognises that each generation of people that come from across that sea to call Australia home and build a life, as they do that, they build the community, they build the country with vibrancy and energy 
and determination, we become so much stronger as we embrace the diversity. That's what they should have found here. That's what they had every right to expect, after all. The second verse of our national anthem states, for those who come across the sea, we have boundless plains to share. Their two incredible daughters, Kapika and Tharnaka, should have grown up able to access the very best of education, to be able to make friends, to be able to laugh and love and play and be safe. That's what they should have been able to do. Instead, the reality for this family has been the best part of a decade, being mashed and divided and separated and mistreated by a system which was created and is to this day sustained with the bipartisan support of both major parties, designed to attempt to dehumanise families like theirs, to subject them to such pain and to cause in them such fear that those fleeing war and violence would rather stay in those spaces than attempt to come here, than to make their life and their home here in Australia. This in inhuman, this immoral, this cruel system of mandatory offshore detention, of boat towbacks, of temporary protection visas, of the reduction of human life to numbers and monikers like illegal maritime arrival. This is now something that both sides of politics have come in on and support, regardless of the decision made today. And let's be really clear, the only thing that has changed today is that the Australian government, having bowed to the profound pressure placed upon them by the community, has decided to change the nature of the cage in which this family is kept. The call to return to Bilo goes unheard tonight. And yet there is backslapping and celebration among the offices of both Labour and Liberal, when the reality is that the Liberal Party locked them up and would do so again, and if they arrived here today, the Labour Party would lock them up as well. This is the reality. What is needed is freedom, not just for this family, but for every human being that was cast off to Manus and Nauru permanent protection, permanent security, the ability to live your life and build your home here in Australia. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to uh, pay tribute to the 50,000 Australians who volunteer every year to put on agricultural shows. Uh, it has been a tough year for those involved in uh, uh, preparing for and, and putting on agricultural shows. With COVID last year, uh, 500 uh, agricultural shows across Australia were cancelled, uh, and that meant no income uh, for those show societies and, and no income for lots of the, the showies or, or the showmen and women uh, who put on various amusements that we all love to take our families to in Sideshow Alley and other amusements at shows. It's a great Australian tradition of going to the show or the Eka or whatever it's called, uh, getting a Dagwood dog, uh, uh, getting a show bag, seeing uh, some cattle on show, uh, uh, and if it's uh, uh, your elk to go on some of the various rides that are there as well. Uh, and it was a great enjoyment to take my own family last week to both the Yapoon and Rockhampton shows. They were spoilt uh, because we had a LNP stall at those shows, so they got to go to both. Uh, and they, they loved it. They loved it, having missed out last year. So uh, I do want to pay tribute to all those people that do that. Uh, uh, it was a tough year, as I said. The government did help and assist through this process. Uh, I want to congratulate the government on providing $34 million of assistance to 
378 show societies already to help them get through the last year, and I believe there's another $700,000 in supplementary funding about to be awarded to around 110 shows. That has helped make sure that we can put on shows again and enjoy this great Australian tradition once more. But I did speak to a number of showies last week when I was at the Rockhampton and Yapoon shows, and there are, there is, there is or are some more challenges emerging uh, for those involved in shows, and it's something I think we need to turn our attention to. Uh, the showies I spoke to last week uh, are very concerned about the withdrawal of insurance services uh, from their market. Uh, uh, apparently, traditionally, there have only been two major providers of insurance, of publicly liability insurance, to those that run amusements or, or, or various uh, rides on Sideshow Alley. And they have both, in recent months, pulled out of the Australian market. So, in recent months, uh, the two providers of public liability insurance are no longer active uh, in Australia. And what that means is that those who operate uh, rides uh, or other amusements at agricultural shows uh, are no longer able to do so if they do not have uh, or not, are not insured. Already, this is seeing rides being taken out of service. I, I spoke to one showy who has parked his. He's uh, one of his star attractions, the Star Flyer, I think it is uh, named. Uh, it's currently in a shed uh, somewhere in Queensland because it has, he hasn't been able to get insurance. And as more and more of these insurance con contracts come due in the months ahead, we might face a situation where uh, Sideshow Alley is no more. Uh, and I want to make sure uh, that, the, uh, uh, that we do not see Sideshow Alley disappear uh, from the showgrounds of Australia. And I thank the uh, the Assistant Treasurer, uh, uh, Mr Michael Suker, for uh, speaking to me about this week. I've raised this issue with him and I know he's already across and aware of these things and in discussions to see what we can do to keep Sideshow Alley alive. I also want to thank the Showman's Guild of uh, Australasia uh, and their president, Mr Lewis uh, Osborne, who I've been in touch with and he's provided me much information about the current situation. Uh, it's an issue I've raised down here. Uh, in Canberra this week, and on on on, uh, on their behalf, I'd like to say that I will be taking up this cause to make sure that we can see a solution here for many of these dedicated uh, Australians who give, bring so much joy uh, to 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 often rural country towns who don't have access to the dream worlds and movie worlds and major amusement parks of others, but for one short period of every year they get to go on a Ferris wheel. Uh, or a roller coaster or a ghost house or some sort of the ride, and we want to make sure that kids right around the country continue to have access to that. And most importantly, we want to make sure that the agricultural societies continue to be able to sell and market uh, their own uh, shows because it's so important that we do show the entire country how important our agricultural sector is, how much it provides to our country, and the shows that are put on around the country are a great way of doing that every year. Senator Faruqi. Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm not going to mince my words here tonight. The treatment of Priya, Nadesh, Tanika and Kopika has been nothing short of depraved. A three-year-old child, just turned four actually on the weekend, is in hospital because of a life-threatening blood infection. It should never have come to this. Her parents repeatedly asked for her to be taken to the hospital, to be told no, 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 over and over. This is the heartbreaking story of a family that is just seeking safety in this country. But this is also a story of a heartless and immoral government that locks up innocent people and children. Because of immense community pressure, this cruel government has been forced to reunite the family in Perth. But they are still in detention, and there is no word yet on their freedom and their return to Biloela. But this is not the story of just one family. This is the story of so many families and refugees who come to our shores seeking safety, but what they get there is horror and cruelty. The meanness of this government as far as refugees are concerned, knows no bounds because their standards are based on cruelty, not compassion. 
and their policies are based on racism and xenophobia, not respect and acceptance. They will send people back to dangerous situations where there is a humanitarian crisis. We know Sri Lanka is not a safe place for Tamils. This family was kicked out of their home in Beloila and thrown into offshore detention for no other reason but that they were seeking asylum. And shamefully, in this country, asylum seekers are not treated as humans. Let's not forget that governments of both stripes, liberals and labor, have shown bipartisan cruelty to asylum seekers. They both have policies aimed at deterring, detaining, and deporting vulnerable people rather than providing them safety. And this has caused unimaginable harm to thousands of people, including women and children. Asylum seekers have now seen decades of bipartisan cruelty in the form of TPVs, mandatory detention, offshore processing, and being locked up in hotels during the pandemic. They've been hidden away with no access to journalists, losing all hope in desperation. They have harmed themselves and committed suicide. They've died because they didn't get medical treatment. Women have been sexually assaulted and raped. The same systemic racism that has played out so viciously for First Nations people for more than 200 years has also resulted in inhumanity towards refugees. We have become an international shame, a place that puts children behind barbed wire in offshore camps, a place which incarcerates asylum seekers indefinitely, leading to depression, despair, and self-harm, a place that threatens to lock up even its own citizens for wanting to come home, which is exactly that morally bankrupt India travel ban was all about, all in the name of some false notion of national security. There are politicians in this parliament who don't want asylum seekers or migrants to come here because they don't fit their description of what an Australian should look like. Disgracefully, the walls of Fortress Australia are getting more and more impenetrable for those who may not fit this description of white Australia. They are painted as people very different to mainstream Australia. They are from a different culture, we are told. They're not one of us, and so continues the othering of people. Asylum seeker policies have become more and more cruel, restrictive, punitive, and militarized. I'm so ashamed of how Australia has vilified, dehumanized, and demonized refugees. But I know that more and more people feel the same way. They were horrified at how this family has been treated. They want them to go home to Billow. They want an end to mandatory detention of refugees. They want to close down detention camps. They want a safe home for refugees in Australia. We can't change history, but we can make things right now and for the future. We want justice for all refugees. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr Acting President. I rise tonight to speak about the changes that the Minister for Indigenous Australians, the Honourable Ken Wyatt, announced at the weekend relating to much-desired amendments to the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, or ALRA, and the Aboriginal Benefit Account. I was at the Barunga Festival uh, on the weekend with Minister Wyatt, with the Acting uh, Prime Minister, Michael McCormack, my fellow Senator, Malandiri McCarthy, uh, the member for Lingiari, Warren Snowden, and Chair of the Northern Land Council, a longtime friend of mine, Sammy Bush. For those senators who have not been to Barunga, uh, not been to the Barunga Festival, I would encourage you to do so. Barunga is about 80 kilometres south of Catherine on the Central Arnhem Highway. The community absolutely came alive with visitors from across the Territory and across Australia, other communities as far away as Groot Island, and, uh, and many tourists out to experience a piece of Territory and Indigenous culture. It was the perfect environment for such a substantial change to ALRA and the ABA. 
There are a number of substantial gains as a result of the reforms. The aspiration of achieving home ownership is something that most of Australia, and certainly all non-Indigenous Australians, take for granted. It would be unthinkable if government legislation stopped urban dwellers and the majority of Australia from fulfilling that type of dream. But that is exactly what those in remote and regional Indigenous communities have had to face. For more than three decades, I have seen the impacts of legislative and administrative policies which have hamstrung opportunities in the Territory for Indigenous Australians. And that is why last weekend's announcement by Minister Ken Wyatt on changes to the ARRA to activate the potential of Indigenous land in the NT should be warmly welcomed by all sides of politics. This coalition government, along with consultation with the land councils, created a package of generational reforms. Mr. President. The reforms will empower Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory to maximise the economic future of their families and communities for generations to come using funds from the $1.2 billion Aboriginals Benefit Account, or the ABA. The ABA receives mining royalties generated from Aboriginal land in the Territory and has grown substantially as I said, to more than $1.2 billion today. These funds are not, not contributed by the taxpayer. These are funds earned by Indigenous landholders in the Northern Territory from mining operations that they approve of on their traditional lands. A new body will be formed and will use the ABA funding to seize opportunities to invest in large-scale strategic initiatives such as agriculture, tourism, mining, processing, manufacturing, whatever they choose to do with the money that is theirs. This is in addition to continuing to make smaller grant payments available to support local communities and organisations. This new body will receive an initial $500 million and ongoing funding of $60 million per year to secure a sustainable economic future for generations of Indigenous Territorians. In addition, there will be other reforms to the ARRA, including business certainty on Aboriginal land by strengthening community entity township leasing and streamlining arrangements for exploration and mining licences without lessening the controls of traditional owners. Township order, Senator McMahon. Time has expired. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. I welcome today's news that the Murugapan family, four-year-old Thanika and six-year-old Kapika and their parents Priya and Nardez will be reunited in Perth and will be allowed to live in the community, not behind razor wire in an offshore prison for the time being. But this is not good enough. Today's decision by the government to bring the Marugapan family from the Christmas Island prison to Perth was nothing but a political decision designed only to deal with the public relations nightmare this case has become for the prime marketer. Sorry, I mean Prime Minister Scott Morrison. The Marugapans are still not allowed to return to their home and their community in Biloela, a community that is desperate to have them back. This decision means that the Marugapans are still in legal limbo, unable to get on with their lives. This decision means that the Marugapans are still at the whim of Australia's sickening and inhumane immigration policy that put Thanika in hospital with pneumonia. The Morrison government could end this cruelty for the Marugapans today, right now, with just the stroke of a pen. 
and allow them to go back to their home and community in Biloela permanently. I note that the Labor Party is calling on the Morrison government to intervene in this case to allow the Marugapans to stay in Australia. I welcome this from Labor. But the reality is that Labor is in lockstep with the Morrison government on the cruel treatment of people seeking refuge or asylum. The reality is that it shouldn't be left up to the minister's discretion to intervene in a case just because the politics requires it. The reality is that this country's refugee policies should be humane to begin with. This means no offshore prisons. This means no indefinite detention. This means no denial of medical care to a three-year-old and leaving her with a potentially life-threatening illness. But the reality is that if the Marugapans arrived in Australia by boat today, Labor's policy would see them imprisoned indefinitely on Nauru or Manus Island. That's not a reality the Australian Greens accept, but that's the reality that the Labor Party accepts. We all know that great quote, the standard you walk past is a standard you accept. As a senator or member of parliament, that means how you vote. Now, how big your talk is, not how big your talk is, not how many nice pictures you take for your social media holding hashtag home to billow signs. I say this to Labor. The standard you vote for is a standard you accept. And Labor has voted to keep innocent people like Thanika, Kopika, Priya and Nardes locked up in offshore prisons like Manus Island and Nauru. As First Nations people, we know what it's like to be forced out of our homes. We know what it's like to be stolen from our families and communities. And we know what it's like for us and our children to be robbed of our future. As a First Nations person, I say to the Marugapan family, you are welcome in my country, no matter if you came here by boat or by plane. I stand here in this place day in and day out as a First Nations senator, surrounded by senators, most of whose ancestors came to this country by a boat. As a First Nations person, I say to the Marugapan family, to Thani, to Kopika, to Priya and to Nardes, you are welcome on this land and the land of my ancestors who have been here for over 60,000 years. We won't start, stop fighting for you and your family and for other people seeking asylum to have a future in this country. That's the only reality the Australian Greens will accept, and we'll always stand with those that are being Order. targeted by Senator this government. Moore. Senator Friabanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. Italian poet, scholar, writer, philosopher, and politician Dante Alighieri is one of the founding fathers of the Italian language, along with Petrarch and Boccaccio, the so called Tre Corone della lingua italiana. This, mar this year marks the 700th anniversary of Dante's passing. Known as Il Somma Poeta, the supreme poet, he is best known worldwide for his masterpiece La Divina Commedia. The Divine Comedy is a landmark of Italian literature and universally considered one of the world's literature's greatest poems. Divided into three sections, Inferno, Hell, Purgatory, uh, Purgatorio and Paradiso, Paradise, the Divine Comedy presents an encyclopedic overview of the attitudes, beliefs, aspirations and material aspects of the medieval world. Born in Florence around 1265, Dante grew up among Florentine aristocracy. He received formal instruction in grammar, language and philosophy at one of the Franciscan schools of the city. At the age of nine, he purportedly gl glimpsed the eight-year-old Beatrice Portinari and, struck by her beauty, fell in love. During his teens, Dante demonstrated a keen interest in literature. 
In 1287, he enrolled in the University of Bologna, but by 1289, he enlisted in the Florentine army and took part in the Battle of Campaldino, one of the most important midi battles in medieval Italy between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. After the premature death of Beatrice in 1290, Dante committed himself to the study of philosophical works of Boetus, Cicero and Aristotle and earnestly wrote poetry, establishing his own poetic voice in innovative canzoni or lyrical poems. The Divine Comedy, an imagined journey through hell and purgatory to heaven, is rich in science, astronomy and philosophy and rooted in 12th century Catholicism and Italian politics. The Divine Comedy is amongst the greatest works of all medieval European literature and is a profound Christian vision of humankind's temporal and eternal destiny. On its most personal level, it draws on Dante's own experience of exile from his native city of Florence. On its most comprehensive level, it may be read as an allegory taking the form of a journey through hell, purgatory and paradise. The poem amazes with its array of learning, its penetrating and comprehensive analysis of contemporary problems and its inventiveness of language and imagery. Hell, the most popular and widely studied cantos of the Divine Comedy, recounts Dante's travels through the different regions of hell, led by his mentor and protector, the Roman poet Virgil. Constructed as a huge funnel with nine descending circular ledges, Dante's Hell features a vast, meticulously organised torture chamber in which sinners, carefully classified according to the nature of their sins, suffer hideous punishment, often depicted with ghoulish attention to detail. Sinners who recognise and repudiate their sins are given the opportunity to attain paradise through the arduous process of purification which continues in purgatory. A shift from human reason to divine revelation takes place in purgatory, where penitents awaiting the final journey to paradise continually reaffirm their faith and atone for the sins they committed on earth. A mood of brotherly love, modesty and longing for God prevails in purgatory, although in hell, Virgil, a symbol of human reason, helps Dante understand sin. In purgatory, the poet needs a more powerful guide who represents faith, his beloved Beatrice. Finally, paradise manifests the process of spiritual regeneration and purification required to meet God, who rewards the poet with perfect knowledge. By choosing to write his poem in the Italian vernacular rather than in Latin, Dante decisively influenced the course of literary, literary development. He primarily used the Tuscan dialect, which would become standard literary Italian, but his vivid vocabulary ranged widely over many dialects and languages. Not only did he lend a voice to the emerging lay culture of his own country, but Italian became the literary language in Western Europe for several centuries. Near the end of his life, Dante settled in Ravenna, where he died on 14 September 1321. Although the Divine Comedy caused an immediate sensation during his life, Dante's fame has been celebrated across the centuries. Many scholars have examined the structural unity of the poem, discussing the relationship between medieval symbolism and allegory within the poem's three sections, and exploring Dante's narrative strategy. Others have marvelled at the seemingly inexhaustible formal and semantic richness of Dante's text. With its various enigmatic layers of uh, philo philological and philosophical complexities, the Divine Comedy has been scrutinised by critics, literary theorists, linguists and philosophers who have cherished the immortal work precisely because it translates the harsh truth about the human condition into a poetics of timeless beauty. Dante helped to give shape to and stabilise his vernacular as a medium of literary expression. As an exponent and user of the Dolce del Nuovo, he shaped a rubric of diction that influenced poets well into the Renaissance, starting from Petrarch. His moulding of the Terza Rima had a lasting and fruitful influence on many authors. He was among the great pioneers in the sonnet form, and his practice with regard to structure, form and diction made their mark on later writers like Vittoria Colonna and Michelangelo. 
Dante's words also fed the creative imagination of visual artists who have sought to illustrate his text through a wide variety of media. Almost immediately after his work was completed, images were created to accompany his masterpiece. More than 40 illuminated manuscripts of the Divine Comedy were produced before the advent of the printing press in the late 15th century. When the potential for faster reproduction of books, including illustrated books, became a reality, Dante's imagination sometimes interwined with the imagination of an artist rendering a visual interpretation of his words reached an even larger audience than before. For instance, in the 1480s, the same decade when he painted some of his most famous works, Primavera and the Birth of Venus, Botticelli undertook the task of drawing not only hell, but the entire Divine Comedy. Italy celebrates the supreme poet's genius every year on 25 March on Dante Di, the national day dedicated to Dante Alighieri. It is a date specifically chosen because it is recognised by scholars as the day the poet started his journey in the afterlife in the Divine Comedy. In addition to poetry, Dante wrote important theoretical works ranging from discussions of rhetoric to moral philosophy and political thought. He was fully conversant with the classical tradition, drawing for his own purposes on such writers as Virgil and Cicero. But most unusual for a layman, he also had an impressive command of scholastic philosophy and theology. His learning and his personal involvement in the heated political controversies of his age led him to the composition of De Monarchia, one of the major tracks of medieval political philosophy. In 2021, the Anno Dantesco, the year of Dante, Italy is commemorating the 700th anniversary of his passing in Ravenna with a number of events taking place across the globe. In particular, l'Accademia della Crusca, the world's leading authority and research centre on Italian language, is also celebrating Dante's 700th anniversary by publishing a new word or expression coined by the poet for each day of 2021, accompanied by, accompanied by an explanation on its website. I too have had the privilege of studying Dante's work, both in high school and as part of my university studies. It remains for me one of the seminal works, not only of Italian literature, but of the history of world literature. And so, 700 years on, I would urge people to go back, as I will, to my dog-eared copy of La Divina Commedia and once again relive the mastery of this giant of literature. He truly is the supreme poet. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I rise tonight to speak on, uh, among other matters, the circumstances inflicted those in my home state as a result of last week's weather events. Sadly, in Victoria last week, um, heavy rain and, and strong winds have uh, lashed uh, my home state, taking both lives and livelihoods with it. Now, whilst most of Victoria was affected in some manner, nor my nor um, more so was this the case as it was in Gippsland, an area well known to most Australians owing to the devastating toll that bushfires has levied upon the region in recent times. This time, though, it was flood that wreaked havoc upon a most idyllic corner of our country, known locally as God's country. Rain falling at a level unseen in quite some time caused rivers and creeks to burst their banks, flooding towns right across the region. In Terrelgan, to the east of the Latrobe Valley, floodwaters have damaged dozens of homes and businesses, some irreparable. Whilst the rain may have for the most part subsided, an immense task still lays ahead of Gippslanders, and yet some yet are still even to have electricity reconnected, communications restored and to be provided with ready access to safe drinking water. Nonetheless, times like these, as devastating as they may be, provide the opportunity for Australians to display the mateship of which we have become famous for. In particular, I want to thank 
the emergency services personnel and volunteers who have worked tirelessly to assist those in need over recent times. Communities are not merely homes and, sh and shopping strips. There is much more to them than that, especially in regional Victoria. A community is made up of the bonds between us, and it is in the willingness of those to lend their shoulder to the will that we see community in action. Without those in our communities serving their fellow neighbours, rescue and recovery would simply not be possible. And I want to take this opportunity again to say thank you to everyone who has done their bit. As the water subsides, it is now that time for the people of Gippsland who will need our support, not just in Victoria, but right around the country, supporting Gippsland, so that they can get back on their feet, just as we did when those devastating fires hit around 18 months ago. Houses need to be rebuilt, businesses restocked, and most regrettably, loved ones mourned. We must be there for them. I welcome the uh, recent announcement of the Victorian government to provide financial support of those in need, and I also welcome the uh, declaration that was made by the Insurance Council of Australia, which will allow claims from people living in effective areas to be prioritised. With the recovery bill estimated to be in excess of $1 billion, I hope that the people of Gippsland can also count on the federal government to do their bit to help Victorians recover from this devastating weather event. On another matter, some weeks ago I had the privilege of participating in the Australian Defence Force parliamentary program, joining alongside the dedicated men and women of the Royal Australian Navy. I travelled to HMAS Stirling in Western Australia and embarked upon HMAS Collins for a brief ocean foray as part of a training exercise alongside HMAS Rankin. As one would expect, the standard of professionalism which our sailors and submariners carry themselves is well, without parallel. I was th thoroughly impressed with the commitment they demonstrated to their duty and the skill with which they applied their craft. As Senator Hughes and I journeyed together at the bottom of the sea, the crew of HMAS Collins participated in a series of practice engagements with the crew of HMAS Rankin, carrying among its complement members of the other place. It's fair to say Team Red, as in the Team Senate, won on the day. I am pleased to report that the Collins crew performed well and serving a worthy opponent to their equally talented rivals on Rankin. The, um, the program performs a a valuable role in uh, building mutual understanding between not just the AD ADF personnel but also members of this place here at Parliament House. And since its beginning in 2001, the success of the program has been built on offering a unique opportunity to engage firsthand with the men and women of the ADF. And I wanted again to say thank you very much to the Department of Defence and the Royal Australian Navy for the very warm welcome and insights into the ADF. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd also like to thank those aboard our, sub, uh, our submarines for the dedication which they have in protecting not just our waters but also advancing our national agenda abroad. And finally, I'd also like to particularly place on the record my thanks to Captain Gary Lawton, who was a commanding officer at HMAS Stirling, Captain Doug Theobald, commander of the sub submarine force, and Commander Michael Max Power, who is the commanding officer of HMAS Collins. And I salute all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Acting Deputy President, while world leaders gather in the United Kingdom this week at the G7 conference to discuss, amongst many things, the importance of climate change and decarbonising our economy, what does our Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison, do? He sneaks off and does a video conference, a direct call into the oil and gas industry annual conference, the APIA conference, the Australian Production Petroleum Exploration Association, and announces 80,000 square kilometres of our oceans, new acreage being put up for the fossil fuel industry to help our gas led recovery. That's all the world needs to know, Acting Deputy President. That's who Mr Scott Morrison is, but that's not who this country is. I've only got three words 
for the Prime Minister Acting Deputy President? WTF? Seriously? In this age of climate emergency, facing an extinction crisis, we get politely invited to a world summit to discuss how we're going to engineer and act and get out of this mess we find ourselves in. And in the middle of that, your government, this government, announces 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean permits for the fossil fuel industry. At the same time, we've got the Beetaloo Basin being opened up, a bigger carbon bomb than Adani, and public money being put into this. I don't know why we even get invited to these summits, considering the travesty that is our lack of climate policy in this country. And some of the new permits are just five kilometres off precious places loved by Australians, like the Twelve Apostles in the Otway Basin, off the coast of Victoria, five kilometres off one of Victoria's most prized tourism areas, a precious coastal ecosystem loved by most Victorians. And we're opening it up for seismic testing and oil and gas drilling? You've got to be joking. You've got to be joking. So it's no wonder that Australians want to vote for change. And I'm going to announce tonight, having just chaired and initiated a long-ranging Senate inquiry into the impacts of seismic testing on our oceans, that I will be introducing a bill into this place to ban all new offshore oil and gas acreage for seismic testing and for oil and gas drilling. And if you don't think that's possible, then just look across the ditch at New Zealand, because that's exactly what they did. They banned all new fossil fuel exploration that risks our ocean. How is it, at this point in history, we can be making 80,000 square kilometres of our ocean available to explore for the same product that is killing our oceans, burning fossil fuels, rising emissions, warming oceans, ocean acidification. It is madness. It is sheer lunacy. And I say to Australians, you can protest, you can agitate, you can disrupt, you can defend. And all those things are important. But every environmental problem is first and foremost a political problem. And this is a political problem of the highest magnitude. The fact that a government would be doing this for the petroleum industry, the fossil fuel industry, in a time of climate emergency, because of their close, cosy relationships with big donors in the fossil fuel industry and, of course, the politics in this place of the National Party, who just, by the way, in recent days warned the Prime Minister not to lock in any binding emissions targets while he's over in the G7. No, don't commit your country to climate action. It's no wonder that ex-Prime Minister Mr Malcolm Turnbull called these people the terrorists within the Liberal Party, that they'll blow things up when they don't get their own way. Well, call it a coincidence. But the timing of this offshore oil and gas acreage for the fossil fuel industry in the middle of the G7, it stinks too. And I have no doubt at all, from my time spent in this place, that that timing is not a coincidence. It is designed to send a direct message to the donors to the Liberal Party and the National Party that all is OK. We will continue with business as usual. While I might be over here, making vague promises to the world about Australia being responsible, being part of a global solution to tackle the greatest challenge of our time, climate change, I'm going to sneak off. I'm going to sneak off and present to the oil and gas industry 80,000 
square kilometres of our oceans for them to go and explore for fossil fuels. Well, it's not going to cut it, Acting Deputy President. I have seen in the last five years the changes to their oceans. I have seen things that I never expected I would ever see while I was on this planet, let alone when I was in this parliament. And I know a lot of other Australians have seen this too. In the Great Australian Bight, off the east coast of Tasmania, with the loss of our giant kelp forests, half the coral cover gone on the Barrier Reef after three mass bleachings in five years. And Australians know what's causing this. And they are marching and voting with their feet. They are they are paddling out at beaches all around this country and protesting this age of fossil fuel exploration, this time in history when we must say no more. We have to have a plan for transitioning and decarbonising our economy. And that plan is a positive one. It involves new industries, new job opportunities, new research and development new entrepreneurial spirit. The fact that Mr Keith Pitt could say in his media release today that this year's release provides opportunities for COVID recovery, for access to reliable and affordable energy, both now and in the future. The most reliable and affordable energy and the energy solutions for Australians and everyone around the world has to be in renewable energy. From electric vehicles through to virtual power stations being run by millions of households with solar panels, with batteries, with systems to trade their power, that is the future. Decentralised, decarbonised economy that all Australians can rely on and participate in. They're just one of many solutions available for the industries of the future. Agriculture, seaweed farming, industrial hemp, the opportunities are limitless if we change our mindset. And opening up 80,000 square kilometres of our oceans, including off the coastline of my home state in Tasmania, and off the coast of Victoria and Western Australia, even after we've been exploring these oceans for nearly 50 years, providing fodder for more profits for a few fossil fuel interests who are fighting a rearguard action at this time in history, trying to lock in, trying to lock in as quickly as possible whatever they can because they know the curtains are coming down, Acting Deputy President. They know that the curtains are coming down very rapidly. They are in a sunset industry. And it makes me furious that this government doesn't respect not only the international community's wish to get a global agreement on decarbonising our economies, but the wish of the Australian people, which unanimously in all surveys show they care about climate action and they want meaningful climate action, not opening up our oceans you, to oil and gas companies. Your time has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Patrick, Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak about uh, speak this evening about the Australian giant cuttlefish and the environmental health of South Australia's Upper Spencer Gulf. Discussions about Australia's marine environment often tend to focus on spectacular attractions, notably the wonders of the Great Barrier Reef or the annual migration of humpback whales along our eastern and western seaboards. However, with more than 34,000 kilometres of coastline, small offshore islands and more than 1,000 estuaries, our coastal and marine environment is truly vast. But all too often the sea is taken for granted. It is a sad fact that the marine environment is frequently treated as being of secondary importance relative to other priorities, big energy and resource extraction projects, industrial scale commercial fishing, port infrastructure development and other coastal land development and usage. 
I have pre previously expressed strong concern about threats posed by petroleum and gas exploration and development to the environment of the Great Australian Bight. Tonight, however, I want to focus on an area of our marine environment that is personally quite special, South Australia's Upper Spencer Gulf. I grew up in Wyala, and the beaches and bays of the Gulf are well known to me. The Upper Gulf's marine park protects some of the most important fish nurseries in South Australia, including significant mangrove uh, forests, seagrass meadows and areas where whiting, squid and snapper gather to spawn. Dolphins congregate in the Upper Gulf to feed and breed. Arguably the giant Australian cuttlefish is an iconic species in the region. It is the world's largest cuttlefish species. It grows to some 50 centimetres in body length and over 10.5 kilograms in weight. Owing to diminishing numbers, the Great Australian Cuttlefish is listed on the International Union for Conservation of Nature's uh, as a vulnerable species. A striking feature of the cuttlefish is its ability to put on a spe spectacular display, a changing colour in an instant. Each winter through uh, May to August, many thousands swarm into the rocky areas off the Wyala coast, especially around Point Lowley and Fitzgerald Bay, to mate and lay their eggs. It is the only known location this mass gathering happens in the world. It's a unique annual event, something that in recent years has become a significant tourist attraction with Wyala's annual Cuttlefest celebration. It's a re remarkable phenomenon that is now under threat. At the end of last month, a controversial fishing, fish farming scheme to produce yellow-tailed kingfish in Fitzgerald Bay moved forward following a decision of the Wyala Council. On the 31st of May, the Council granted the Clean Sea Company access to Point Lowly Marina, a decision which will enable them to establish a 4,245-tonne capacity fish farm in Fitzgerald Bay under existing leases granted by the South Australian State Government. Clean Seas is already the largest farmer of yellow-tailed kingfish outside Japan. It has a hatchery at Arno Bay and fish farms at Port Lincoln, both on the Eyre Peninsula. The new site, which is planned to be stocked with kingfish as early as September, will further increase the company's production capacity. Clean Seas previously farmed fish in the Upper Gulf and many locals have strongly opposed the plan due to fears that waste from the farm could cause nitrogen blooms and impacts, uh, an impact on the giant Australian cuttlefish population. More than 600 locals have put their names to a petition against, the, uh, against giving clean seas access uh, to the marina. A key factor underlying the concerns is the very slow rate at which the waters of the Gulf flush into the Southern Ocean. Nick Antonio, a Wyala resident and campaigner against the Kingfish Farm, has highlighted Clean Sea's previous failed aquaculture venture in the Upper Gulf, saying, and I quote, We experienced nitrogen blooms on the bottom of the ocean bed, and we also had a lot of washed up pens and debris damaged to the marina. Last time it was, it was a complete and utter failure for Clean Seas. I cannot understand how they can be licensed to farm 4,245 tonnes of fish in a gulf that is only flushed out every eight months. Since, Wyla, since the Wyala Council decision, the Conservation Council of South Australia has issued a report that expresses grave concerns about the King's, kingfish aquaculture expansion in Fitzgerald, in Fitzgerald Bay. The Conservation Council argues that the sheer mass of nutrients that will be generated is at a sufficient level to destroy seagrasses, something that occurred with nutrient discharges off the Adelaide coastline. The Conservation Council warns that the current SA water quality guidelines are inadequate and outdated and a process to replace them with more stringent uh, trigger values is still incomplete. Northern Spencer Gulf ecosystems, as assessed by the uh, South Australian Environmental Protection Authority, are in decline and should be managed for recovery, not further compromised by large-scale aquacultural pro projects. Significantly, uh, a previous de uh, decline and recovery of the giant cu uh, cuttlefish coincided with the arrival and the departure of king kingfish aquaculture, taking into account a two-year lag from the cuttlefish life cycle and gulf flushing times. 
The Conservation Council has warned that information provided to dispel concerns about the risk to cuttlefish population from aquaculture is, and I quote, incomplete, unreliable or misrepresented. Significantly, the risk assessment that supported the South Australian approval of the project exclu uh, excluded many stakeholders and remained secret. It relied on modelling that at the time was not made available for independent scrutiny. The Conservation Council concludes that the, the kingfish aquaculture expansion will likely result in unacceptable levels of nutrient and damage an of an ecosystem that is already stressed. The giant cuttlefish population is like, likely at risk and a further assessment is urgently required with a reference to updated water quality guidelines. There is also an, an unquestionable need for, a, for greater transparency and the opportunity for concerned stakeholders to provide input before the project proceeds. In considering how we got to the situation, I don't blame the Wyler Council. The Council had little choice because the Council only leased the local marina from the state government. Minister Corey uh, Wingard told the Council if it could not uh, come to a working agreement to allow Clean Seas access to the marina, the government would take back control of the marina. In those circumstances, the Council took the view that it was best to give conditional approval and seek to impose a set of conditions and monitoring arrangements that would hopefully enable effective scrutiny of the environmental impacts, especially on the vulnerable cuttlefish population. So there you have it. Minister Wingard, uh, ignoring the will of the local community at Wyala, basically a minister bullying the Council, um, I just warn him, the people of Wyala don't forget. Meanwhile, it's highly likely that the damage that, the damage that will, be done, uh, will be done long before the monitoring provides a clear picture and a remedial plan can be implemented. The fact is the South Australian government allowed the project to proceed, indeed actively supported it and encouraged it, with completely inadequate considerations of the environmental impacts. The process of environmental assessment and approval were insufficiently rigorous lacked adequate consultation with relevant experts and stakeholders and lacked transparency. Opaque and closed decision-making processes often favour vested interests and rarely serve the common good. When it comes to protection of fragile eco ecosystems uh, and state governments, out of sight means out of mind. South Australian Minister for Tourism and, and the Premier of uh, uh, of South Australia, Stephen Marshall, needs to think seriously about this decision and how it will negatively impact the tourism brought in by the Cuttlefest. Now, we're about to think about devolving responsibility to the state governments in relation to environmental approvals, and, and this sort of process shows you exactly why my starting point in respect of that legislation is a big no. Meanwhile, however, state governments uh, so, such as uh, South Australia, uh, South Australia's uh, um, administration should uh, be subject to much, much closer scrutiny, as they are clearly failing to properly discharge their environmental responsibilities. In the first instance, the so-called uh, Clean Seas Project in the Upper Spencer Gulf should be put on hold, pending a new and independent environmental review via a transparent process and involving all stakeholders and relevant experts. In getting these matters right, I hope it will not be too late to protect the unique ecosystem of the uh, Upper Spencer Gulf and its remarkable inhabitants. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Scar. Deputy President. Uh, you and I have many things in, in common, Mr Acting Deputy President. One of those things is our love for a great show, one of those great Queensland agricultural shows which we have the honour of visiting across the length and breadth of Queensland, whether it be in the beautiful town of Tully or Marburg, nothing beats a great show. And I was fortunate enough on 14 May 2021 to attend Ipswich Show Day in the great Queensland city of Ipswich representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Michael McCormack, uh, to open the Ipswich Events Centre. Now, I should say, Mr Acting Deputy President, whilst it was my uh, obligation, my, my role, uh, my responsibility to open the Ipswich Events Centre, I actually dele delegated, I delegated that responsibility to someone who was uh, deserved 
that honour of opening the event centre far more than I did. And that lady was a name by was that was a lady by the name of Elizabeth Jordan. At the age of 109, 109, she is the longest exhibitor at the Ipswich Show by a country mile. And just reflect on this, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The first time that Elizabeth Jordan, aged 109, visited the Ipswich Show was when she was a child. So we're talking about someone who's been going to the Ipswich Show since about 1920 and was there on Ipswich Show Day on 14 May 2021 for the opening of the Ipswich Event Centre. So the way we did this was Elizabeth Jordan was the one who actually declared the centre open and I got the honour of pulling the ribbon. Pulling the ribbon. I pulled the ribbon for Mrs Elizabeth Jordan, aged 109, as she opened, she opened the Ipswich Event Centre. I'd like to pay tribute to a number of people who advocated for the federal government to provide funds for the Ipswich Event Centre. And these included past and present members of Ipswich Show Society, and I have more to say about them in the next few minutes. My colleague from Queensland, Senator Pauline Hanson, was a fierce advocate for construction of the centre, as was uh, the leader in the Senate, Senator Matthias Cormann, who also was involved in discussions to fund Ipswich Event Centre, and the current mayor of Ipswich, my good friend, uh, the Lord Mayor Theresa Harding, was also involved. The Ipswich Centre cost, event centre cost a total of $8.9 million. It supported the creation of 497 jobs during construction. And it not only provides a great meeting point, a great for people to, uh, to display their wares for expos, and in fact I attended a small business expo a few weeks after the opening of the centre that was held in the centre. It also performs an invaluable role as an emergency evacuation centre for the people of Ipswich. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, a building is just that. It's just bricks and mortar. What provides the heart and soul to this building are the members of the Ipswich Show Society. And I'd like to pay tribute to the current executive team and for their efforts in making sure that uh, Ipswich had its show this year in 2021. So I pay tribute to Mr Darren Zarnow, Zarno, I also pay tribute to the Vice Presidents Andrew Cooper, Denise Hanley and Ross Young. I pay tribute to all of the members of the Ipswich Show Society Committee, past and present, and all the volunteers whose invaluable efforts helped make the Ipswich Show a great success in 2021. Perhaps the, but perhaps the most special thing, apart from Mrs Elizabeth Jordan, aged 109, opening the event centre, uh, the other great thing that occurred that day was the unveiling of a plaque to Ips Ipswich Show Society life members who sa sadly passed away during the course of 2020. And I want to pay tribute to each of those life members who are now commemorated in, on that plaque in the Ipswich Event Centre. David Roger, who served the Ipswich so Show Society for 62 years. 62 years he served on the committee of the Ipswich Show Society. Vivian Zarnow, 54 years of service to the Ipswich Show Society. Sydney Haig, 52 years of service. And of course, David Rusty Thomas, who provided leadership to the Ipswich Show Society and became a life member after 52 years of service. All those four great Queenslanders sadly passed away in 2020, but their service to the Ipswich Show Society, to the Ipswich community, is commemorated on that plaque. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, I pay tribute to all of the people who are involved in the Ipswich Show Society. I thank them for their endeavours and say to each and one of them that you provide an outstanding example for all Australians, an example of what it takes to make this country the best of all countries in the world to live. Senator Rice. Thank you, I rise tonight to speak about human rights, as is my habit every Tuesday night in sitting weeks. The Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental, 
and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all people. I want to start in Myanmar. The tragic deaths and devastating blows to democracy and human rights that have followed the coup are well known. I salute the brave people of Myanmar who continue to advocate for freedom, for democracy and human rights at massive risk to their own lives and freedom. Given their courage and conviction, it has been appalling to see the Australian government refusing to impose sanctions on the leaders of the coup and the military-owned companies who are funnelling money to support them. Countries around the world, including the US, the UK, the EU and Canada, have imposed sanctions on the leaders of the coup, but not us. We, in contrast, are failing the people of Myanmar. We've had 370 civil society organisations in Myanmar calling on our government to urgently impose sanctions. These are the people on the ground that our government should be listening to. The Australian government argues that it's following the lead of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, but that is a complete cop-out. I recently attended an online meeting of the International Parliamentary Alliance for Myanmar, where politicians and former politicians from ASEAN nations told us that waiting for ASEAN to lead is not a good idea, and that countries like Australia should be pushing ASEAN to act. The Lowy, the Lowy Institute recently concluded that ASEAN has international support to deal with the crisis in Myanmar, yet has not proved capable of effectively managing the cunning of the generals or the grievances of the Myanmar population. And they noted the continued reluctance among ASEAN members to embrace temporary punitive measures. Our former ambassador to Myanmar, Nicholas Koppel, has called for targeted sanctions, noting that while our neighbours in Asia will not join the chorus, they will not be surprised that we speak out and it will give more leverage to the less confrontational style of ASEAN. But no, our foreign minister tells us that it's not in our national interest to impose sanctions. But for the life of me, I cannot see how acting to support democracy and human rights in our region, in a country which has got such strong personal and business ties to Australia, how can that be against our national interest? And how can it be against our national interest to support our Burmese po population here in Australia, who are working so hard? to support their communities against the imp imposition of totalitarian, violent military rule. And the tragedy that's occurring on the ground in Myanmar is reflected by a statement by the Australian College for Emergency Medicine and a number of other bodies who have called for the safe and unconditional release of the president of the Myanmar Emergency Medicine Society, Professor Momo U following his arrest and detention on Monday the 12th of April 2021. So it's been nine weeks since that professor was arrested, but he still hasn't been charged. And his family and friends have been threatened by the military if they advocate on his behalf. And we're also incredibly concerned about the more recently recent arrests of other doctors, including Dr Tata Lin, who was the national COVID lead for Myanmar before the coup, as well as surgeon Dr Mong Mong Nien Tun and physician Sui Zin U, both from the Mandalay General Hospital. As the International Federation for Emergency Medicine said in a recent statement, the principles of international humanitarian and human rights law, which safeguard medical neutrality in situations of conflict, must be respected and upheld. The UN Security Council Resolution 2286 strongly condemns attacks against medical facilities and personnel in conflict situations. And I also want to highlight the plight of journalists in Myanmar. A recent Guardian article summarised, many Myanmar journalists are in hiding or have managed to flee the country, although most continue to cover the junta's crimes. Since Min Ong Lang seized power, Reporters Without Borders has recorded the arrest of 86 journalists, and as of the 26th of May, 49 of them are still detained. And one reporter working inside Myanmar spoke anonymously to The Guardian, saying, 
Everything has been messed up by that crazy, stupid and shameless military coup. Our lives are not safe. We have to worry for each other much more than ever. The Junta military is no longer an army. It's just a gang of thieves and murderers, led by their gangster, Min Ong Lang. So let me reiterate our call for the government to impose targeted sanctions against those ge generals who have led the coup. And for those of you who are struggling in Myanmar, struggling for justice, facing being shot at when you protest, and for the many who are advocating around the world, here in Australia and in other countries, we hear you, we see you. Know that your voice is powerful and heard here in the Australian Parliament and elsewhere. We will keep working with you to pressure the Australian government to take action. They must listen to the voices of those on the ground as well as advocating for those unfairly detained. They should impose targeted sanctions urgently. I now want to move on to the situation in Guatemala. Human Rights Watch has summarised what's going on in a recent letter, saying President Alejandro Gianmate and his coalition in the Guatemalan Congress are working to remove the last few independent judges and replace them with allies in an apparent effort to halt an anti-corruption drive that has implicated many senior politicians. Legislatures are also attempting to block funding to the country's human rights ombudsman, who they have tried to remove from office several times in reprisal for his promotion of sexual and reproductive rights, including LGBT rights. And similarly, Amnesty International said in a joint statement, as a result of our work monitoring the human rights situation in the country, we have documented and reported the improper use of criminal law and other legal mechanisms against human rights defenders, prosecutors, former prosecutors, judges, magistrates, former employees of the International Commission Against Impunity and defence lawyers who have been in charge of processes that demonstrate significant advances for justice and the guarantee of human rights. And the Australian Greens also note with particular concern the recent arrest of members of the ecological movement of Guatemala. So we call on our government to make representations to the Guatemalan government to release these political prisoners and respect human rights and to immediately cease using arrests and undermining the legal system to attack political opponents. And tonight I also want to speak out in support of Mohammed El Halabi, who was arrested and imprisoned by the Israeli government five years ago today. Mr El Halabi was the manager of operations for World Vision in Gaza, supporting programs for farmers and fishermen and children traumatised by war. In 2014, Mohammed was named a humanitarian hero by the UN Humanitarian Heroes Program, which recognises everyday people doing extraordinary things. In that same year, he visited Australia and spoke at an event here in the federal parliament. Mr El Halabi was arrested by the Israeli government on charges of diverting aid funds, particularly Australian funding, to Hamas in 2016. In response to those charges, World Vision commissioned an externally conducted forensic audit. And the audit, which was completed in July 2017, found no evidence of diversion of funds and no material evidence that El Halabi was part of or working for Hamas. And subsequent investigations by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, independent auditors and more investigations by World Vision have found no evidence that any money was diverted. But for the last five years, Mr Al Halabi has been cruelly imprisoned by the Israeli government. The ABC reported a year ago that he'd been beaten so severely he had lost some of his hearing and the state has imposed unprecedented security restrictions which prevent him from properly cross-examining prosecution witnesses, from bringing some of his own witnesses out from Gaza to testify and even to keep copies of court transcripts. He's already had 151 court hearings and his most recent case has been um, postponed at the request of prosecutors. So we echo the calls from the UN Special Rapporteurs who say that Mr El Halabi's arrest, interrogation and trial is not worthy of a democratic state and Israeli authorities must grant him the full rights of a fair trial or else release him unconditionally. Israel has got a new government as of this week and I call on our government to make immediate representations to them to immediately Senator release Ross. Mohammed El Halabi. Senator, Senator Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
Uh, I rise initially to speak about two matters involving central Queensland uh, that have occurred in recent times. Uh, just this week, we saw the report of the Queensland Coal Board of Inquiry into a shocking workplace incident, um, the Grosvenor mine explosion. This is an underground coal mine where we saw an explosion as a result of uh, methane gas leaks uh, that left five workers seriously injured, burned uh, and very narrowly uh, avoided losing their lives. These workers and their workmates who were present on the day will never forget that explosion and will never fully recover from the injuries that they experienced. We all know that mining is a dangerous job, and that's part of the reason why we respect miners for putting their lives on the line uh, to produce coal and to produce other uh, minerals, which we all depend upon for our energy and other needs uh, in today's society. So we do know it's a dangerous job. But mining is made a more dangerous job when management doesn't do their job properly. And that's what the finding was from this board of inquiry. This inquiry found that mine management at the Grosvenor mine put workers at a, quote, unacceptable level of risk by prioritising mine production and making of profits over workers' safety. Now, I and many other Labor members have been very vocal about the fact that we strongly support the mining industry. We support the jobs in it, we support the earnings in it, we support the profits and the exports that are generated from it. But this cannot be at the expense of worker safety, and steps always must be taken by mine management to ensure that workers are safe. And it is very clear that in this particular incident this did not occur. One particular feature of the Grosvenor mine is that about 75 per cent of its workforce were either engaged as labour hire or as contractors. Insecure forms of work that I and many other Labor MPs and senators have spoken up about for a number of years now. Uh, I don't know how many times I've been speaking in the Senate chamber about the problems associated with the rampant abuse of labour hire and casualisation in the mining industry in Queensland, and I know it's a problem in the Hunter Valley and other parts of the country as well. And day after day, we, like, we see government members and One Nation members come into this chamber and tell us how much they care about miners and never lift a finger to actually fix the casualisation and labour hire crisis that we have seen in the mining industry for so many years. And unfortunately, in this case, at the Grosvenor mine, workers again paid the price of being engaged through labour hire arrangements. One of the findings from this inquiry into the Grosvenor mine explosion uh, was that labour hire workers uh, did not report safety concerns in many instances because they feared they would lose their jobs. This is exactly the point we have been making for years, that one of the problems with labour hire and casual employment, as we see uh, as we see has occurred so often in the Queensland mining industry, is that workers do not have job security, they can't afford to take out loans, their banks won't give them loans because they can't, haven't got permanent employment, in many cases they get paid less than the permanent workers that they work alongside, and because they don't have job security, they are too fearful of reporting safety concerns because they're worried that they'll get sacked if they speak up. And I've got to tell you, I've met miners across Queensland who haven't spoken up about safety concerns because they are so concerned about losing their jobs. That is not the way that any workplace should be, whether it be in the mining industry or other industry. And it's about time this government and its allies in One Nation actually delivered on the claims that they stand for mining workers. They don't stand for mining workers. And as a result of that, mining workers like those at Grosvenor Mine are exposed to unsafe conditions which they just should not be put in. Uh, the uh, Labor's policy, on the other hand, is very clear. Uh, both before the last election and in the last few months, we have been clear uh, that a Labor government would introduce a very simple policy that would apply to mining workplaces and also to workplaces more generally. And it's a very simple policy with a very simple name. Same job, same pay. If a Labor hire worker is engaged at a mining workplace or any other workplace, they, they will be, have to be engaged on the, at least the same pay and conditions as a permanent worker. 
That's what you would see under an Albanese Labor government, and it is a far cry from what we see under an LNP government aided and abetted by One Nation. These people like to dress up as miners. They carry on all the time about how they're the friends of mining workers. But time after time after time, we have called on this government and One Nation to get behind our proposals to even the playing field for labour hire workers. And time after time after time, this government goes missing in action because they rather actually just dress up like miners rather than actually do something to really help them. Uh, I saw Senator Davey in here earlier talking about mining and how Labor doesn't support mining. Well, how about you actually start supporting mining workers right, rather than actually just dressing up like them and smearing a bit of fake coal dust on your face like some of your colleagues do? If you actually support mining workers—and the same goes for One Nation—if you actually support mining workers, you'll do something about casualisation and about labour hire rather than continuing to ignore this problem, which results in people not having job security which results in people being too concerned about keeping their jobs that they won't complain about safety issues, and at its worst results in some of the issues that we saw at the Grove Nut Mine explosion. This was a preventable explosion. Uh, the management knew uh, that there were gas leaks and that action needed to be taken, and action was not taken, and workers literally paid the price with burns and other injuries that they will never fully recover from. It is unjust. It is unfair, and it's about time this government joined with Labor and did something about it. The second thing I want to talk about concerning central Queensland is, uh, is something that has actually been dragging on for years but has really come to a head over the last few days, uh, and that's the circumstances surrounding the Murugupan family, the, family, the Tamil family uh, who uh, have been living in Biloela for a number of years. Uh, now, I haven't had the good fortune to meet this particular family because, of course, they've been locked up by this government for the last couple of years. But I have been to Biloela on a number of occasions, including only a couple of weeks ago after the Calide power station explosion. Um, now, we're talking here about a family, a mum, a dad and two little girls who were actually born in Australia, two little girls who didn't come to Australia by boat, two little girls who never broke an Australian law but have been treated like criminals by this government for the last couple of years and locked up in detention on Christmas Island. Now, I and many other Labor MPs, right up to our leader Anthony Albanese, have called on this government um, to let this family return home to Billow for a long time now. And we have been consistently ignored by this government, who have decided to try to punish and make an example of this family, including two little girls who were born in Australia, to send a message to people uh, overseas who haven't looked at smuggling anyone into this country for a number of years. Let's, let's, let's be serious. As if allowing this family to return home to Billow, to a community that loves them, to a community in which they fully integrated, to a community where dad was working in the meatworks, mum was volunteering for St Vincent de Paul, and their two little girls were running around playing in the streets with other kids born in Australia, living in Biloela. Do you seriously think that allowing this family to go back to Biloela, to a community that loves them, respects them and had them integrate into their community, would actually encourage people smugglers to start smuggling people to Australia again? I mean, give me a break. Everyone knows that that is total crap from this government. Everyone knows that it was only designed to try to look tough in the eyes of certain parts of the public. Where is this government's humanity? Every now and then the government should think beyond its slogans and actually think about doing the right thing. And unfortunately, it took one of these little girls getting seriously ill and needing hospital treatment that she couldn't get on Christmas Island before this government was prompted to take any action. Now I've been, as I say, I've been to Villawila on a number of occasions, and on at least two occasions I've met with the supporters of this family in the community. I've actually met with the mayor. I've met with the supporters of the family, and I particularly want to single out Angela Fredericks, who's done an incredible job over a number of years to stick by this family and be their advocate. We're finally starting to get some action from this government, but it's not good enough. I, I was very disappointed in question time today to hear Senator Cash reeling out the same old lines about stopping boats and people smugglers and things like that, rather than thinking about this family and this community who want to be reunited. So it's not good enough what this government has done. We need to see them take more action and we need to see them um, be returned home to Billow. This government has spent $6 million in taxpayers' money detaining this family on Christmas Island over the last couple of years. Just imagine how much better that money could be spent rather than wasted punishing a family, 
causing untold cost to this particular family and depriving Biloela of a family they love. Thank they you, should be returned Senator home. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I ask, what's happening to our country? On COVID, due to the overseas deaths early last year, I was cooperative and supportive from the start. 23rd of March 2020 and 8th of April 2020, on single-day sittings in this Senate, we gave the government a blank cheque. But I added, on behalf of constituents, that we would hold the government accountable and we expected data and a plan. I mentioned the most successful nation that was successful without crippling its economy because it did not cripple its economy. I mentioned ivermectin, yet we never heard back. No data, no plan. And like people across Australia, I now have important questions. People are feeling scared. Some are terrified, lost, hopeless, daunted, confused. People are feeling unsafe because of the vaccine side effects. People are feeling insecure because crucial universal human needs are not being met. Needs like security, health, reassurance, trust, confidence, support, leadership, honesty, competence, care, freedom, ease, calm, direction. Where's the plan for managing the virus and our economy? It's clearly inconsistent behaviour across our states and national, uh, and national governments reveal no plan. Queensland, Victoria and WA have deepened fear and insecurity to win elections and to control people. Governments have abandoned the people and removed accountability. I ask the Chief Medical Officer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration and the head of the, head of the Health Department, Federal Health Department, for the list to confirm my list of strategies for, that should be part of a plan for managing the virus. Isolation is one. Testing, tracing, quarantining another. Restrictions, cures and prophylactics. Vaccines, personal behaviour, health and fitness. Seven I've raised with them. They've agreed with all seven. But we only see three in use, and then only partially with crude and limited impact on the virus and at huge economic and social cost. In response to my question in Senate estimates in March, I received, received data on the severity and the transmissibility of this, this virus. The mortality is known by the health authorities to be low to severe. In fact, Senator Rex Patrick didn't even know he had the virus. Others with comorbidity, though, can die, just like the flu. There's a huge range of symptoms. So why does the Chief Medical Officer and the Health Department not publicly separate the, out each of the group's mortality rates? Is it because people need to be kept in fear? Now our taxes are being given to Big Pharma for unproven and risky vaccines. Let's consider some of those risks and facts. Deaths from the vaccines. Thousands of people overseas have died from it. There have been a wide variety of side effects from the vaccine. Blood clots. The Health Minister, Mr Hunt, has had cellulitis and hospitalised, reportedly a known vaccine side effect. The Chief Medical Officer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration and the head of the Federal Health Department refused to declare the vaccines 100 per cent safe. So my first question, how did vaccines get provisional approval? They said there were no alternative vaccines available. But wait. Once the first was approved provisionally, the others faced an approved alternative. So how did the others get provisional approval? The vaccines failed to prevent transmission of the virus. The vaccines failed to stop someone getting the virus and getting sick. Intergenerational effects are not known at all. The vaccine's effect against mutations is still unknown. The dosage is unknown. Vaccine frequency, number and time between jabs are still all unknown. Are people going to be jabbed forever? The vaccine fails to remove restrictions on our lifestyle. The vaccine fails to open up international borders. The vaccine makers all lack integrity. They have been fined billions of dollars, not hundreds of millions, billions of dollars for misrepresenting their products. The health minister himself said, quote, the world is engaged in the largest clinical vaccination trial. I am not a lab rat. Australians should not be treated as lab rats. Vaccines show this is the first time in history that healthy people have been injected with something that could kill them. And yet, 
Ivermectin is the first time that sick people have been denied medicine that is safe and proven successful for treating COVID as overseas jurisdictions, multiple jurisdictions prove. So let's move on to ivermectin. Ivermectin, I took it successfully in 2014 for something else. 3.7 billion doses have been given over six decades, prescribed for many ailments. No risk, safe. Cheap, because it's off patent. It's affordable. It's been used, it is being used successfully overseas treating COVID en masse regionally and nationally. 250 medical papers are in support of ivermectin, proven successful with COVID. In times of emergency, when four vaccines are provisionally approved and adults are vaccinated, and now kids, despite the early warnings, and now apparently pregnant mothers, why isn't a proven, safe and affordable treatment like ivermectin provisionally approved? If no one's made application, why didn't the government get off its hands and do it? The government has blood on its hands. My second question. Why have four unproven, untested and risky vaccines been given provisional approval, yet not one, yet one known safe treatment given provisional approval despite extensive medical papers and successful widespread use overseas? What happened to basic freedoms? What is happening to Australia? I received a letter from the Therapeutic Goods Administration last week threatening me because I shared some facts publicly. I dared to ask questions. Now, I have a duty as an elected representative to share the facts. The, Th the Therapeutic Goods Administration calls that advertising, apparently in an effort to control me. I have a duty to the people of Australia to promote debate and understanding for informed debate. Without that, there can be no informed consent, and without informed consent, there can be no vaccination or treatment. People are free in our country to make what they want of the facts. The Therapeutic Goods Administration seems to think that discussing facts and data is advertising. Whose side is the TGA on? The people or Big Pharma? My third question. What are the connections between Big Pharma, Monash University, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the Gates Foundation, Google and Facebook? Think about this. Google's parent company is Alphabet. It owns YouTube that took down one of my videos on the topic. Google owns 12 per cent of Vaxitech that created the AstraZeneca vaccine. Aren't these conflicts of interest? Another possible conflict of interest is surely Sequoia Capital, a venture fund known for making millions, millions from early funding of Google, YouTube and Apple. Sequoia owns 10 per cent of Vaxitech. I have no financial or other ties with vaccine makers or ivermectin or drug companies. My interest is in ensuring we protect people's health and safety our nation's health and safety. So what happened to basic freedoms? What is happening to our country? Coercion seems widespread and primed for stronger, wider, extensive coercion. Let's have a look at some of the types of coercion. Letters from so-called authorities intimidating people, threats to doctors, threats to employees, withholding employment or livelihood, a basic means of survival. Media intimidation from the legacy media, journalists labelling misrepresenting people. It's no wonder that mainstream media is rapidly becoming the legacy media. Government funding from, of media companies on vaccine propaganda. But I do want to single out one journalist, Adam Creighton, in the, in the Australian, has done a fabulous job of exposing and sharing the facts. So we move on to now what the government is calling a digital certificate. Is that going to become a digital passport? Withdrawal of access basic access to amenities, to transport, to travel, to jobs for people, unless they get the jab. Withdrawal of livelihood, ability to live. This is not a digital passport, it's a digital prison. Social media threats, Facebook, YouTube, take down posts and threaten shutdown. Always beneath control, there is fear. So my fourth question, of what are authorities afraid? Clearly not the virus, because they have no plan. They're afraid of people and the truth and freedom. And freedom is so easily squashed. The key question is, why no government action to approve ivermectin? So I call on the government to not wait for application for approval and to get on with the job of inquiring about investigating ivermectin and approving it. Australians, I call on you to decide for yourself. 
Compare ivermectin and the vaccine. Consider the government's actions, federal and state governments. What happened to basic freedoms? What happened to Australia? Are you willing to help us bring back Australia? Thank you, Senator Roberts. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.